All right. So this is supposed to be a little mini lecture on set theory notation. And just the facts, just what we need. So um, the idea here is just that it's useful to have a way to write down um, a collection, a member of the collection, and then some operations like intersecting collections and so on. So the idea is that a set is a possibly infinite collection of things. Okay, so the word things is really vague here. Could be anything. They could be numbers, they could be names, they could be sets whose elements are other sets, etc. And actually, it's kind of interesting if you go back and look at the history of math, um, the idea that we need sets and a way to write them down is old, but it leads to lots of paradoxes if you're not careful. Like if you let sets contain sets, contain sets, things get weird. Um, but we're going to keep things really vanilla with our set theory in this class. And so I won't tell you about set theoretic craziness unless you want. Okay, so um, our basic example, and this example will illustrate some of the fundamental notation, is suppose that I let A equal a set. So the curly braces tell you that I'm about to write down what's in the set. So A could be the set two, four, seven. And B could be the set two, 12, green, right? Because nobody said that everything has to sort of come from the same source. This is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Um, and so now a nice way, when our sets are little and finite, which in this class they essentially probably always will be, um, you, there's a nice way to organize and that is Venn diagrams. So we're all probably used to those. And so I can make myself a little picture where I call one of those bubbles A and the other bubble B. And then I have four and seven are elements of A, but not B. I have 12 and green are elements of B, but not A. And then I have two, which is an element of both of them. Okay, so this is just a pictorial representation of those sets that kind of records their overlap. So, Next thing I'll need is a symbol to talk about belonging to a set. So I'll use this symbol, which looks like an E, to mean is an element of, right? And so a true statement would be two is an element of A. So this is true. And then, uh, so think of this as like a mathematical sentence, right? This is saying, um, this is like the way of succinctly writing down two belongs to the set I called A, right? Two is a member of the set as an element of the set. Um, so since it's a mathematical sentence, sentences in math can, when they're well formed, when they make sense, they can be true, they can be false, they can be hard to figure out whether they're true or false. But if I look back at what the sets are, I could see that like eight is an element of A. That's a perfectly well-formed mathematical sentence. It's just false, right? I know what it means. It's just not the case, right? Okay, so let's do a little bit more here. So now let me introduce notation for the different parts of the Venn diagram here. So for example, it can clearly be useful to have a name for the overlap between two sets. So I'm gonna take that overlap and I'm gonna call it, just move this over here so I have more space. The overlap, the notation for that is this cap symbol. Um, and this is A intersect B. So it describes the things that are in both A and B. All right, so you should, in this particular case, for these particular sets A and B, it's not that hard to say what's in both. So notationally though, we wanna to start to be careful here. The intersection of two sets is a set. And so the set A intersect B is gonna be a set. The only thing that's in it is the element two. And so there's another true statement. A intersect B equals 
the singleton set, sometimes when a set has just one element, I call it a singleton set. So the A intersect B is the singleton set consisting only of two. Okay, so let's copy these again so that we remember what they are. And B equals, what did I make it? 2, 12, green, something like that. All right, so the next Venn diagrammatic concept that I want to name for is what do I call if this set over here, the intersection was and, what's in A and B. Now I wanted to find something for A or B. So this is called the union of two sets or two or more sets. And the notation for the union is A U B, A union B. Okay, so in the case of these particular sets, I have that the union of A and B is 2, 4, 7, 12, green. All right, and it doesn't actually matter that I wrote them in ascending order. Sets aren't, um, sets are just collections. They're not collections that come in a particular order. So it's different from like a vector where you have coordinates. This is just a collection. I can list them in any order. It would still be the same set. Okay. A couple more pieces of notation. Um, I can, let me introduce this notation and this notation. Um, and then we're pretty close to having everything we actually need. There's not a whole lot we need from set theory. We're just going to find it super convenient. Okay, so this stands for the empty set. And this stands for subset. So let me show you often the easiest way to like illustrate what notation is, is to use it in a mathematical sentence. Um, so let's try to do that here. So the empty set is the set with no elements. You can sometimes just write it like that. It's the set with no elements at all. Right, which reminds me that I should also define when you put bars around a set, it's asking how many elements does it have? So this is called the order of A, which is how many elements? Okay, so let's practice with this. In my example from above, here are some true sentences. The order of A is three. There's three elements in A. The order of B is three. The order of A intersect B. So that's asking how many things are in both A and B. And we already said that there's only one such thing. So the order of A intersect B is one. That's how you use the notation. And the order of the empty set, what is it? It's the set with no elements. So the order of the empty set is zero. It is the unique set with no elements. There are lots of sets with one element. There's only one set with nothing in it. There it is, you're looking at it. Okay, so we've met the empty set. We've met the order. What's this subset? So subset is asking um, in Venn diagram terms, uh, the subset relation is when one bubble is totally inside the other. So subset is the relation that everything that belongs to one set also belongs to the other. So let's do an example. I'll label this X and I'll label this Y. Let's give an example where a set X, maybe I'll make the set X, you know, A, R, F, be that set of letters, why not? And the set Y, well, if I want X to be totally contained in it, it better contain A, R, F, and potentially more stuff. So I'll throw in Q, T, and S just for fun. Okay, so that's an example um, where one set is inside the other in terms of membership. So I can write that by saying X is a subset of Y. So this notation denotes this within-ness relationship. X is a subset of Y. By the way, just in the same way that when you have an inequality, remember the inequality symbol less than or equal to, the bar underneath means or equal to. This bar underneath is playing the exact same role. It's reminding you that a set is considered to be a subset of itself, right? So it's reminding you that this means x equals y is allowed. If I demand that the set x be strictly smaller than y, that's called a proper subset. Okay. Um, so, and then I can write it, you know, if proper subset 
where I'd write x uh, is inside y and I'd cross out that equal sign. That means that x is contained in y, but not equal to it. It's just slightly more succinct notation for that. Um, okay, so before just winding down this little mini lecture, let me say how we're gonna use this. What is all this for? And actually, let me think, I have told you everything. This is all the set theory notation that we need for now. It's not that much, um, but what's it gonna let us do What's this for? Well, I want to be able to talk about a set of candidates and a set of winners. And it's going to be extremely useful to be able to use that very short list of notation that I gave you. So we'll use a script C for the set of candidates in an election and a script W for the set of winners under some process. You know, like a plurality election or what have you. Um, and this is under some process given some votes, right? I name a process, I collect some votes and then that produces a winner set. So let's just practice our set theory notation. So the set of winners has to be a subset of the set of candidates, that's true. All that's saying is that you can't win if you didn't run. Right, so the set of winners can't be, can't spill over from the set of candidates. It has to be a subset of the set of candidates. Um, and this also lets me write down some other sentences. So what does this mean? You can take a second to think about that. How would you translate this into English? That's the question. Right, so in math terms, this says the winner set is not empty, right? In other words, in like more plain English, there's at least one winner. Right. It's just a very simple way to record that. Um, what's another thing we might want to say? Well, if we're trying to elect a single person to office, like say for the president or for a congressional seat out of a US district, then we want there to be exactly one winner. So how would we write that down? We'd say the size of the winner set is one. Okay, and that's a succinct way to denote the idea that there's only one winner. Okay. Um, other things we could do, we could write this. What does this say? So this says the winner set is a proper subset of the candidate list. And if you remember what proper subset means, it means they're not equal. So what is this saying? This is saying that there's some candidate who wasn't in the winner set. In other words, this is so, uh, this says W is a proper subset of C, i.e. at least one candidate didn't win. All right, and voila, this very short little selection should be all that you need to get you through the set theory notation. Um, and we'll keep practicing with the symbols to make sure we're getting comfortable with them as we go. Okay, hi. So I wanna talk to you today about, um, hmm. Things. Okay. okay, let's get started. So today, let me overview of the kind of classic voting unit. Uh, 
This is going to be hard. Okay. Okay, let's get started. So today I want to talk about the overview of the uh, voting systems part of the class. So here the idea is that we're going to use some mathematical formalism to think about ways that different systems of election promote or um, or block certain properties we consider to be important about democracy. So uh, what we need to do, the ingredients are, I'm gonna have to give you some definitions because we need some formalism to make sense of some of this material. Then I'm gonna overview what some of those voting systems are. And then I'm gonna talk about like properties that a system can have or uh, fairness criteria. Like what, what might we demand of our systems? So these are the three different categories that I wanna introduce topics in. Okay, and so, hmm. Let's start with some of the definitions in formalism. So I'm going to tell you what is a voting system, aka system of election. Um, I'm going to tell you what a ballot is and what a preference schedule is. And um, we'll start with those. And then I'll introduce a couple of voting systems. And so let's start with some of the classics. We'll talk about plurality. And um, let's also introduce kind of a nice foil to that, which is dictatorship. And then we'll talk about some properties that we want those systems to have. So what are some properties that we might think of as fairness properties? One is that a system be majority fair. And another is uh, what you might call interchangeable voters. Okay, so I'm just gonna start here. We'll go back and we'll add to this list of definitions and systems and criteria. But I kinda wanna get us started with some of the basics before like turning it into a big overview. Okay, so what is a voting system or a system of election? Um, well, Actually, to tell you, to do a good job of telling you what that is, I should start with a ballot and a preference schedule. So a ballot, well, it's what you think, right? When you go to vote, you're presented with some sort of menu of choices, and then you mark that ballot in some way, um, and that is your ballot. So this is one voter's record of choices. You know from a fixed menu and this is a point of view that if you haven't thought about this before might be unfamiliar the point of view is that the way that your vote is heard the say that you have as a voter is really structured by the menu of choices that you have i mean on one level we're all familiar with this concept namely you can only vote for the people who run right so there's that a lot of us feel dissatisfied perhaps with the political parties as they exist now and certainly with the candidates. Um, but, but that's what you have in the ballot box is you have a fixed menu of choices and from that you have to make some selection. Something that I think we may think about collectively a little bit less um, is that that menu of choices isn't just about people and parties, but it's also about structure. So, most of us, when we go to vote, we are presented with um, a choice where we're asked to pick one person. So there might be a few people running, maybe even many people running for an office. But in most cases, the ballot asks us to pick one. Um, in this course, or in this part of the course, 
we're going to think about preferences a little bit more expansively. We're going to think about a ranked ballot. So for us, in this part of the course, we'll examine a somewhat like more expansive kind of record of voter choice, which is ranked ballot. So in other words, you have a number of candidates running for an office and you have to rank them from first to last in terms of your preferences. The reason that thinking about this might help us analyze American elections, even though in very few instances do we rank candidates in, in the US today, um, it, it encodes within it a lot of information about potential voting behavior. So from a ranked ballot, you can see who's ranked first, and that would be the first choice if they only got to pick one, presumably. Um, but also, if we want to analyze like a primary followed by a general or first round followed by a runoff, the preference list will contain a preference order for a voter will contain all the information that we need to understand a suite of choices that they might make. Okay, so we're going to examine ranked ballots. We can talk about other things too, but that'll be the, the focus. Okay, and so having said that, What's a preference schedule? Um, here, the word schedule, this is kind of an old fashioned use of the word schedule. Schedule here just means table or like a record. And so the preference schedule is the record of everyone's ballot. That's all we mean by that. So actually, let's take a minute and look at what a preference schedule might look like. So I'll do an example. All right, here's my example. Um, okay, so suppose the candidates are A, B, and C. I'm going to use set theory notation for that. And there's another one of these little mini lectures on set theory notation that you can refer to. But script C is just the, the set of candidates. And let's suppose for this particular election, my candidates are called A, B, and C. And now let's look at everybody's ballot. So voter number one ranks them A, then B, then C. And that's the notation I'm gonna use. I'm gonna use a column for voters, voter one's rankings. Um, and then along comes voter number two, and voter number two ranks them B, C, A. Number three ranks them C, A, B. Number four ranks them A, B, C. And I'm just gonna to get to eight. Okay, so A, B, C, and then B, A, C, B, A, C, A, B, C, and B, C. All right, so maybe this is my eight person society and just these are their um, choices. So taken together, this whole thing, this whole record here, this is called a detailed preference schedule. What makes it detailed is that I have a record of each individual. From a detailed preference schedule, I can create what's called a reduced preference schedule, where instead of all of that person by person information, I can just write down how many people have each uh, choice. So ABC, if I look back up at my list, I can see that ABC this person voted ABC, and this person voted ABC, and this person voted ABC. So all in all, I'm going to write that as times three. Three voters had that preference. And then if I go to BCA, and I go to my table, here's BCA, and here's BCA. So it looks like two people had that preference. And then CAB, OK, how many had preference CAB? just one, and then I can close it down with B, A, C, and the last two people up there had B, A, C. Okay, so if I reduce it like this, um, this is called a reduced preference schedule. So it records the different ballots that occurred and how many times they occurred, but it doesn't have a person by person list. Um, this is pretty much the same. I'm, I'm gonna, wherever possible, try to follow the notation from Christoph's book. Um, but Christoph doesn't use these number signs and time signs. And so I think the notation is a little confusing. So this is my like slight modification on the notation in the book. Okay, great. So this is what it means to have a preference schedule. 
Now we can say what a voting system is. So a voting system is kind of a, a rule set, AKA algorithm, for turning a preference schedule into an outcome. And what is that outcome? That's, that's kind of winners. Okay, so a voting system is an algorithm, a deterministic algorithm. It, it can't, I'm just gonna define it, you know, you might see slightly different definitions in different places, but for the purposes of this class, a deterministic, no randomness rule system for taking the um, preferences of a society and picking a winner, voila, okay? So now I've explained to you uh, what a voting system, AKA system of election is, what a ballot is and what a preference schedule is. Okay, so now we're ready to do some examples. So let's meet some voting systems. So first and maybe easiest to think about is um, plurality. That's actually what we use most of the time in the US. Um, it's also known by the name first past the post. in the context of picking a single winner. So how does plurality work? Plurality takes all of the preference schedule and it just asks who had the most first place votes. That's, you know, when we vote in the states, um, that's, that's usually how we do it. So here's how I'm gonna notate that. I'm gonna say um, the winner set. Remember that script C was the, over here script C was the candidates. And then script W is going to be the winner set. Okay. And so what is, again, what is a voting system? It's a way of taking candidate set and a preference schedule and you output a winner set. So, all right, what should the winner be from this particular election that we conducted? Well, if I do it by plurality, remember there are going to be a lot of different systems. So if I do it by plurality, the winner set is, well, look over this election. Who got the most first place votes? A had three first place votes, but B had four first place votes. So B is the winner by plurality in this election. Does that make sense? <laughs> I'm not used to lecturing without, it, without actually live people. So I'm gonna ask like the air if this makes sense a lot. Um, hopefully this makes sense um, that, uh, that, that I just count up the first place votes. I, I find four of them. For, for candidate B, and so B is the winner. Okay, great. There are other systems. Um, in fact, what I'm gonna try to convince you, although it might seem surprising, is that there are literally infinitely many ways to do this. So let's just meet a second one. Um, so our first voting system was plurality. It just asks who's got the most votes. And to be clear, that's most first place votes. Okay, so um, what's another way you could do it? Uh, two, this is gonna sound totally absurd, but the point is it is a rule set, uh, dictatorship. Okay, so what is dictatorship? That's where only one voter matters. Only one voter matters. And so of course for dictatorship to be well-defined, you need to kind of see the detailed preference schedule and pick the important voter. So what would be the winner set of dictatorship? Oops, dictatorship, what would the dictator winner be here? If uh, I specify that voter number five is the dictator. Okay, well then I go back up and I look at voter number five, voter number five picked B and so B wins. I could similarly do a dictatorship of voter number one and then go back up and look, okay, voter number one likes A. So the dictatorship of voter number one, A would win. Okay, voila. So again, voting systems or algorithms or rule sets for taking the preferences of a group and aggregating that somehow into a winner. 
you might take everything into account, you might not. Plurality only takes first place votes into account. Dictatorship only takes one person's preferences into account. You do all kinds of things and we're gonna meet several of these alternatives. All right, so that's another important ingredient. We're gonna be studying voting systems. And then let me introduce the idea of fairness criteria. I'm not gonna go through and kind of do all the ones that we'll meet this semester, but I, I wanna introduce two and then probe our intuitions together for um, what else we might wanna see in this kind of fairness world. So let's look at majority, fair, and interchangeable voters. Okay, so fairness criteria. So what is it to be majority fair? And I'll just write interchangeable voters down here to remind myself what to talk about next. All right, so it's democracy is supposed to be that the, the people speak and that the representation or the decisions is done on the basis of the people's view. But of course, when you have a whole group of people, you have to ask which people, right? And that's what we're gonna probe. But the idea of majority rule is really important in the history of democracy. Um, the idea that if more than half of the people share a view, that should prevail, right? And so how are we gonna operationalize? I'm gonna use that word a lot, operationalize. That's taking a concept and making it precise and kind of formally specified. That's what I mean by operationalize. So how are we gonna operationalize majority fairness when it comes to voting systems? Well, here's a way to do it. We can say, if any candidate is ranked first by more than half of voters, then they should be the single winner, the only one. Okay, and so we probably believe, if we're thinking about what it means to be a democracy, we probably believe this is important. I probably don't have to sell you on this idea. Um, it's hard to conceive of a democratically reasonable system where more than 50% share a preference, but we don't go with that preference. So, um, so that's a criterion. In other words, what I mean by criterion, so criterion singular, criteria plural, is that this is, this is a property that a system may or may not have. And so that's the structure here. Um, we have the preferences, we have a, a system of rules, and we can ask of the system of rules, does it consistently have this property? Going to notice, and this is going to be a common feature of a lot of our criteria, is that it has ranked first by more than half the voters, then they should be the only winner. So it's conditional. If this happens, that should happen, right? And so that means a fairness property is a, is a property of the system. So now we're going to examine whether our system so far are majority fair, but first let's let's articulate this other principle, interchangeable voters. So, okay, if you go and ask theorists of democracy, what is it that makes a system democratic? Right, we've already talked about a little bit of it. It should be that somehow the people decide. The demo, right? Our construction of who are the people who are the decision makers, demos should decide. And so interchangeable voters said, whoever is enfranchised should count equally. That's the idea, that's the intuition behind interchangeable voters. So the idea is all voters count equally. And then again, to operationalize that, to make that precise, it's that if 
the you know voters were relabeled right like their names and was changed. If the voters were somehow permuted, to prop on there and to enter systems, plurality and dictatorship, and ask, are you majority fair? And do you you have the interchangeable voters property. Okay, so let's make a little grid. Last thing I do for this little part of, and I can take dictatorship and make a little grid and then ask the question, are you majority fair? And do you have interchangeable voters? Okay, so plurality, yeah, my handwriting is terrible. Let me try to make that a little better. A little better. Okay, so certainly if any candidate has more than half, they have the most because you can't have two different people with more than half of them, right? So the plurality system is going to be majority fair because it anoints the winner as the person with the most votes. Problem. Dictatorship is it majority fair? I think clearly not <laughs> because everybody but the dictator can have a preference, and it won't matter if the dictator the dict this is not sorry. Um, interchangeable voters. Well, plurality just asked who has the most first place votes. And so it doesn't matter what order the voters came in or what their names were or anything. It's just about counting who has the most first place votes. So this satisfies the interchangeable voters condition. Um, dictatorship clearly does not because dictatorship of the fifth voter, if I reorganize the voters, that's gonna change the outcome. So dictatorship fails both tests and plurality passes both tests. Okay, so this is a little preview of some of the reasoning that we're going to um, employ in the next few weeks. So we're going to ask ourselves these questions up here. These say, what do we want? Like, how should democracy work? <laughs> a big question, right? And then once we know what we want, we can look at our possible systems and we can ask them, do you have these properties that we demand? Okay, and that's a really nice kind of capsule preview of some of what we're going to do under the heading of uh, social choice mathematics. All right, I'll stop there. Okay. So let's pick up where we left off in chapters one and two, which I'm kind of talking about together. So what happened last time? So I introduced this framework for thinking about how voting systems work and for interrogating our voting systems in terms of their properties. And I'm going to go on and do some more of that. This is the list from last time. Um, I'll add to it now. But before I do, I kind of want to step back and make this pivot that I'm gonna to try to do really regularly in this class between like the math class part of it and the about the world part of it. Um, so before I carry on, uh, well, I'll tell you, I'll remind you what we've covered so far, but then before we carry on, I wanna talk about like connecting it to what's actually happening. So last time we saw what it is to be a voting system, it's, a voting system is like an abstract theoretical machine that turns votes into an outcome, right? That's the system of election. The ballot is how a person votes. The preference schedule is the table of how everybody voted. Um, and then the, with that definition, that set of definitions, 
we talked about two voting systems last time, and those were um, plurality voting and the dictatorship of some particular voter. Um, one of those is the dominant system of election in America today. The other seems really far-fetched, but we're going to keep coming back to it um, as, as kind of like a, a foil, like as a, an example that shows us some extreme case. Okay, and now the properties that we talked about last time were that an election uh, system might be majority fair. And that is, that's a property that means that the system guarantees that a majority preference will prevail. The system needs to guarantee that. It can't just happen most of the time. It has to happen with logical certainty all of the time. Um, and then the principle of interchangeable voters was that um, if I switch the voters order that they voted in or their names or anything else, that wouldn't matter. It only depends on what the votes were. That's the property called interchangeable voters. Okay, so before I go on with systems, I kind of want to talk about um, what makes America a little bit different from the rest of the world, makes the US, I should say, different from, uh, from the rest of the world, um, and what sets up the topic that we're going to come to towards the end of the term, which is redistricting or um, abuse of redistricting, aka gerrymandering. So what we do, at least for the lower house in Congress, for the House of Representatives, is we take the country and we divide it up into 435 pieces, all with about the same number of people. Um, and then we conduct a plurality election. So we do this thing, we conduct a plurality election in each of those pieces. For the most part, there's a couple of exceptions. Maine does a little differently. Now Alaska does too, we'll talk about that as, as we go. Um, and then we, we, we should try to understand why anyone ever thought that was a good idea and what it's good for and what it's bad at, right? Um, and so first, why did anyone ever think that was a good idea? Well, it simplifies a choice down to just picking one person when we're trying to fill 435 seats. We have a simplified choice. And then it does something very logical. Whoever gets the most first choice votes wins. So it's simple, it's intuitive, it's easy to understand. But it doesn't necessarily have great properties. And let me give you an example. Um, even way back at the founding of the US, when the constitution was first written, and right after that, when it was being popularized by Hamilton and Madison and others. Um, so they wrote a sequence of essays called uh, the Federalist Papers. And in, in the Federalist Papers, they explained the Constitution and said why we should believe that the Constitution is a good, you know, founding document. Why should we buy in to the Constitution? And so they talked about structural choices that were being made at the founding um, and defended them. Um, and the choice to use districts was very much about trying to make it possible to have a majority paradigm. So uh, this kind of majority rules feature that's pretty important to the definition of democracy, but at the same time to make it possible for a minority to secure some representation. So how would that be possible? Well, if you have a minority that all lives close together, uh, then by sort of making a district around where they live, even though globally they're a minority, locally in their district, they can be a majority um, and they can win a plurality election and they can get representation in Congress. So that's, I want us to keep in mind that this tension, it's actually older than the US, this tension between the rule of the majority and the not total exclusion of minorities. And here, we're not just talking about racial minorities. In fact, as you well know, the founding of the US that wasn't really in the mix in terms of fairness, um, not yet. Um, but at the same time, this tension was already present. The idea that, you know, you don't, if, if you have some majority, you don't just want to fill up your representative body with only them. So I want to mention this now so that as we start to meet more systems of election, we don't just ask, okay, what math theorems can we prove about them? But we also ask, what are our goals and how are they going to live up to our goals or, or fall short? Okay. So with that, let's take a look. Let's meet some more voting systems and some more criteria. Um, all right, so I would like to introduce, um, oops. Um, 
runoff, um, elimination, board account, pairwise comparison, and maybe also a sequential. But I also, I kind of want you to understand that if this list is starting to seem long, this is options, you know, one through seven of infinity. There are literally infinitely many possible systems of election because any silly old rule can be a voting system. Um, so to illustrate that, I'm gonna introduce a very stupid, like an kind of intentionally stupid system of election, which I will call secondality. So actually, let me start with that one. So plurality was whoever gets the most first choice votes wins. Secondality, whoever gets the most second choice votes wins. This is a indefensibly stupid system of election that I only bring up to illustrate that any rule set for how you pick winners counts as a system of election. And that's part of the reason that, as we'll see, there are infinitely many of those. Okay, so let's start to delve into this list and see uh, how far we get. So runoff, what's a runoff election? Well, to introduce that, let me first introduce the idea of condensing a preference schedule. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, well, let's take a preference schedule, for instance, I believe this is the one that we were looking at before. We had three people voting for A, then B, then C. We had two people voting for B, then A, then C. Two people voting for B, then C, then A. And one person voting for C, then A, then B. Okay, so this is a uh, reduced preference schedule. And so now what would it mean to condense that even more? So condensing is what happens when you restrict to a subset of the candidates, um, or in some cases, a subset of the voters. So this is restricting to a subset of candidates or voters. So let's do that here. Suppose that our society has these preferences. And now let me condense this to, well, one thing that I could do is I could look to see who the two most popular vote getters are, two people who got the most votes, and I can run them off head to head against each other. So one thing I can do is condense to the top two, right? Okay, so looking at this preference schedule, A had three first choice votes, B had four first choice votes. So those are the two most popular ones. So I want to condense down to just who likes A better than B and who likes B better than A. So to do that, I'll just look at these columns, but I'll ignore candidate C. Candidate C is being kind of tossed. So, well, if I look at my first column over here, which are the ones that like A better than B? So this, these people like A better than B, these don't, these don't, and these do. Um, so all in all, I have four voters who like A better than B and the other four like B better than A. Okay, so this is a kind of runoff election. Um, the kind that says you condense to the top two and then you just pit them against each other head to head using all the same preferences that were already recorded in the first contest, right? In the first preference schedule. All right, and so this is a tie. And so since I haven't set a tiebreaker rule, what I can say is that so this, the runoff system is you take the top two, well, one kind of runoff is you take the top two vote getters and condense to those candidates. So if we did it this way, we'd have that the winner set by this top two runoff system is a tie between candidates A and B. All right, everybody see what I did? I'm pretending you can answer that. 
So what does this resemble? Um, well, for instance, um, I am a dual citizen of the US and France, and I quite enjoy voting in both countries. Um, and the French presidential election is done in two rounds, much like this. So in the first round, there are a schmillion candidates. Um, actually, there are candidates from, you know, there could be 20 candidates easily um, in the first round of a French presidential election. Then everybody goes and votes and the top two vote getters face off in a second round. But the second round happens later and people have to go back out to vote and then they choose between those two. So sometimes people think of this as an instant runoff because you don't have to let everybody vote again. If you recorded their ranked preferences the first time, you have all the information that you need to kind of think of this condensation as the runoff, right? I hope that makes sense. So this is a top two style of runoff. There are other ways to do runoff. Um, so another style um, is that you can sort of drop candidates one at a time. Okay, so let's take a look at what would happen if we did that. So there's two ways that you might drop candidates one at a time. You could drop the one with the, the fewest, let's be grammatically correct here, the fewest first place votes. So someone really unpopular in the sense of first, not having a lot of first place support could be eliminated. Or you could eliminate the candidate with the most last place votes, right? If someone was ranked last by lots of people, you might want to eliminate them from contention and rerun the election. So just a thing to notice is that if you, if you started with three candidates and dropped the candidates one at a time, that takes you right away to a second stage, which is just head to head, and it has to stop after that. But notice there's a difference in how many rounds there might be if you started with 10 candidates. Um, the top two runoff would go straight to a head to head and would decide it in the second round. But dropping one candidate at a time would take you from 10 to nine to eight. And you'd have to sort of do a lot of successive condensations in order to get to your um, uh, result. And um, in the book, this system of election where you drop the candidates one at a time um, by who's got the fewest first place votes, this is called the elimination method. And I believe this also has a name and it's called the Coombs method. It doesn't matter to me at all if you memorize which name points to which thing. I want to get you comfortable with all the concepts here. So the, the, the actual names used in the book aren't super important. Okay, so um, notice that in this particular election, if I dropped the candidates with the, if I did the elimination style, what would I get if I did elimination? Well, C also had the, the fewest first place votes. So C would have been eliminated. I would have condensed to the same top two and I would have gotten the same outcome, a tie between A and B. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense and we'll kind of meet a lot more examples as we go. All right. So we've talked about runoff elections and we've talked about elimination. Um, the thing that was on the ballot in Massachusetts this year, November, 2020, um, was a, uh, basically what was called instant runoff voting. So the actual system that Massachusetts voters rejected this November um, was what's called IRV or instant runoff voting, which works very much like this. So you, it's essentially this method where you drop candidates one at a time who have the least support and you continue until someone has majority support, right? By the way, notice that's completely equivalent to continuing until you have just two people and seeing who's more popular of those two, right? You continue until someone I guess I should, I should just write that down. So IRV is you take the preference schedule 
you repeatedly drop the least popular candidate and then you continue until someone has a majority. So why was this on the ballot here in Massachusetts and why did voters reject it? Well, to understand that, we have to get a little bit further in our analysis of these systems and try to understand what properties they have. So what properties does IRV have that made people think it might be a good democracy reform here in Massachusetts? Uh, and why did the voters ultimately reject it? So we'll start to understand that as we build up our uh, methods for analyzing these systems. Okay, but so for now, I wanna introduce two more systems and then um, call it a day. So those two systems are Borda count um, and uh, actually three more. So Borda count, pairwise comparison and sequential. Okay, Borda count, it's kind of easy to explain. So Borda count is where um, points, so more points are awarded to a candidate ranked higher. Okay, so here's a simple version of the board account. If I have um, five candidates, I'll give five points for a first place vote, four for a second place vote, three, two, one. That's a simple version of board. Uh, the concept of board account doesn't require that you use those particular point allocations. You're welcome to use 10 points for the first place and seven points for the second and so on. The term board account just refers to there being a point value for every position you could have on the ballot and then you just add up the points. Okay, so to write this down, let me introduce a little notation. So I'm gonna assume that you've already watched the set theory notation lecture or that you read about it in the book. So recall that W is the winner set and that script C is the candidate set. So um, to, to make the board account precise, I'd like to use um, one symbol for the number of voters and another symbol for the number of candidates. So I'm gonna use N for the size of the candidate set. In other words, there are little N candidates. That's what this says. And then even though I don't have a set, like a curly letter, for the set of voters, I'm going to use capital N for the number of voters in an election. Just a, again, don't really worry about memorizing notation, but the way to remember that if you want is that most elections have more voters than they are candidates. So I use the big letter for the number of voters following the book. Okay, so a, a simple Borda would be, um, and points for a first place vote. N minus one points for a second place. Dot, dot, dot. All the way down to uh, two points if you're ranked second to last. And only one point if ranked last. Again, why these numbers, it's just a fairly simple system. You can do something different and the answer might come out different. Um, okay, so let's conduct a Borda election. Let's use the same preference schedule as before and conduct a Borda election. So I have, um, let me just make a little box over here for my Borda tally. So, what does A have? So A has, so remember this is gonna be three points, two points and one point for a first place vote, a second place vote or a third place vote. So A has three first place votes. So three times three points plus this and this make three second place votes. So three times two points plus one last place vote. So 
the total number of votes is nine and six is 15 and one is 16 points. B has four first place votes plus three second place votes plus one last place vote. And that's 12, 21, 21 points. And poor C has just one first place vote, two second place votes, and five last place votes for three and four is seven and five is 12 points. So actually this is kind of interesting. If you do the border tally, even though the um, runoff, top two runoff had a tie between A and B and the elimination method had a tie between A and B, the border tally values the fact that B had more first place votes. It sort of gives more relative weight to that. Unlike plurality, it doesn't only take the first place votes into account, but it's kind of heavily weighted to, you know, to, it gives you a lot more credit for getting more first place votes. And so B comes out kind of easily ahead of A. And so what would we write? We would write in the example above, the winner by Borda is just B, no tie. Okay, it's not too bad. Next, what about pair wise comparison? Which I'll call pair wise comparison, PWC. Um, so this one works by building, there's a nice visual aid for it called a pair wise comparison graph. We're going to find this graph useful for lots of different kinds of analysis that we want to do on elections. Um, okay, so how do we build it? So this is a graph in the sense of like a network of nodes and edges and arrows between them. So this will have one vertex for each candidate. And then what I'll do is I'll record all the head to head outcomes. So edges between them, recording the head-to-head -head preferences. Okay. So let's do that for our little election, which I will attempt the advanced operation of copying. Boo. Ugh, life is bad. Okay. Foiled by technology, I'll just have to recopy. So what is it? It's three, two, two, and one, three, A, B, C, two, B, A, C, to B, C, A, and one C, A, B. Okay, so what does my graph look like? I put down one vertex for each candidate. So I have A, B, and C. And then I look at the pairwise preferences. So if I look at A versus B pairwise, um, remember that I had four voters who prefer A to B and four voters who prefer B to A. So I, neither one of them wins out over the other. And so I, I can put like an equal sign there or I can put the number zero for the margin between the two. Now let's look at A and C. So it's pretty clear. Uh, I have five voters who prefer A to C. Well, 
while I have only three voters who prefer C to A. And so A beats C by a margin of two. And that's how I'm gonna write this. Um, okay, let's do the same thing for B and C. So now I can see that everybody but that last voter prefers B to C. So I have seven prefer B to C, while just one prefers C to B. So that means B beats C and by a margin of six, seven to one makes a margin of six. So this is my pairwise comparison graph. Okay, and so the, the pairwise comparison winner is whichever candidate beats the most other candidates head to head. Right, and so to, to tally that up, I can take my candidates A, B, and C, and I can ask them, how many do you beat? So let's count the tie there as a half a point. And so A beats C and ties with B, so it gets 1.5 points in the pairwise comparison tournament. B, similarly, 1.5, and C gets no points at all. Okay, and so I ask myself, who's the winner? And I see that the winner by pairwise comparison is once again a tie between A and B in this particular election. Okay, so actually let's pause. I, I do wanna introduce one more system before uh, signing off for now. But let's pause and ask ourselves, what kind of system is this? Like what might make it attractive? What does it promote? What does it ignore, right? So remember that Borda liked B better than A because B had more first place support. Pairwise comparison doesn't care about that. It doesn't care if you're thunderously popular or just a little more popular. What it cares about, what it, what it counts, what it takes into account is how many other candidates you would beat one-to-one, -one, right? One-on-one. -on -one. So um, if you're just a little bit better than five people, somebody else is a lot better than four people, pairwise comparison, picks you, right? Um, so it's just about kind of vanquishing the most opponents one-on-one, -on -one, which is really different from other ways of thinking about candidate strength. So, you know, at this point I'll say like, what I like about this topic is it shows you the complexity of group decision-making, right? <laughs> like there's just so much information in a preference schedule that any system of election chooses to see some things and not others, Cho chooses to see some aspects of candidate strength and not others, right? And we should really ask ourselves about our values and about the match between our values and these, these various systems of election. Okay, so that's pairwise comparison. So the last one I'll do for now is called, uh, so last for now, actually, I've now just about introduced almost every system we're gonna talk about for the whole first half of the semester. But the last for now is called sequential election. This one might sound like a strange system and unlike the others, it's not really being proposed for use anywhere in like democratic representation, but you'll still recognize it, I think from some real life situations. So here's how sequential election works. The candidates are ordered. Right, and so that order has to be specified. And then what happens is, um, so let's suppose the candidates are listed as, let's say, A, then B, then C, then D, then E. So the way a sequential election works is it's like a tournament. 
So the election is conducted as follows. We compare A and B head to head. Just by condensing the big preference schedule down to those two. And then the winner advances. So the winner faces whoever's next, which in this case is C, and then the winner advances. That winner faces D, and then so on. In my particular example here, the last one was E, and then whoever's left standing at the end is the ultimate winner. So that winner is declared the overall winner. Right, so if you think about this, there's something about it that your intuition is probably gonna tell you isn't really well suited for like a high stakes democratic outcome. Namely, think about this like a pool table, right? And the, the rules for who can play, if there's a line of people waiting to play pool, there's whoever is playing and the winner stays on. And then the next challenger comes and faces that winner and tries to displace them. And then the next challenger comes. So this is, I think of this as like, you know, the billiards rolls of election. So there are real life circumstances where you do something like this, but there's a reason that it might not seem so reasonable for government, right? And that is that the order matters, right? So that specified order that the candidates are listed in turns out to be potentially determinative of the outcome. If you listed them in a different order, even given the same voter preferences, the same attributes of the candidates, the same preferences of the voters, um, the outcome could be different, right? And that something about that doesn't sit quite right. So actually this gives me a good opportunity to run back up to my list way up at the top and this suggests another fairness criterion. So we talked about interchangeable voters, but the principle that's gonna be violated by sequential election is the other one, interchangeable candidates. <laughs> right, so what is interchangeable candidates? It says the candidate names and the candidate order shouldn't matter. So it's clear, I think, although we'll work through some examples, that sequential election is gonna violate this principle because just the order that the candidates were in could have a big impact. Okay, so let's conduct a sequential election just to see an example. So let's stick to this same preference schedule over here. I'll just make myself a little workspace in the corner and I'll say, ah, this raises a point. Um, what happens if I have A, B, C, that's the order that I put the candidates in, and then I use this preference schedule to see what the outcome would be. And the question is, in this case, A faces off against B first, and they come to a tie. Two people prefer A to B, and uh, sorry, four people prefer A to B, and four people prefer B to A. It's a tie. What do we do? So a sequential election really requires that we have some sort of tie-breaking rule. And we have to know what happens in the case that A faces B so that they can advance to the next round. So you can pick your favorite tie-breaking rule. An example is alphabetical order. That's a tie-breaking rule. Or um, whoever came first, you know, a seniority rule. Whoever came first in the order wins in the event of a tie. So let's use sequential with alphabetical tiebreaker. And if we do that, I have A versus B, they got equal numbers of votes. So A advances because it's alphabetical. Okay, and then I have A versus C. And of course, this graph already tells me what's gonna happen. It tells me that A is gonna beat C head to head. And so A wins. And so the winner of a sequential election with the order ABC, I'm not gonna write alphabetical tiebreaker, but that's implied, is A. 
So that's different from uh, some of the other systems that we had that thought B was better. In this case, um, just the kind of happy coincidence of how the tiebreaker fell caused A to vanquish B and then easily get past C and win the election. Okay, good. Um, so that's a good place to stop. So just to review again, what have we done? We've met a bunch of different systems of voting. Um, we heard about plurality, dictatorship, a few kinds of runoff, elimination, board account, the pairwise comparison, sequential election, and the silly secondality rule, right? Um, and then we've started to build up our collection of properties. And I'll stop here for now. And then when I return to this, I want to start thinking about more kind of socially textured properties that we might demand of our systems of election if we're going to regard them as fair. Okay, I'll stop there. Okay, I'm gonna give you a really short little mini lecture on um, Condorcet, candidates Condorcet cycles and all that good stuff. So who are we talking about here, first of all? This is a French mathematician, philosopher, um, the Marquis de Condorcet, who's writing um, kind of in the Enlightenment period. So the context is French Revolution is making everybody think differently about democracy and about what it would mean to actually let the people choose, right? What would that even look like? So that's the context here. And Condorcet, being interested in both math, philosophy, he's trying to come at this from the question of what are the problems that would happen if we tried to do just intuitive systems of popular choice. So let's think about an easy case and then we'll think about a hard case. And both of them are named after him. <laughs> so don't get confused between those. It's just because he was an influential writer trying to think about, think this stuff through. Okay, so what's the easy case? And again, what, what am I talking about here? I'm talking about how to kind of make a group decision. And we're talking about elections right now. So in other words, we have a preference schedule. We have everybody's preferences. How do we fuse that into a group decision? So the easy case is that there is, there may be, a candidate who's preferred head to head to all the other candidates. So if we draw the pairwise comparison graph, we have this candidate maybe called A and then everybody else is beaten by A head to head. So if you like, we can sort of draw this with a bunch of arrows pointing out because remember the notation, an arrow points out if you beat somebody else head to head. You do that sort of two person consolidation. And so the point of this is the relationships among the other candidates can be whatever. As long as A beats everybody else head to head, they are called the Condorcet candidate. All right, well, it's important that there may not be one. And so the hard case is kind of showing that that may not happen. So the hard case is where um, even though the individual preferences are coherent, the group preferences are incoherent. And we'll see that that actually can definitely happen. So the group preferences may have a cycle. Okay, so here's what that means. Imagine that you have three candidates. This is the simplest case of what's gonna be called the Condorcet cycle. So imagine that you have three candidates and collectively the group likes A better than B, they like B better than C, and now you can guess the problem. It's called a cycle because they like C better than A. This is unpleasant. How would you decide who should win if when you just compare A to B, A is better, 
but B is better than C, but C is better than A. This is in, in math speak, this is what's called a failure of transitivity. Usually you'd like it to be the case that if A beats B and B beats C, that means A beats C. But th this is one of the kind of complicated paradoxes that happens when you think about preference schedules and ranking is that you can have a cycle like this. So I'm going to keep this little mini lecture really simple and just show you, uh, it, and I'll mention this, if it exists, this is called a Condorcet cycle. Okay. Okay, so this is called the Condorcet cycle if we have one. It doesn't have to be just three candidates. It could be longer. It could be a cycle of five candidates. But as long as all the arrows lead around in a circle, taking you back to where you started, you have this confusing situation. It's called a Condorcet cycle. Um, okay, so I want to show you that this is realistic. This can actually happen. So let's build an example. So suppose some people like A, then B, then C. Some people like B, then C, then A. And some people like C, then A, then B. And let's put some numbers on these. I'm going to say there are 30 of these people, 40 of these people, and 50 of these people. So there are um, the number of voters in this whole election is 120. Great. So let's see why this gives us a Condorcet cycle. So who prefers A to B? Well, if I look at the preferences, I can see these guys prefer A to B and these guys prefer A to B. So that's 80 who like A better than B versus 40 who don't. So in this particular case, A beats B uh, by a margin of uh, 80 versus 40. Yeah, by a margin of 40. Okay, great. Now let's try B versus C. So now you can see that these people and these people like B better than C. So that's 70 to 50. So by a margin of 20, B is preferred to C. Okay, hopefully that makes sense if you're following along. And then thirdly, I can ask who likes C better than A? And now I see that these people and these people like C better than A. So that's 90 compared to 30. And so the margin there is 60. Now I have a terribly confusing situation. Who should win? in this case. Well, you can look at the picture and you can decide there must be a way to get out of this. Maybe we'll use the relative margins of victory and so on. But Condorcet's observation was that this is a hard case, that your any system is going to struggle to have a good way to choose a winner when you have a Condorcet cycle. Okay. Um, now, so in, in some sense, these are opposite cases because Condorcet candidate is supposed to be the easy case. Condorcet cycle is supposed to be the hard case. I put on this week's worksheet that you can actually have both at the same time. You can have a Condorcet candidate and somewhere else in your graph, you can have a cycle. That's possible. Um, but, but generally you should think about these as like when there's a Condorcet candidate, most but not all of our systems are gonna declare that person the winner. Um, and if there's a Condorcet cycle, many of our systems are gonna struggle. Uh, okay, so the last term that I want to introduce for this is just what does it mean? So there's a there's a fairness criterion associated with this. Remember, what are these criteria? They're like desirable properties for a voting system. So Condorcet definitely thought if there's someone that everybody likes best head to head, that person should win. And so we're going to call that Condorcet fair. So I'm going to make this a definition. A system is called Condorcet fair, or you can also say it passes the Condorcet criterion. Um, if whenever there is a Condorcet candidate, they win. Something important to notice about this definition, this definition doesn't bind you at all if there is no Condorcet candidate. You can do anything you want when there is none. This definition just requires that if a preference, if a future election is conducted and they have a Condorcet candidate, um, that person should be the winner. So remember the difference between properties of the system and properties of the election. So whether or not there's a Condorcet candidate, that's a property of the election, but the system has to be designed so that Condorcet candidates always win. 
Okay, and there concludes the mini lecture. All right, so today I want to finish up with the introductory material. And so I have two more things I need to talk about or I want to talk about uh, that are connected to chapters one and two of the book. And um, and as usual, I want to do a little zoom out, like who cares kind of stuff. Um, okay, so what do I want to talk about? I want to talk about, um, I want to introduce one more fairness criterion for now, which is unanimity fair. or the uni unanimity criterion, those mean the same thing. And so this is, as usual, this is like a way of thinking about properties of systems. And then I want to, so these are my goals. Um, I wanna talk about implications. So I'd like us to build up some tools for reasoning about when some properties imply other properties. So this is connected to some of the um, worksheet questions about whether some fairness criteria imply other ones. And, um, and then together with that, I, I kind of want to build up some kind of Venn diagram reasoning connected to this question of, of implications when some uh, properties imply other ones. All right. so. Let's, um, we'll start by meeting this new criterion of unanimity fairness, and then we'll think about how to connect it to other criteria in other systems. So what is unanimity? Um, well, in general, unanimity is when everybody agrees. So um, in the context of a preference schedule, it has a unanimous preference Um, when every ballot ranks some candidate higher than some other candidate. So I'm going to write that as x greater than y, ranks x above y uh, for some candidates x, y. In the candidate set, that's our notation, x and y in the candidate set. Okay, so um, what would that look like? So that might look like, for instance, uh, some people like X, then Y, then A, then B. Some people like X, then B, then Y, then A. Um, some people like A, B, X, Y. Some people like B, X, A, Y. So what these have in common, and so maybe, you know, this is 122 people, 61 people, four people and 88 people. So that's a preference schedule. And what I want us to notice about this preference schedule is that um, X is ranked above Y on every single ballot. All the ballots in this election rank X above Y. Doesn't matter where, doesn't, X doesn't have to be first, Y doesn't have to be last. As long as X is always above Y, there's a unanimous preference. So this is a property of an election. An election may have a unanimous preference. Um, and then uh, we say a system, a voting system, which recall is a method for turning electoral results into an outcome. So we say a voting system is unanimity fair, unanimity fair a little hard to say, if Whenever X is preferred to Y unanimously, unanimously, Y is not a winner. Okay, here it is. This is the definition. So let's talk about that. Think about it. Try to understand what it means. So um, it basically says, there's an easy confusion here that I want you not to 
fall prey to. You can easily mix this up in your head as saying, well, if everybody likes X better than Y, X should win. But it's not saying that. And in fact, that wouldn't be very reasonable because everybody might like X better than Y, but everybody might like some other candidate W even better than X. So just being preferred unanimously isn't a really strong recommendation that X is great, but it is a really strong indication that Y shouldn't win. Y isn't the, the sort of group preference. Everybody likes X better, Y shouldn't win. Okay, so this is yet another one in our list of like fairness criteria that sounds not only reasonable, but almost required, right? So basic, it's almost required. And then what we'll see is that as a matter of math, as a matter of logic, not every system that sounds reasonable has this property. So let's go through and look at some of the systems that we've discussed so far. So let's look at plurality, my silly system that I totally made up called secondality, but I'm kind of a fan of it. Uh, runoff, elimination, I'm not listing these in any particular order, just the order that I remember them. Um, Coombs, that's the one where we eliminate the one with the most last place votes. Uh, Borda, pairwise comparison, sequential election, and the dictatorship. So these are, I think, all the systems that we've discussed so far. And now let's look at them and ask ourselves, are they unanimity fair? Are they unanimity fair? Okay. And maybe to think about that, it would help if we keep this picture in mind, this one here, we'll try to keep this preference schedule in mind as a way to make the decision. Okay, so let's go through and ask ourselves what's gonna happen. So let's start with plurality. So plurality is whoever has the most first place votes wins, right? But what we can see is, in fact, if X is preferred to Y unanimously, notice Y can't have any first place votes. So this is an observation. If X over Y on all ballots, then Y has no first place votes. Best they can place is second. Um, and so they definitely can't win a plurality contest. So therefore plurality is unanimity fair. It has the desired property that Y loses. All right, so now stop and think about this yourself. Obviously one merit of pre-recorded lectures is that you should feel free to pause me <laughs> slash put me on in the background. <laughs> um, and so stop and think about this for a second. How about secondality? So secondality is the winner has the most second place votes. Um, could a dispreferred, a unanimously dispreferred candidate win a secondality election? Yes, they can, because they could be everybody's second choice. Everybody could like X best and Y second best, and then Y wins. So that means secondality is not unanimity fair. It fails this test because the dispreferred candidate might win. Okay, so now let's think about runoff. Okay, so how does runoff work? Runoff says whoever has the most, the top two first place vote getters are consolidated and they face each other. Okay, so that means Y has no first place vote, so they're never going to be one of the top two first place vote getters, right? So that means they can't even be in the runoff election, so they can't win a run under the runoff system. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Okay, now what? Elimination. Oops, I'm sorry, I just did that backwards. So this is actually really instructive, I hope. Let's think about this again. So I, I said it right and I wrote it wrong. So in a runoff election, I'm gonna write this observation down. In a runoff election, the top two first place vote getters um, are consolidated head to head. Okay, but since Y has no first place votes, Y can't be in the runoff. 
and I'm excluding situa like weird situations with a tie. Um, I'm just not going to worry about that right now. Why can't be in the runoff, so why can't win? All of that is fine. That means why can't win a runoff election. But that means runoff is unanimity fair because the requirement is that why can't win. That's the thing we're trying to check. That's the thing that makes it unanimity fair is if why can't win. Right, okay, hopefully that makes sense. Kind of the same logic takes us through elimination. So in elimination, you eliminate the candidate with the fewest first place votes. So stop and think about it. What happens to why? They have no first place votes, so they get eliminated immediately, so they can't win. Check. Remember, we're checking the situations where why can't win. Okay. Good, so now what? Um, now let's try, um, let's think about Coombs, all right? So Coombs is about eliminating, successively eliminating the person with the most last place votes. By the way, I do not care if you memorize these systems. I'm gonna say that a lot. Don't care if you memorize the systems. I do care that you can reason about them. All right, so we're eliminating the people with the most last place votes. And now let's look back at our little crib sheet, this election over here. Um, might we eliminate why? Yeah, we might. They might have the most last place votes. So they could get eliminated at some point during the Coombs process, right? But notice, since X is above Y on every single ballot, right? X can't be eliminated. So you're going to eliminate, 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 but X will never go. Um, and in the end, if Y survives, X must survive with them. So the only way for Y to make it all the way through to the end of a Coombs election is if they face X in the end, okay? And then at that point, they'll lose unanimously. So Coombs is unanimity fair. Um, by the way, the spirit in which I hope that you're taking this is to learn how to build an argument, learn how to like reason about the properties of systems. I don't expect you to be able to prove all these things yourself. So think of this as like, Proof appreciation, argument appreciation. So let me write that reasoning down. Okay, so I'm gonna write that as a claim. The Coombs system, where as a reminder, you successively eliminate the candidate with the most last place votes. I claim that this system is unanimity fair. That's my claim. And now let me try to prove it. Proof. Why? So we, we suppose that X is preferred to Y. Because, right, actually, let me make this clear. To be unanimity fair, let's look back here at the definition. To be unanimity fair only has any binding kind of request to make to our system if there is some unanimous preference. If uh, we want to show that a system is unanimity fair and we run an election with no unanimous preference, which is most elections, most unanimous preferences are kind of rare. Like people are never unanimous about anything. But if we did have one, it shouldn't be the case that Y can win. So that means in order to probe unanimity fairness, I can suppose there is a unanimous preference and see what happens, right? If there isn't, there's nothing to ask. It's vacuously or you know automatically satisfied if there's no unanimous preference. All right, so suppose there is one. Suppose X is greater than Y in all ballots. And I'm just writing down what I already said out loud a moment ago. Um, note that Y may be eliminated because why might be placed last on a bunch of ballots. They might be eliminated, um, but X can't be eliminated before Y. So the best that Y can hope for in a Coombs election is to survive all the way to the last round. But if so, they must face X. And since they're unanimously dispreferred to X, they lose. So I just checked what I needed to check. 
I needed to check that if X beats Y on all ballots, Y can't win. And I just proved that even in the best outcome for Y, they'll still lose. So I can put a little box, which means I'm happy with my proof. And then I can go back up and check this box here and say, indeed, Coombs, Coombs is unanim unanimity fair. Boy, these things are hard to say. Cool. Board is easy for unanimity because board is the system where the higher you're ranked, the more points you get. So since every voter ranks X higher than Y, every voter awards more points to X than Y. And so Y can't win. Boom, that one was pretty easy. Okay, now, how about pairwise comparison? How about pairwise comparison? Let's think about that one. So that asks which one wins the most head to heads, right? But notice anybody that Y beats head to head, X does as well. Okay, so any arrow pointing out of Y, there's one pointing out of X to that candidate as well. Let me write that down. Is pairwise comparison unanimity fair? Well, so suppose again, X is preferred to Y on all ballots. And now let's think about the pairwise comparison graph. So here's X, here's Y. Here's any other candidate, I don't care, call them A, right? If Y beats A, so does X because they're higher on every ballot, right? So that means for every pairwise comparison point Y gets, X gets one too. All right, so it sounds like maybe they could tie, but the thing is they can't actually because X also beats Y unanimously. And X gets at least one extra by beating Y. So that means X has more pairwise comparison points than Y. So Y can't win. Great. So actually, it seems like most of these systems look like they're unanimity fair. Um, let's actually, I don't need to prove every single one of these. Um, it, it turns out that sequential elections aren't unanimity fair and I'll tell you why, but I'll put in parentheses that it's hard to actually like completely prove, but I'll tell you why. Um, basically. The, the thing about sequential elections that's funky, so remember how those go, it's the pool tournament model of election, where you, you line up the candidates in some order, and then the first two face off, and then the winner advances, faces the next one, and then the winner advances and faces the next one, and so on down the line. The funky thing about sequential elections, and I mean, those of you who are sports fans, and you think about this too, when you think about tournaments, if you have a team that you like, but you know, you're know you a little worried, there's some other team that you know might beat them. You hope somebody else knocks out that other team so that your team doesn't have to face them, right? So sequential election works exactly that way. X is preferred to Y on every ballot, but if X gets knocked out by some other competitor, Y may never have to face them. Um, and so it's hard to prove this, but I just gave you the idea of why sequential is not unanimity fair. Okay, and then just let's look at the last one. Um, and, um, and then we'll switch topics. So how about dictatorship? So remember dictatorship is all that matters is the first choice of the dictator, but the dispreferred candidate has no first place votes at all. So they can't be the first choice of the dictator. So why can't win? So dictatorship is unanimity fair. Okay, and that's basically how you reason about whether certain elections can have certain properties. Um, okay, so that's, um, we, we basically, we handled the introduction of a fairness criterion called unanimity fair. All right, so let me uh, go on a little bit and talk about implications. When do some criteria imply others? And then talk about Venn diagram reasoning to go along with that. All right, so Let's look at implications. So another way to say what implications are is this is if then reasoning. So you will have noticed by now 
there's a whole lot of if then reasoning that's happening in our analysis of election system. So like, you know, that you see the word if, if, if kind of all over the place. We're doing if then reasoning everywhere. So let's take a moment to sort of talk about the structure of if then reasoning. If P then the notation for that is P implies Q. That's this arrow with the double bar. That means if P then Q means that um, every time P happens, Q happens. It means that um, you can't have an instance of P, all P's are Q's. Okay, so let's think about cases where that happens, oh, you know, and to, to couch it in Venn diagram terms, um, the P bubble lives inside the Q bubble. All P's are Q's. Okay, so let's make that a little bit more uh, concrete by thinking about some real world examples. So what's a real world example where all P's are Q's? Okay, so how about if we think about this in um, geometry squares and Q is shapes. So every square is a shape, but not every shape is a square, right? And so if I were to do the bubbles, they would be nested. So squares are examples of shapes. So every time squareness happens, shapeness happens. Okay, that's a little bit of an awkward way to talk about it, but all squares are shapes. The bubble lives inside the other bubble. Okay, so let's just think of a couple of other examples of one thing that implies another. Um, so how about like, um, humans are mammals, right? So the class, the set of humans, we can also think about that as subset relationship. So this says the set of squares is a subset of the set of shapes. And the same thing is true of humans are a kind of mammal. Um, and then like professors are a kind of human, at least usually, right? So you can have like a whole nested relationship of sets inside each other. Um, so being a professor implies that you're a mammal, right? In, as far as I know. <laughs> Although one day we'll fully automate this job and then that and all bets are off, right? Okay, great. And so this can be a logical relationship of properties, right? Like to be a square is a property, to be a professor is a property. And so we can ask if some properties are nested inside other properties, in other words, if they imply them. Okay, so this is how, that's how I want us to think about implication. Um, Okay, so let's ask ourselves the question. Let's, so how about Condorcet fair? And I'll remind you what that means versus majority fair. And I wanna ask ourselves, I want us to ask ourselves, are there implications? Is it true that any system that's Condorcet fair is majority fair or vice versa or neither? No. The other inside the first, or they could just like overlap. Okay, so let's think about it. What does this mean? Condorcet fair means um, if any candidate beats all others head to head, they win. I'm going to use this H2H for head to head so I don't have to write it so many times that my hand falls off. What does majority fair mean? It means if any candidate has more than half the votes, the first place votes, they win.
And so what's the relationship between these two properties? Okay, well, it's a little bit intricate, but bear with me. So the thing to observe, so we're gonna make an observation. The observation is that a majority candidate is a Condorcet candidate. Every majority candidate Um, so they have more than half the votes. But that necessarily means that if you face them off with anybody else head to head, no matter who you consolidate them against, they're going to have more than half the votes, right? And so they beat everyone head to head. And so they're Condorcet. Okay. So a majority candidate is also a Condorcet candidate. So now I'm going to make a claim. I claim that every Condorcet fair system is majority fair. That's my claim, and now I'm gonna prove it. All right, again, we're practicing proof appreciation at the moment. So why is this true? I wanna convince you that this is true. So suppose I hold in my hand a voting system and we know that that system is Condorcet fair. and I'll abbreviate that CF. Suppose the system is Condorcet fair. Now, question, is it majority fair? I know it's Condorcet fair, is it majority fair? Well, to answer that, I suppose there's a majority candidate. But by my previous observation, that majority candidate is also Condorcet. Since the system is Condorcet fair, that means is that all Condorcet candidates must win. So my candidate wins. And so I'm done. I've proven that it's majority fair. I suppose there was a majority candidate. I observed they're also Condorcet. My system by supposition awards the spoils to any Condorcet candidate. And so this majority candidate wins. So they win and I'm done. And so now I've proved that Condorcet fair implies majority fair. So here's what's a little tricky about this. Let me flag it for you. Majority candidate implies Condorcet candidate, but it's the other way around for systems. Condorcet fair implies majority fair. Okay. So there's a lot of places you can kind of get turned around in the logic, but hopefully I'm making it fairly clear how to reason about from the properties of candidates to the properties of systems. It's like a higher level of reasoning about the properties of systems. All right, and so what have I concluded? What can I conclude? It's that the Condorcet fair bubble lives inside the majority fair bubble. Okay, the Condorcet fair bubble lives inside the majority fair bubble. All right, so um, I will Stop here for now. Um, I'll just say we've gone over the last, for now, fairness criterion. We've gone over how you prove that some criteria imply others, and I gave you an example. And we related that to Venn diagram reasoning. So implications can be rephrased as statements about like Venn bubbles living inside each other. Okay, and when I take this back up, will continue our reasoning about the structure of systems. 
before I stop for this lecture, let me say that, um, you know, I care very much about what it is that this is telling us, not just that we're learning to kind of manipulate facts and systems and pictures and prove things. That's also very nice. But like, what's the point? So I'm going to try to come back to that in every lecture. So the point here is to think about what we would require to feel that our democracy was living up to a set of ideals about collective decisions. And so far, what we're learning is, in some cases, fairly discouraging, which is that some things that sound really innocuous are actually hard to satisfy. Right. And so that's that's sort of the, the the downside lesson from the first part of this class is that when you try to write down um, fairness principles, you quickly get yourself into kind of logical knots and even very intuitive voting election systems don't satisfy some basic properties. Right. So that's that's kind of what we've built up to here or we've built up to kind of ways of thinking about that. And then we're gonna do just like we did, sorry to scroll around so much, I hope I'm not making you dizzy. Um, but just like we did here, when we tried to make a checklist, unanimity fair actually doesn't look so bad right now. Like most of the systems have unanimity fairness. But when I come back, um, I'll do a summary of some of the different properties and some of the different systems. And you'll start to see that it's very hard to get a system that satisfies multiple good properties at the same time. Okay, I'll stop there. Okay, next up, we want to reason about systems and properties. And um, we're trying to do something pretty hard, which is to show when some property holds generally or always. So this quick note, when we ask whether a system has a property, we're asking whether it always behaves a certain way. So in other words, we're reasoning about how it would perform under all possible elections. Right. If I say a certain system is majority fair, I don't just mean that it would usually convert a majority candidate to a winner. I mean, it would always do so. So quick note about this is that um, when you're asking, does a system have a property? The answer is either yes or no. It can't be, it depends. Because if it's something that happens sometimes, but not other times, then the answer is no, the system doesn't have that property, right? So we're, we're checking for universality, right? And so the reason I bring this up so as to set up a conversation about examples and counterexamples, um, I, I want to think with you about when to probe a property, it might be a good idea to make yourself an example election. So often what we'll try to do is build a weird preference schedule that's very special, that has particular kind of features. And what that'll be good for is um, often it'll help us understand that a system doesn't always behave a certain way. Well, it's an example to find an example. I mean, true, but not very informative. Um, so to find that a system doesn't always behave the way it should. In other words, this is a way to answer no to the question, does this system have this universal property? Okay, so I want to show an example of that. And what I'm going to do is use it to try to fill in this table. So here we see all the different systems that we've talked about so far, or at least most of them. 
Uh, and then up here, we see several of the properties that we've talked about so far. And um, last time I went through and I asked each, I interrogated each system and asked whether it's unanimity fair. So must a unanimous preference always result in the dispreferred candidate losing? Um, we saw the answer was yes a lot of the time. So now what I wanna do is I wanna kind of use similar reasoning to probe um, Condorcet fairness and majority fairness. I have to emphasize, the goal here is not to complete some giant table where we compare all the systems to all the properties. No, no, no. The goal here is to build up a toolkit for investigating a new system under a new property. Um, and you know, in out there in the world of real like democracy reform, um, which is a world I'm very much engaged in, um, it's not always gonna look like this. We're not gonna look at weird corner cases in the real world, we're going to be interested in whether a system usually has a property, whether a system under reasonable conditions can be expected to have a property. But right now we're doing a kind of warm up version of that, where we're just probing the like logical bare bones. Does this system always satisfy this property? Okay. Having said all that, I want to probe Condorcet fairness. Um, and so what I'm going to do is, so to probe, systems um, for country state fairness. I'll create a kind of weird election where there's a Condor state candidate who's not very strong. And that'll help me kind of look for systems that may not always anoint the Condorcet candidate as the winner. Okay, so let's recall what is a Condorcet candidate. This is, you know, I'll, I'll say my candidate will be C for Condorcet. So C beats all others head to head. All right, so what might that look like? How can you beat all the other candidates head to head? but not actually be a super great choice yourself. Well, um, let's look at an example like this. So, suppose that, you know, 50 people go have the preferences ACB and 50 people have the preferences BCA. So right now, um, half the people think C is better than B and half the people think C is better than A. And then I'm going to add one lonely person who thinks C is best of all. And maybe they go C, A, B, for instance. All right, so the thought process by which I conduct, I, I like construct this election. So this is it. This is the preference schedule. The thought process is, well, I want someone who beats everybody else head to head, but just barely. So if I actually check that I've done my job by making the pairwise comparison graph. So let's put A over here, B over here, and C over here. Um, a is preferred to B on 51 ballots compared to 50. So A beats B by one vote. But look, C beats B on 51 ballots. And C beats A on 51 ballots. So sure enough, C is Condorcet because all arrows point out C beats everyone else head to head, just barely. And notice that C does this with hardly any first place votes. So you see how this is a funky election, a designer election if you want, because it's intended to help me like prove a point. It's an election designed to have a Condorcet candidate who's kind of meh, right? And then that'll help me think about um, properties. Okay, so let's do it. Let's let's work through the winners. So who's the winner by plurality? Uh, well, A and B tie. So we can conclude for sure that plurality is not Condorcet fair because there was a Condorcet candidate and they didn't win. <laughs> so plurality, no, not Condorcet fair. Okay, let's try um, secondality. So this election can't help me decide 
whether secondality is Condorcet fair, because in this election, the Condorcet candidate wins the secondality sweepstakes. Um, but that doesn't tell me that they'll always win. So this is an important point. The winner here by secondality is C. Um, so this lets me know plurality is not Condorcet fair, but th this leaves it open. So secondality may be Condorcet fair or it may not, right? Condorcet fair is a question of always. So I can't tell just from this evidence whether secondality is Condorcet fair. Okay. So um, what happens here um, in a runoff? Well, the runoff is the top two vote getters. Those are A and B. Um, and then if you consolidate down to A versus B, as our pairwise comparison graph tells us, A will win. So the runoff winner is A. So this one's not Condorcet fair, right? Because the Condorcet candidate failed, failed miserably. Same thing happens with elimination. We eliminate the candidate with the fewest first place votes. So that's C. And so right off the bat, well, the same thing's gonna happen. I eliminate them, A goes up against B and A wins. So this is also not Condorcet fair. And so you see, I'm actually getting a ton of mileage out of this one kind of weird election that I constructed um, just to help me probe what happens if there's a Condorcet candidate who's not very good, right? Okay, so I can keep going. Um, next is Coombs. So I eliminate the candidate with the most last place votes here. That's B, A goes up against C, and A wins. So this is not Condorcet fair. Um, what's next? There's, we already know that pairwise comparison is Condorcet fair because pairwise comparison is who has the most out arrows, right? So actually I can go right back up to my little system here, a little table, and I can make that Condorcet fair. So far we've showed that um, plurality, runoff, elimination, and Coombs are no's. Plurality, runoff, elimination, and Coombs are no's. And secondality, we're not sure. Actually, let's dispatch secondality. That's pretty easy. Um, if you had just two candidates and everybody liked one of them better, that candidate would be Condorcet, but the other one would win. So this is not Condorcet fair. Hopefully that example was kind of clear out loud without having to write it down. Um, actually, while I'm here, let me make one other observation. So remember we showed, I showed, we showed in the last um, lecture that Condorcet, so let's recall, Condorcet fair implies majority fair. The way we pictured that was Condorcet fair was like a little bubble inside the majority fair bubble. So every system that's Condorcet fair is also majority fair. That lets me put a check mark here. Remember implication means when the one thing's true, the other thing follows, the other thing is also true. So whenever you're Condorcet fair, you automatically your majority fair as well, right? And so we have that. Um, let's do, sequential and dictatorship while we're here. And then we'll go back down below to do the little calculation for Borda and see if my little weird election helps us with Borda. Um, sequential is pretty easy. Condorcet fair means you beat everybody head to head. Sequential is a sequence of head to heads. So you're definitely Condorcet fair, therefore majority fair. All right. And how about dictatorship? Well, a Condorcet candidate beats everyone else head to head, but they don't have to be everybody's first choice. And so they may not win a dictatorship election where all that matters is the dictator's first choice. Right. Okay, so that just leaves Borda. So this is a question for us. Is Borda Condorcet fair? Um, so let's take a look. Let me try my election here and see if this helps. Um, pretty much this election is constructed so that A and B are pretty good candidates but A is just a little bit stronger because of that last column. And that's why A is winning in a lot of these methods uh, from a lot of these winner selection methods. Okay, so let's try Borda. 
Um, so I'm gonna tally up the border points and see who's got the most border points. And remember it's three points for first place, two points for second place, one point for third. Okay, so how many points does A have? Well, A's got 50 times three is 150 points from the first place. Um, this is worth 50 points because it's 50 times one point each. Um, and this is worth two points. So A has 202. Uh, hopefully you see how I did that. So this is worth 150, this is worth 50, and this is worth two. So I got to 150 plus 50 plus two is 202. Okay, how about B? Let's try B. So what do we have? Switch our color here. So this is worth 150 plus 50 plus one. Okay, so A edges out B in the board account just because of that last column, which makes sense. And then how about C? So this is worth 100 plus 100 plus three. So actually C is the winner by Borda. So what's my conclusion? I don't know, it may be Condorcet Fair. This is inconclusive. Right, if that makes sense, because um, one example can show you that something doesn't always hold, but one example can't show you that it does always hold. Right, might need to come up with another weird election to be sure. Okay, so I'm not going to be super systematic and try to fill in the rest of this table. You can try that if you want. I'm happy to do it in office hours. Um, but the points I wanted to make about this table are one single example, like here, this election here, one single example was good enough to learn a lot of properties um, to, to sort of show that Condorcet fairness doesn't apply to a lot of systems. I think that was good enough to get us this one, this one, this one, this one, and even dictatorship I could see from that one, from that example wasn't uh, always anointing the Condorcet winner. For secondality, I had to make a slightly different argument. So one single example got me a lot of mileage in terms of deducing the relationships um, between properties. Okay, great. So I would ask you generally, when should you try to construct examples? When should you try to reason generally? about all elections. Um, in part, that should come from, try. I, I recommend that you try some examples first. Examples are a great way to refine your reasoning. So try some examples first. And if those examples are inconclusive, then maybe the thing is always true. And you should switch to trying to make a general argument. That would be like a kind of paradigm for how to decide what to try. Okay, so, where does this all leave us? Here's my zoom out moment for this conversation. Um, you know, these are properties that as usual seem basic and you can't always have them. Um, in fact, if you just look at this very simple pair of properties, I, I want Condorcet Fair, someone who wins all the head-to-heads should win. Unanimity Fair, someone who's like universally dispreferred shouldn't win. If I just look at those two, take a look at these columns. This is pretty bad. The only one of our systems so far that we're like sure satisfies all three is pairwise comparison. It's like an early leader in the sweepstakes to be a good system for us. Um, and most of the others fail one or the other test about whether they're Condorcet fair and whether they're unanimity fair. But here's our totally good zoom out thought on that. It is that, as I said before, unanimity fairness sounds great, but in reality, it's very rare that there's a unanimous preference in an election. Think about that. So where you know the US goes to vote, there are 
you know, 330 million Americans. Um, uh, not quite that many people show up to vote on a given day, um, but you know, you can have tens of millions of people showing up to vote. What are the chances that they all agree on anything? Um, yeah, slim to none. So maybe unanimity fair is a kind of absolute or like cartoon version of something that might be a softer and more reasonable ask. So I would ask you to think about, especially since so many of you are committed to thinking about fairness in systems in all the ways that are important to um, our lived experience, um, what might we demand of our democratic systems? And here I'm gonna emphasize of a practical democracy. Right? Um, so this is an open question. You know, it's not, it's also not one that math can answer, um, obviously, but math can help us clarify the relationships between various things that we want and hope for. Um, and math can also help us take combinations of attributes that may be impossible to satisfy simultaneously and kind of soften or uh, relax them just enough to get something that actually helps us guide our way to a better winner selection system. So this is also, I'm gonna lead in to chapter three of the book, which is about spoilers by thinking about what are the things that really make us lose faith in the system? Um, so what is important to like proscribe, avoid, or exclude. Well, I wanna talk about two different properties that make us in different ways worry about the soundness of the system, about the democraticness of the system. And um, one of those is spoilers. Um, but another one is what you might call fence outs. What do these mean? So spoiler is first today, I'm just going to talk about spoiler as a general concept. Um, and then later we'll get into a technical definition. But right now, I'm going with the question, like, what are some intuitive properties that make us worry about the, the fairness about the justice of a system? Okay, well, spoilers, intuitively, that's when um, one, you know, not very important candidate can change the outcome. So this can happen, right? So famously in the year 2000, um, Al Gore was running against George W. Bush trying to be president. And um, Gore had a serious challenge on the left from Ralph Nader. Nader was running um, as a lot more progressive, as a lot more, uh, you know, he was sort of Bernie San Sanders before his day in the sense of being um, angry, talking about injustice, talking about shaking up the system, talking about the kind of getting more regulation back into government, uh, talking about, you know, the serving the dispossessed, right? Um, and he would say there's not very much difference between Bush and Gore. And so what happened is that Nader got some votes, um, in particular from almost all of my friends. <laughs> and um, Bush and Gore got a lot of votes. Gore got more than Bush nationally, but we have this electoral college system which buckets elections state by state. And in a few key states, notably in Florida, Nader got way more votes than the margin between Bush and Gore. So in Florida in particular, Nader had tens of thousands of votes and the margin between Bush and Gore was I think in the end 538, right? So Bush had eked out a win in Florida and people thought of Nader as a spoiler. Why was he a spoiler? Because 
most of Nader's voters, not all, most of Nader's voters, certainly because they were, you know, coming from the left, their preference, if they got to rank, would have been Nader and then Gore and then Bush. But because it's a plurality election, they were said to have siphoned votes away from Gore, tipping Florida and the whole election to Bush. Okay, so um, this is something that isn't just a theoretical possibility like a unanimous preference. This is a real and present and even frequent feature of actual elections at scale. And it's something that really shakes people's faith that democracy works, um, partly because it invites the fear of spoilers leads to another thing people think of as a corruption of democracy, which is strategic voting. So strategic voting is when instead of recording your true preferences, you vote a slightly different way because it's going to be more likely to lead to an outcome you prefer. So instead of real preferences, Um, you, you vote a different ballot to get a better outcome. Okay, so we're gonna take a little bit of time over the next few weeks to spell this out, to really write down what it means to be a spoiler in concrete terms. And then we're gonna look for whether elections can be spoiler proof. And we're also gonna look at this ancillary question here, can elections be strategy proof? I mean, it would be really nice if we could come up with a system of election where it was never advantageous to, um, to, to vote other than your true preferences. Like where some, you know, for instance, someone who genuinely prefers Nader to Gore should never have to vote Gore because they're afraid of tipping it to their last place candidate, in that case, Bush. Okay, so this is a whole dynamic around elections that's extremely realistic um, and that we, we really might want to, sort of let actually guide us in our choice of election system. Okay, but there's another one that I care very much about um, and you might call it fence outs. And so another way to say this is AKA minority representation. Well, let's talk about minorities. Um, and here, this doesn't just mean racial minority, although in an American political context, we, we think of racial minorities very often when we talk about minorities. But here, I'm actually just thinking about numerical minorities, like majority is more than half, minority is less than half. Um, the question we might wanna ask ourselves is, um, if democracy is about the will of the people, then almost every democratic theorist going all the way back to the earliest writings we still have on the subject, it says that if democracy is about the will of the people, then the majority rules. So like majority fairness feels really almost synonymous with democracy in some way, right? If you have a preference, like a salient discernible preference that's actually upheld by more than half of your electorate, then it should prevail, right? But the problem is, um, what if you have a minority that's large, cohesive, um, and persistent? If you have a simple majoritarian system, you risk totally fencing out or excluding um, the preferences of the minority. So they may fence out or completely exclude the minority preference. And most of our intuition about fairness would seem to find this so problematic that any system with this fence out feature should be discarded. Um, okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm trying to set up a soft problem, but one that, 
that I care very much about. Um, in the United States, uh, we have only a few hundred years of history. And over the span of that history, we more than most other democracies in the world have been grappling with the question of fence outs when it comes to race. So it wasn't, you know, the country was founded in the 18th century, but it wasn't until the Civil War in the 1860s, in the aftermath of the Civil War, that slavery was ended. And with the end of slavery came the Civil War amendments to the Constitution, which gave the franchise, i.e. the right to vote, um, to formerly enslaved people, particularly to African Americans, right? So we don't really become anything like a democracy until the 1860s. Um, when we extend the franchise to, um, to all races. But then, of course, there's women um, who aren't systematically enfranchised in the U.S. until 1920, until um, uh, you know, quite a bit later. <laughs> and so you, you, what you see is kind of a nation whose founding ideals have everything to do with equality among citizens, but which takes decades and centuries to grope its way towards something more approaching universal suffrage, right? And with that comes a sensitivity in American law to the rights of racial minorities in particular. And I wanna contrast this with um, a lot of other democracies in the world, which of course have to contend with race and ethnicity, um, but by and large haven't made racial equity and racial access to the franchise such an explicit part of their jurisprudence, of their history of laws. So in the US, we know that this is important. And <clears throat> I want to call out the major mechanism for thinking about this fence out property in American law. And that's called the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Okay, and so recall um, the black vote technically dates to 1865. Well, the Civil War amendments are 1865 to 1867, so let's say 1860s. But even though there's the technical right to vote, this is followed by a long period of American history called the Jim Crow era. So right after the Civil War, we have a period of reconstruction and black people are actually elected to Congress. Um, we get our first black members of Congress. Um, but by the 1870s, the government clamps back down. The, the government, particularly in the Old South, clamps back down on the black franchise. So. Uh, Rutherford B. Hayes is elected, and as part of the like backroom deals uh, that get Hayes into power, there's the, the Hayes Compromise, where DC agrees to pull federal troops from the American South, and it was those troops who were enforcing the Civil War amendments. And so the 1860s, um, Black Americans get the right to vote. By the late 1870s, um, that people who are making sure that that right is actually practically available are pulled, right? And so we enter this long, um, shameful period of American history. So 1870s to people usually date the end of it in 1965. Um, and this right is suppressed, violently suppressed. Um, well, violently and bureaucratically and by all kinds of means suppressed. So it's the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that really turns the corner on this. And so that's a complicated law. We won't go into it entirely right now. It's something that I think and write about a lot. Um, but essentially what it says is that uh, minorities, so racial, later ethnic, and language minorities um, must have an opportunity to elect. And what's important about the VRA, 
as the Voting Rights Act comes to be called, is that it's an opportunity to elect not necessarily members of their own group, but candidates of choice. Okay, so this is the most powerful um, voting law, I would say, of the land that we have right now. Uh, it's under threat in the current Supreme Court atmosphere, um, but it's still the law of the land. Uh, it has been therefore for 55 plus years. Uh, and it's done a whole lot of work making the country more democratic. But I bring it up to say it is intended to address this concern. We shouldn't have fence outs of minorities, in this case, some of the minorities that have been the most systematically disadvantaged, disenfranchised, and kind of suppressed from exercising the right to vote. We shouldn't have a system that blocks access. Okay, and so the idea of a fence out is on, along the lines of race um, is, is actually uh, against the law. <laughs> um, and so I'd like to tease this out as we go. Um, this gets into things that are a little bit, you know, beyond just the mere scope of math. And yet math can really help us try to understand what is it about a system that creates its fenced out potential. Okay. Um, so that's a good place to stop. I'll stop there. Okay, here we go. Spoilers. I'm so tempted to say spoiler alert. Let's see, I resisted. Okay, so what is a spoiler? So this is our topic for the week. And um, we, have, we have an intuitive idea. Then we have a slightly more detailed kind of English vernacular idea. And then we're going to write it down in math. That's the goal. All right, so first, like basic idea. And then detailed idea. And then only after that do we get to math ease. Or we write it down in a way that looks like math. OK, basic idea. Um, this is a candidate whose presence or absence has an unexpected effect. So a spoiler is a kind of candidate, not a kind of system. So you're, you're holding fix the system of election. And this candidate has a, an unexpected effect on the winner set. So the way to make sense of this is you compare them being in the election to removing them and you see how those look the same or different. So. Okay, so that's our basic idea. And it's already kind of a lot to work with, but we have to spell out, to turn this into a detailed idea, we have to spell out what unexpected effect means. So the way we're gonna make sense of that um, is by thinking about what are the expected effects? Like, what, what do you think should happen if a candidate is removed and the preferences are just consolidated? What effect should that have? Well, This is a, a good way of thinking about what unexpected should mean is you first you ask what's normal and then by knowing what's normal, now you know what's weird or unexpected. So there are basically um, three different ways that you can be expected that the, the sort of putting someone in or out might uh, be expected to behave. So one is, um, if if they won the election, so they're in the election and they win, then when you remove them, anything could happen and there's nothing should surprise us. If they won, you know, all outcomes are okay. Let me try to explain that. So remember from last time we were talking about the idea of a spoiler, a really good illustration is this Ralph Nader character from 
uh, from the 2000 presidential race. So you had, um, you had Gore, you had Bush, and you had this other guy, Nader. And um, when Nader was in the race, Bush won. But people strongly believe that if Nader had been out of the race, um, that Gore would have won. Okay. And so you call him a spoiler because he's a kind of somehow an irrelevant change. Your preferences between Bush and Gore shouldn't depend on whether Nader's there. Maybe, maybe we believe that, right? And if we do, then having Nader in or out shouldn't tip the winner between Bush and Gore. Um, but if Nader was in and won, then I don't have any basis to expect anything in particular if he's disqualified. That doesn't give me any information. Okay, so if they won, all outcomes are okay. Um, if they co-won, right? So if they won by tying with someone else, then whoever they were uh, tied with should become the winner when they leave. That would be the normal thing. Right, so if I'm running in an election and I tie with Ivanka Trump, and we're the co-winners, we have exactly the same number of votes. Strange election, but you never know. Then if I'm yanked out of the election, Ivanka should win. That's the expected outcome, that's what we expect. This is what we're cataloging here is, is like the state of normalcy. Okay, so if they won, if the candidate won, all outcomes are okay. There's no particular expectation. If they co-won, their co-winners should remain winners without them. If they didn't win, and this is the Nader situation, Nader didn't win, right? Um, their presence or absence shouldn't make a difference. This is what we expect. Now, I don't know, I'm not promising you that we're correct to expect this. Maybe this is too much to ask for, um, but this is the kind of untrained normal intuition for uh, what a reasonable election should do. Okay, so we've got our basic idea, we've converted it to a detailed idea, and now we're gonna convert it into symbols. We're gonna convert it into mathese. All right, so to do that, let's introduce some notation. Let's say that W is the winner set as usual. So I'm going to compare W to what I'll call W prime. So here, when you put this little mark, it's pronounced prime, and it means an alternative object. So I can have A and A prime, X and X prime. Um, if you've had calculus, this isn't a derivative. <laughs> it's just a different set, different winner set, alternate winner set. Okay, so I'm going to compare the winner set to W prime, the winner set without my candidate. Okay, because that's exactly how I can kind of look at these expectation conditions. So X is not a spoiler. Candidate X is not a spoiler if any of the following hold. And I'm just gonna copy my detailed English into math. I'm gonna translate it into math. Okay, number one, if they won the original election, W equals X, right? And I should say if they won solo, if they were the only winner, if they were the single winner, um, then I don't care what happens next. Okay, so that's condition one. They won solo. When they leave, ugh, all bets are off. Two, if they co-won, their co-winners should remain winners without them. Right, so let's look at an example before I try to write that down. So example of condition two. So suppose I had the winner set was X, B, and Q, right? Why not? And then what would it look like for 
their co-winners to remain without them if I disqualified X. So this is drop X, then the winner set should be B, Q. That would be the expectation that the only effect that they're leaving has is that the other winners win. <laughs> okay, so how can I write this down symbolically? This is an example, but how can I write this down in general? Well, let me ask you to remember one piece of set notation, which is the union sign. And the union sign is what happens when you take two sets and you take all their elements together. So if I write here, the winner set is the same as the alternate winner set with X added in. Okay, so the, the only difference between W and W prime is that I have to add X in to the set. That's condition two. If they co won, their co winner should remain winners without them. And then three, if they didn't win, their presence or absence should leave the winners unchanged. And so that's easy to write down. Winners unchanged, I know how to write that down. W equals W prime. Boom. The end. Okay, so it might seem um, hard to reason with, but it's very succinct. Here, I wrote it down right here. I didn't have to include W prime equals anything because that's always satisfying. So there's three conditions. X was a solo winner. The winner set only changed by adding X in and the winner set didn't change at all. These are normal. If anything else happens, we call X a spoiler. Okay, so now there's something I wanna emphasize as you think this through, which is when you're asked to assess a situation to see whether there's a spoiler, if your brain likes the set theory notation, use it. And if your brain prefers the detailed English, use that instead, they are equivalent. One's just a way of encoding the other. So, this is a math class, we're here to teach you some math. Um, and so I'd love to get you comfortable with this like really succinct notation. It's a whole lot fewer symbols. Um, and it's very powerful, it's a very powerful notation. But um, you don't need it to reason about spoilers. You can stick with the detailed English. All right, let's see that in action. Let's see that I am not lying to you. So examples of spoilers and non-spoilers. All right, I'm gonna use the following preference schedule. So I'm gonna use, suppose five voters voted F, X, S, D, and let's suppose two voters voted F, S, X, D. One voter voted S, X, D, F. Four liked S, D, X, F and three liked D, X, S, F. There's my election. Okay, and now I wanna ask you to take a look at this particular election and in the confines of this election, uh, find some spoilers. That's our goal. All right, well, I can try my hand by picking a system of election and, and seeing who is the winner. So let's do one of our simplest methods, which is plurality. All right, plurality is very easy to tabulate. I just look at the first place votes and I see F has seven first place votes, S has five, D has three. And so the winner is F, they have the most first place votes. Okay, and now I want to see who I can drop to check if they're gonna be a spoiler, okay? Who might I drop? Who might I test out as a candidate possible spoiler? All right, well, I can't disqualify F. They will not be a spoiler because they won. If you were the solo winner, you're not a spoiler because when you leave, anything can happen. All right, so I better drop one of the others, S, X, or D. Well, I'm interested in changing the outcome, right? 
So it would be silly to drop X that won't change the first place votes and plurality is all about the first place votes. Okay. If I dropped D, that wouldn't be very impactful. It would move X up, but not enough to displace F. So the only reasonable person I might drop and see what happens is I might drop S. That's a reasonable thing to try. Okay, so what happens if I drop S? Well, um, I can write down the consolidation, but it's actually not that hard to count. I see that F will still have seven first place votes. And now D will have seven first place votes and X will have one. Let me actually write it down just, to, just so we see what happens. So that first column becomes F, X, D. The second column also becomes F, X, D. The next column becomes X, D, F, and then D, X, F, and then D, X, F again. And so there's seven of these, there's one of these, and there's seven of these. Just want to make sure you see how I did that. All I did was I took S out I just squeezed them right out of the preference schedule, squeezed the rest of it down. And I saw that these two columns, both, once you drop S, they both look like FXD. And that's how I got seven here. It's so that five plus that two makes seven. So that's how I get the consolidation. Okay, now who's the winner prime? Who's the new set of winners? Now F and D tie. Is that a spoiler? Well, I ask myself, is that weird? So they didn't win before, but when I took them out, they changed the outcome. That's weird, S is a spoiler. So we would say S is a losing spoiler under plurality. Okay, and that's how this goes. Um, why losing? Because, well, they didn't win. <laughs> so a winning spoiler is someone who wins, but when they are disqualified, something funny happens. And a losing spoiler is someone who loses, but when they, uh, when they exit the race, something funky happens. Okay. I want to make sure we understand kind of that reasoning of how to go looking for spoilers. Um, and of course, here I gave you the election and asked you to look for spoilers. Another thing you could be asked to do is like make up an election and think about its spoilers. But let's stick with this for a moment. Let's try one more time to probe for spoilers. I'm going to try a different election system. I'm going to try runoff. Okay, who's the runoff winner in this election? Well, let's take a look. So the way runoff works is I take the top two first place vote getters, consolidate them down head to head, see who wins. Okay, so looking at this, definitely it's clear that the top two are F and S, right? They have seven and five first place votes. So what happens if I run them off head to head? Well, how many people like F over S? That's five and two is seven. And how many people like S over F? That's one and four and three is eight. So the runoff winner is S. Okay, hopefully that's clear how we did that. Good. So now I want to ask, who can I drop? I'm looking for a spoiler. I'm looking to see if there's a spoiler effect. So who can I drop that might change the outcome? All right, well, let's think about it. Looking up at that election, if I were to drop D, it wouldn't change the outcome. It would give X some first place votes, but not enough to make it into the runoff. So like spoilers, well, not D. Who else is not a spoiler? Well, S isn't a spoiler because they're the solo winner. The solo winner is never a spoiler because when they leave, anything could happen. It's okay, everything's okay. All right, so that only leaves me with two possibilities, F and X. Well, X is not a spoiler because if they're dropped, it doesn't change anything about the first place votes. 
So the only one worth checking is F. That's the only one I can bother to, to check to see what would happen. All right, well, let's consolidate F out of the game and see what happens. X, S, D, S, X, D, another S, X, D, S, D, X, D, X, S. All I did was squeeze F right out of that table right there. And then this has five votes, S, X, D. Now the next two columns together both consolidate to S, X, D. And then I have four and three. Okay, so here's my consolidated election. Who wins the runoff now? The top two vote getters are X and S. So I look to see who has more votes, X or S. Um, X is ahead in these two columns. So that's eight, leaving seven for S over X. So it looks like X wins. Hey, look, I found a spoiler. This is a different kind of spoiler than before. When I dropped S under plurality, it went from one winner to two. And when I dropped F under runoff, oops, I should write out what I mean. which is that the winner prime under runoff equals x. So f is a spoiler. So my finding here was that s is a losing spoiler under plurality. And my finding here is that f is a losing spoiler under the runoff system. Great, that's how it works. Um, so I'll stop here for now. And in the next lecture, we'll look at the question, is it possible to have a system of election that can't have spoilers? Can we have a spoiler proof system? And should we desire that? Let's continue our investigation of spoilers by looking at the question, um, can we ever design a system without spoilers? Now, in my mind, this question is gonna help us answer the related question, how important is it to be spoiler free? If it's impossible, then we better not make that our number one priority or, you know, the end, right? So we have to sort of clarify what's possible before we can work out what we demand of our democratic systems. Okay, so I'm gonna try to convince you that we can't ever design a reasonable system without spoilers. So to convince you, actually for this whole first half of the semester, I'm mostly going to prove depressing facts for you. Things that say, ah, oh, you like fairness? How nice for you. You can't have what you want. <laughs> that's, that's a little bit the, the theme. So let's, let's see that here. Um, I'll introduce a new, very basic fairness criterion. And then using that, we'll see that reasonable systems always have spoilers. Okay, so a new fairness criterion. I'm gonna call this very basic property two-way fair. Okay, so my definition is gonna be a two-way fair system is one in which if there are only two candidates, whoever has more support, more first place support wins. My goodness, what could possibly be more basic, <laughs> right? If you've only got, if you're doing a head to head, the one with more votes should win. I'd like to think this is like a kind of bare minimum requirement of a system. And now I'm gonna prove depressing theorem number one. 
So theorem, in math, a theorem is an important statement that is proven, that's a theorem. Um, okay, so what's my theorem? Any two-way fair system admits spoilers. Okay, this is sort of bad news. Um, that's okay. We'll we'll come to accept our fate by finding that um, spoilers might be tolerable in certain circumstances. So we're gonna work our way towards that uh, kind of compromise point of view. Well, first I want to convince you that this is true. Any two-way fair system admits spoilers. All right, so I'm gonna prove this for you. So to show that it admits spoilers, that just means spoilers are possible. So to convince you of that, I they merely need to give you one preference schedule that has a spoiler. But to show some things possible, I have to only show I only have to show one example, right? Um, to show something is always true, the burden is greater. But to show something's possible just requires an example. All right. So what I'll do is I'll say Condorcet to the rescue. I'll grab a Condorcet cycle. Condorcet intended this example as the thing that's really hard to to handle for any reasonable vote system. It's very hard to handle voting system. So um, let's look at the world's most basic Condorcet cycle. Um, one voter votes ABC, one voter votes BCA, and one voter votes CAB. And so the preferences go around in a circle like so. I mean, if you look, there's perfect symmetry in this election. There's absolutely no logical reason to prefer one of A, B, and C to the others, right? There's no kind of reason for it. And if we, um, if we have a system that is independent of candidate names, then there is literally no difference between A, B, and C. But if I don't want to assume that, there's only a few possibilities. So I have a mystery system. So like, let, uh, let's let V be some given voting system. I don't know what it is. This seems like it's gonna be really hard to prove anything about this voting system if I don't even specify what it is. Um, so how am I gonna do that? I'm gonna do that with cases. So case one, case two, and I'll show that either of these cases leads to the spoiler finding. So how many winners are there under V of this election? Well, case one is that all three win. That's actually not so crazy because um, there's really no material difference between the three. So I might as well say they all tie. They're all winners. That's, that's not crazy. And now what I want to see is if I disqualify any candidate, let's suppose I drop A and see what happens. Well, if I drop A, that consolidates it down to B, C. I have two of these and one of these and B wins. Why does B win? Because it's two way fair, right? That is two-way fair because what I need to show is that any two-way fair system admits spoilers so I could suppose that my giving given system is two-way fair well if it's two-way fair and it's confronted with this election two-way fair means whoever has more support wins so the winner prime under voting system v becomes b and voila spoiler okay who's the spoiler the spoiler is the candidate whose removal did a weird thing. And so in this case, that's A is a winning spoiler. Right, I hope you see why that's right. A is the one whose removal did a weird thing. Why is this weird? Because the expected outcome, if A, B, and C were all winners and I dropped A, you'd think that B and C would stay winners. But that's not what happened. It tilted the outcome to B rather than C. And so A is a winning spoiler. So that's in case one where all three are declared winners. 
Okay, so what's case two? Two are declared winners. Okay, so for instance, that might as well be A and B. It doesn't matter which names I pick. I might as well pick A and B. All right, so now I want to look for a candidate to drop and do something surprising to the outcome. All right, so let's see what I might do. Well, it won't be A um, because if I drop A, I'll be down to that same preference schedule as above, same head to head, B will be the winner, that won't be weird. Okay, so let's instead think about what would happen if I dropped B. All right, if I drop B, the ones who are left are A and C. And looking at my schedule above, I see A has one and B has, C has two, right? These columns here, like C better than A. So after this consolidation, W prime is C. Okay, that's weird. The winners used to be A and B, but when B dropped out, instead of A staying behind, it flipped the whole outcome to a whole new candidate. C, right? So who's the spoiler? It's the one whose removal made a weird thing happen. So in this case, B is a winning spoiler. All right, so if all three were declared winners, I found a winning spoiler. If two were declared winners, I found a winning spoiler. So of course, the last case I have to consider is that one is a solo winner. I can't have no winners, so these are the only cases. If I understand these three cases, I understand everything. Okay, so in this case, let's say the winner is A. So now I wanna find a candidate to drop and have a surprising thing happen. So that candidate won't be A, because if you drop the solo winner, there can be no surprise. So let's see, who should I drop, B or C? If I drop B, I've already seen what will happen. If I drop B, A and C will face off head to head and C will win. So the winner prime under system V is C, and that's weird. That's the Nader scenario. <laughs> you drop, drop someone who didn't win anyway, and you change the winner. So what have I got here? So in this case, B is a losing spoiler. Okay, and now um, we're done with our proof. I just wanna show you the structure of this proof. I wanted to show a thing, namely, I wanted to show that there is a spoiler. So I divided the world of possibilities into three cases. And in each of those three cases, I found a spoiler. So the logic goes, no matter which case, I, V is a mystery system. I don't know what its properties were. But no matter what, V always led to my ability to identify a spoiler. So I found a spoiler, no matter what. And I'll put a little square here to say my proof is done because that's what I was trying to prove. I was trying to prove any two-way fair system admits spoilers. And I proved that by finding an arbitrary two-way fair system and then finding a spoiler. And that proves that any two-way fair system admits spoilers. Cool. Okay, this is pretty satisfying. This is definitely the like, most elaborate, logically elaborate proof that we've done so far. Um, good. So with this in hand, I think we should ask ourselves, um, are we willing to, we have two choices. We can abandon two-way fare or we can resign ourselves to the possibility of spoilers. And then maybe look to try and figure out if they're gonna happen all the time, if they're gonna happen not all the time, Maybe we were wrong to resent spoilers in the first place. Maybe we should just learn to love the spoiler.
Well, I could imagine a system that's not too way fair and has no spoilers. I'm, I could always choose dictatorship. So I claim the dictatorship has no spoilers. That's not a contradiction with my previous theorem because dictatorship is not two way fair, right? Dictatorship doesn't care who has more votes, just dictatorship only looks at a particular voter's preferences. So claim dictatorship admits no spoilers. So another way of saying that is that dictatorship is spoiler proof. Okay, let's prove that it's spoiler proof. Uh, prove that it has no spoilers. All right, so suppose that the winner of some election by dictatorship of say the case voter you know, maybe the fifth voter, the 12th voter, some particular voter, voter K. Um, suppose the dictatorship winner is A. So what does that mean? That means the dictator's ballot starts with A because the, the winner under dictatorship is the first choice of the dictator. So the dictator, voter K, their ballot starts with A, and then it has something, 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 dot, 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 something. I don't know anything about the rest of the ballot, but I know that it starts with A. Okay, well, nothing else matters. I can ignore the whole rest of the preference schedule. So no matter who I drop, if I drop A, that's not a spoiler effect because dropping the solo winner never produces a surprise. So if I drop anyone else, you know, if I drop candidate B, Whoever else I drop, disqualifying them doesn't change the first choice. Consolidating them out of the schedule keeps A at the top. A is still the winner. And so I have here that the new winner set W prime under dictatorship is still A. No surprise here. So there's no spoiler. Right, and so I found I'm done. I found that no matter who the winner was, if I drop anyone else, it doesn't change. And if I drop them, there's no surprise. Either way, no surprise. So there's no spoiler. So what I want you to notice is that even though these proofs had some math symbols in them, I logic my way through them using basically the English explanation of the detailed idea of what it is to be a spoiler. I didn't need this set theory definition in order to do the reasoning that got me through these examples. Um, and so if you can just phrase things in a way that's precise enough and that you can reason clearly about, um, that's what you need to, to prove things in this class. Good, good, good. Well, um, closing thoughts on spoilers. Um, so we're, we're sort of stuck with them. I mean, we could always abandon two-way fairness and just opt for dictatorship, say. Um, but that doesn't seem to be a really healthy democratic option. Uh, so are spoilers so bad? <laughs> I feel like that's the question we're left with. If spoilers are kind of an inevitable consequence of democracy, then maybe we need to learn to love the spoiler. Um, okay, so let's stop and think about it. Should it really bother us that someone leaving a race has an impact on what's left. Well, if you stop and think about it, the whole way that we use a preference schedule, the whole thing that it's for is to know not just your first choice, but your next choice and your choice after that, and to make use of that data. Somehow we want to harness that data in a really good system. And so you might think that spoilers are actually not so worrying because they're actually preference rankings working the way they should. So one point of view. Disqualifying a candidate should change things. <laughs> a 
In other words, disqualifying a candidate merely by throwing their support to the, throwing their voters support to the next preference should legitimately change how strong that next preference is, is taken to be. Uh, so from this point of view, actually the spoiler effect might just be rankings working in their best possible way, namely um, when someone leaves, they might have been a pretty marginal candidate. They might have been a nader. But when someone leaves, we, we actually might like a system that by shifting their support changes the outcome between the other two. So actually, uh, we might just sort of accommodate ourselves to a world in which we can't get rid of spoilers by thinking about actually the democratic advantages of spoilers. So this point of view says maybe spoilers are a sign that support being transferred is actually making a difference. Okay, so that's my kind of optimistic spin on a world where we cannot eliminate spoilers. And that's probably a good place to stop. Okay, so goal for this week is to introduce something called the Smith set as a way of thinking about candidate strength. So we're going to be answering this question here. What is a strong candidate? Oops. And the way that we'll do that is we'll think about stratifying our candidates by some subsets of candidates that like clearly beat the rest. So we're going to define a subset of candidates that we're going to call the Smith set. And I'm going to denote that with a script S, which is a subset of candidates uh, that should be thought of as strong. What's going to be important about that is it's going to give us some substance to our intuition that certain candidates kind of shouldn't matter or should be irrelevant. So the others, which we will ruthlessly call weak candidates, um, are in some ways irrelevant, as we'll make clear. So what's the idea? Here it is. The Smith set is the smallest set of candidates that beats everyone else head to head. Okay, so this is our working idea. And now I want to give you enough information to make that precise. So let's put down a definition and then we'll work it out on this example. Definition. <clears throat> so given a preference schedule. Right. And so that's actually a good point. The concept of dominating sets and Smith sets doesn't require you to specify a winner selection method. You don't need to say what the system of election is. These are just properties of preference schedule. So you conduct an election, you ask everyone their preferences, you survey those, you should be able to identify who the strong and weak candidates are. And that might actually help us pick a system of election. Okay. So given a preference schedule, we say that a set of candidates is dominating. So I'll call that script D subset of candidates is dominating or a dom set. Dom set just stands for dominating set. So a subset of candidates is dominating if every member beats everyone else head to head.
Okay, and then what we're going to build up to you is that there's a whole collection of dominating sets and the Smith set is the smallest one. That's going to be the idea. All right, so this is our definition. So let's do an example. Using this preference schedule. All right, so what do I have here? Well, um, let's take a look and kind of just think qualitatively about the election that produced this pairwise comparison graph. So one thing I can notice if I look at E, E gets beaten head to head by three candidates, A, B, and C, and they tie with D. Remember, if there's no, this is how the book notation works. If there's no um, arrow drawn between two candidates, I could also just denote that with like an equality sign. It just means they tie head to head. So D and E tie in this picture and B and C tie. Okay, so qualitatively E looks pretty weak. And actually so does D because D and E tie each other and lose to everybody else, right? So this suggests that maybe if I take A, B and C, if I just take those candidates, let's take a look. Do they have the property that they beat everyone else head to head? So let's consider the subset A, B, C. That's a subset of candidates. Well, each of these beats uh, D and E head to head. So this qualifies as a DOM set. Okay, so I've got my first example of a dominating set. These candidates are clearly stronger than the others. Stronger than the others. Okay, but are they strong? Are they, is this the smallest possible dominating set? Well, what if I tried to take a smaller set? Um, if I tried to take just A and B? Well, that wouldn't work because B doesn't beat C. B and C wouldn't work because C doesn't beat A. A and C doesn't work because C doesn't beat B. And none of them works on their own, right? So let's, let's make an observation about that. Observation. A DOM set with one element, with one candidate. What is a DOM set with one candidate? That would be a candidate who beats everyone else, right? But we already have a name for that. We call that a Condorcet candidate. So a DOM set with one candidate, um, contains a Condorcet candidate, you know, must be Condorcet. That's a, maybe a better way to say that. So if you have no Condorcet candidate, like in this election, then there is no singleton DOM set, right? Okay, so this is just an observation along the way. And so what does that do for this particular example? Well, I, there is no dominating set with just two candidates and there's no dominating set with, what, with just one candidate. So this is the smallest one that's possible. In fact, um, this is the smallest possible. So the Smith set equals this set ABC. Okay, that worked. Fine, but it was a little ad hoc. So we want to build up some stronger methods for figuring out who the strong candidates are. In this case, we know um, the strong candidates are ABC, and they're distinctly stronger than DNA, who are about equivalent to each other. Um, we want to build up methods for understanding this in general. Okay, so there's a quick thing that uh, should be observed and that we're gonna take a second to, to try to understand a little better. And that is, I'm defining the Smith set to be the smallest dominating set. But what if there's some two that are the same size? What if some two dominating sets have the same size? Um, I'm gonna argue that that can't happen. And so that's the next thing we're gonna see. So that's this proposition. And I drew a lovely picture to go with it. <laughs> um, for a given preference schedule, the DOM sets are nested each one inside the next, inside the next, like a sequence of Russian dolls, right? So that's my uh, gorgeous illustration of this principle. So now what I'd like to do is prove this, right? 
Again, what does this mean? This means given any two DOM sets, one of them is inside the other. So let's write down what I want to show. I want to show that given any two DOM sets, one is wholly inside the other. Like my lovely scary dolls. OK. Um, so to prove this, what I'm going to do is use an absolutely fundamental bedrock proof technique from math, um, which is called proof by contradiction. So what I'll do is I'll suppose they weren't nested, and I'll show that that leads to an impossibility. All right, well, let's try it. So suppose I have one dominating set, I'll call it D1, and another dominating set, I'll call it D2. And if they're not totally inside the other, that must mean there's something in here, but not there, and there's something in there, but not here. Actually, let's call this candidate X and this candidate Y. And now perhaps you can see why this can't happen. What it means to be a dominating set, so by definition, dom set, all arrows point out, right? Because being a dominating set meant you, be you beat everybody else. And so consider the arrow between x and y in the pairwise comparison graph. Well. I redraw that a little nicer. All right, what does it have to look like? Well, since the arrow has to point this way, since as x is in d1, but y is not. Right, I'm in the dominant, x is in the dominant set, y isn't, so x beats y. But looking at the other dominating set, y is in d2 but x is not so all arrows have to point out of d2 because it's a dominating set so y beats x so this can't happen you can't right being uh, one implication tells you that x beats y the other one tells you that y beats x and those can't both be true at the same time um okay this can't happen and so actually this is a proof by contradiction we have found a contradiction and this is the symbol that um i and a lot of mathematicians like to use for that Contradiction. So I'm done with my proof. And here's the logic, right? If I supposed that they weren't nested, it led to an impossibility. So that couldn't have been the case at all. They must have been nested in the first place. And that's my proof. This is a really beautiful proof technique. It's a little hard to wrap your mind around at first, but really valuable. If you want to show something is true, show that the opposite leads to an absurdity. And then you've convinced yourself that the original statement had to be true. Okay, great. So now um, this is kind of, now that this is proven, we can use this fact forever and we can build on it. So um, I've shown that dominating sets are nested. And so what that means is if I start with the full set of candidates, there's some dominating set and then maybe some inside that and maybe some inside that. Um, and you get this, this is what the nested structure looks like. And so I get all the way down until I can't reduce anymore. And I get the smallest one that has any candidates in it. And this is the smallest. It's the innermost of the nested sequence of dominating sets. Maybe this is D1, this is D2, and so on. Okay. So this means there can be only one smallest set. So the Smith set is what we call well defined. It makes sense, it always exists. 
By the way, let me mention, it's possible that the Smith set is all the candidates. Smith sets can be big. So for instance, if you have a simple Condorcet cycle, our usual basic Condorcet cycle that looks like this, you know, the world's most confusing election. Um, then of course, I have the arrows go around in a circle. And so no two candidates dominate the other, no single candidate dominates the others. So in this case, the Smith set is the full candidate set. Okay, that can happen. So um, in the book, Christoph talks about the Smith system of election in which you declare all the strong candidates to be winners um, because of the Smith method. Um, I don't really consider that a very viable election system because it will typically have a lot of winners. And usually if we're trying to select someone, we, we want a small set or even just one winner. So it's not very practical as a system of election. Still, it's really important for us to think through, it's gonna help us understand what we mean, what, what we might mean when we talk about strong and weak candidates. Okay, so um, let's do a little bit more with this. I wanna show you two more things about Smith sets for now. One of them is um, kind of building up to how to find them. Let's talk about the smallest dominating set containing a particular candidate. So this, I want to define the concept of primitive dom sets. And then I just have one more goal after that, which is to show you that um, you can always find a strong candidate by running a sequential tournament. So those are the last two concepts I'll do for this lecture. Okay, so what is a primitive DOM set? So let's define um, for any candidate, let's say uh, A in the candidate set, um, their primitive DOM set, which I'll call D sub A, is the smallest dominating set containing them. Okay. So going back to our example from before, let's see if I can grab it. Voila. Oh, technology. Okay, so going back to my election example from before, I can ask um, who were the, which was the smallest dominating set containing any particular candidate? All right, so let's look at DA. DB, DC, DD, and DE. Okay, well, it's not that hard to see the answers in this case, but I'm gonna use this to make a couple more observations. So in this case, we saw that there was no smaller set than ABC, that was the smallest one, so dominating set. So therefore, for any of those candidates, um, the smallest dominating set is ABC. Now, how about D, right? So if I want any set with D where all the arrows point out, I better include B, C, and A in it, right? Um, and then, well, e, there's no arrow from D to E, so actually I better include everybody in it. That's how weak these guys are. Okay, so the only two dominating sets in this picture are ABC or everything. 
So if I were gonna represent that like Venn diagram style, it might look like this. I have the Smith set and I have everybody. A, B and C are in the Smith set and D, E are not. So this is a kind of Venn diagram summary of the kind of relative strength of the candidates. It's possible that there could have been like more steps in the stratification, but in this case from A, B and C to D, E, there was sort of nothing else in between. All right, so let me make a few observations about the situation. So one observation I can make about this is that the Smith set must be someone's dominating set. In fact, every dominating set uh, has to be a, a primitive dom set. Right, in particular, if you take the Smith set and you take any candidate in it, ABC, clearly the smallest dominating set containing them is uh, this had ABC, right? So this is actually, I don't, in my opinion, this doesn't really need a proof. This is just kind of clear. Um, because, you know, if you have, so suppose you have some system like this. So, and suppose candidates, you know, P and R are here and S, T and B are here and F, O and X are here and N, Y and C are here. Okay, so that's a that's an election. Imagine that I have this set of nested dominating sets. All right. Well, think about it like this. If I grab, if I take this particular dominating set here, if I take this one, and I want to know whose primitive is this, all I need to do is grab a candidate who's in there, but not the next one down. And I can see DX is going to be P, R, S, T, B, F, O, X, right? And so you can sort of see a way to identify every dominating set as someone's primitive. You just sort of set up the nesting and you look for someone who's in that level, but not the next one down. And then by construction, that dominating set is their primitive. Okay, I hope that's, that's relatively clear. Um, uh, or even very clear, that would be great. <laughs> okay, so every primitive, uh, every dominating set is someone's primitive dom set. But this is nice because it means if you're sort of absolutely have to figure out everything that there is to know about dominating sets, you can just work out the primitive for each candidate and you've got the whole picture. There aren't any others besides those. Okay, so the next observation is, let's look for instructions on how to build a primitive dom set. It's actually not that bad. All you have to do is you iterative yourself. Who don't I be? Okay, you iteratively ask yourself, who don't I beat? So let's try to do that again in the same election as before. Wouldn't call this the world's greatest system. Okay, good enough. All right, same election as before. And so now I'm asking the question, who don't I beat? So let's try to do that for E. All right, so that's the smallest dominating set containing E. So now I ask the question, who don't I beat? And that gives me C. So now I know that the set that I want is going to contain E and C. So I'm going to circle those guys. So now I ask those, who don't I beat? Well, E also doesn't beat B or A. So I have to include those as well. And then finally, E doesn't beat D either. In fact, who don't I beat is the question that you never stops asking, <laughs> right? So just starting with the question, who don't I beat? I, I start with E and I expand to all the candidates. 
Well, let's do the same thing for um, candidate B. All right, so I start with candidate B. Who don't I beat? I don't beat C. B doesn't beat C, right? Who don't I beat? Well, that has to take me to A. And then I'm done. Just by asking who don't I beat of A, B, and C, the answers are always gonna be A, B, and C. I don't have to expand anymore to get someone that isn't beaten. And so that's a way of building up and computing the dominating set, the primitive dominating set for candidate B. Okay, so you iteratively, that is over and over repeatedly, ask who don't I beat and include all the answers to that question and you found your primitive DOM set. Okay, so I have one more concept, which is um, how this relates to sequential tournaments. Let me go ahead and do that. So I have one more proposition to finish out this part of the topic. And that proposition says, any sequential tournament winner is a strong candidate is in the Smith set. Okay, so if I want to write that mathily, I'd say if the winner of a sequential tournament, actually, let me write it this way. Um, yeah, no, actually, I'll write it that way. If the winner of a sequential tournament of any kind is X, then X is in the Smith set. Okay, this is the proposition. And this is actually really practical because if you're given a big messy pairwise comparison graph and you want to find the Smith set, you don't know where to start, run a sequential tournament and you found someone in the Smith set. Okay, so let's try to see um, why this is true, right? Why is this true? Well, because if X won a sequential tournament. How did they do so? They did so by eliminating all the other candidates. Okay, and how did they eliminate all the other candidates? They beat someone who beat someone who beat someone who beat them, right? They had to win a head to head um, against someone who beat someone who beat someone who beat each candidate, right? Winning a sequential, just think about it like pool table elimination. So be the last one standing, you have to beat someone who beat someone who beat someone who beat each possible contender, okay? But if you think about it, this means, so here's my candidate X, who's the ultimate winner. Here's any other, so given any other Y in the candidate set, here's some Y. What this means is that there had to be some other sequence and I'll put a, a dot, dot, dot here so that X beats someone who beats someone, eventually who beats someone who beat Y. Okay, so there's a directed path in the graph from X to Y, right? That's what it means to have eliminated someone in the tournament, right? But this means that the dominating set, the primitive dominating set for Y, remember, how do we construct it? We start with Y and ask, who don't you beat? Who don't you beat? Who don't you beat? And so that's gonna eventually include X. All right, so X is in every dominating set. Because they're in all the primitive dominating sets and all the dominating sets are primitive. So X is in every dom set. 
And that means they must be in the smallest DOM set. Okay, and I'll put a little square to say I'm done with the proof. So this is this is a really nice argument, I think. Let's see if I can fit it all on the screen. Almost. <laughs> um, any sequential winner, just by virtue of eliminating all the others, um, they have to be in every dominating set because they have these arrow chains pointing from them to everybody else. So they must be in every dominating set, making them strong. Okay, and then so we're done. Let me just summarize what we've done. So now we have an algorithm, and I don't mean a computer algorithm, although you can code this if you want, but I mean an algorithm in the sense of a, a set of instructions, a method, a systematic method for finding the Smith set. You just run any sequential tournament to find one strong candidate. And then you find their primitive DOM set. By expanding out to the ones they don't beat, they don't beat, they don't beat, and so on. Voila. OK, good place to stop. Um, so what have we done? We've come up with a notion of what it might mean to be strong and a practical way to identify candidates who are strong. Um, and then we're gonna use this to help clarify our intuitions about who ought to win um, various kinds of elections. All right, I'll stop there. All right, so let's continue our discussion of this idea of a Smith set and how to use it and how to make it kind of relevant to the stuff we care about. Um, all right, so let's let's think a little bit more about this idea. So recall, oops. Recall a couple of key definitions that we're gonna need to proceed. So the Smith set, script S, which is a subset of the candidates, is the smallest dominating set. So what that means is it's the smallest set so that everyone in there beats everyone else head to head. So it's the smallest group of candidates such that everyone in the club beats everyone outside the club. <laughs> Another way of saying this, and one that's kind of useful if you think about this in terms of the pairwise comparison graph, is that all arrows point out. Right? So that's the Smith set. And then our notion of strong is just defined as Smith candidates. So whoever's in this Smith set, that's what it means to be strong. And, you know, as usual, when we make a definition, we should ask ourselves if that naming is justified. Is, are we kind of, is it reasonable to think about this as like what we mean by a strong candidate? Well, if you're in the smallest group that beats everyone else, it seems kind of reasonable to think about these dominating sets as like stratifying the candidates by strength. And this is the very smallest, or in other words, strongest group. So it's kind of, I think it's kind of reasonable to call these candidates strong. So all others are called weak. Okay, so that's our little reminder of what we're talking about. And now I wanna get to who cares? What's this good for? So this notion is useful because it's quite stable. So a lot of the kind of paradoxes 
of voting theory have to do with the fact that you can have everybody's preferences, but if you consolidate to these candidates versus consolidating to those, you might kind of get a different viewpoint on who should win, right? And so here's what I mean by being quite stable. So this is, a, I'll call this a proposition. If you start with an election and you drop, you consolidate out any weak candidate, then the Smith set is unchanged and all the arrows are unchanged within the Smith set. That's, that's, uh, that's important. So uh, if you, well, there's sort of two parts of that. So let me separate that out a little bit. So if you, one, one thing to note is this, this is a good property of pairwise comparison graphs. So if you drop any subset of candidates and consolidate uh, to the remaining ones, the, the arrow directions and even the magnitudes are unchanged. You know, so their vertices disappear from the graph so their nodes disappear from the graph, but the pairwise comparison graph is otherwise unchanged. That's pretty nice. So in other words, maybe I have a pairwise comparison graph that looks like this. I have A, B, C, D. I have some margin here of 10, and here of eight, and here of six, and here of four, here of two, and here of two. You know, maybe I have this graph. I'm gonna call this part A of my proposition. Okay, so example here, um, what if I consolidate to ABC? In other words, candidate D is disqualified. Well, a nice thing happens, which is this, oops. The candidate who's disqualified disappears and nothing else changes. <laughs> this is a really nice feature of these graphs. The graphs are pretty stable. When you drop some candidates, they vaporize, um, but nothing else has changed about the head-to-heads. Let's think about why that is. The reason for that is that if you think about the data in the pairwise comparison graph, when you pull a candidate out and you condense, you consolidate the rest, you haven't changed of the, of the remaining candidates who's above who. All the ballots preserve the order of the remaining candidates because all you've done is squish them, right? And so um, dropping D doesn't change whether A is above B or B is above A on any of the ballots. And so it changes nothing about the winner between A and B and about the margin between A and B. All of that stays the same if I've just pulled D out of the graph. So that's a first, maybe you can call that an observation. But then part B of the proposition is that if you drop any weak candidate and consolidate, and you can drop one or more than one, the Smith set is unchanged. That's what I mean by saying it's pretty stable. Okay, so the, the whole notion of weak is kind of built to do this. If you pull out the weak candidates, um, the, the strong candidates are, they don't even notice. <laughs> They're unchanged, who's strong is unchanged, and kind of their relationships to each other are unchanged. Um, so these weak candidates, this is another notion, this is another like justification for calling it weak. These weak candidates are in this sense, pretty irrelevant to the relationships between the strong ones. That's pretty nice. Let's try to see why this is. So I justified why part A is true of the proposition. Let's try to understand why part B is true of the proposition. Well, um, just think about it in terms of what we just observed that anyone who's dropped, um, their part of the graph disappears, but the rest of the graph stays the same. Okay, so it's, it's not that hard to see that strong candidates say strong, right? Because it's still the case that all arrows point out of their bubble, right? 
So the only thing that we need to check is that the, um, the set of strong candidates didn't just get bigger, right? Um, and I, I can prove that in detail um, a little bit later, but I just wanted to give you the idea for now, which is that, but because, you know, so the basic reason is that S is defined um, by these arrows, right? This all arrow, these all arrows point out kind of understanding of what S means. Um, and so uh, I'll do a formal proof later, but for now, let's just say um, that's the reason it's so stable when you drop, drop weak candidates. Okay, all right, so that's good for now. Let's do a little bit more with this and um, try to see how this relates to our last concept of spoilers. So the idea is that like strong and weak are gonna help us clarify our hopes and dreams about spoilers. Okay, so the next thing to do is to say, what does it mean for an election to be, system to be Smith fair? So a voting system is called Smith fair. If, all right, so, right, Condorcet fair meant that if there's a Condorcet candidate, they should win. So Smith, Smith sets are about identifying strong candidates. Um, and so a voting system is going to be called Smith fair if its winners must be strong. So put another way. Um, only strong candidates can win. This is a rephrasing of what Smith Fair means. Winners must be strong. Only strong candidates can win. So there's a nice way to write this symbolically, which is to say that the winner set is a subset of the strong candidates. Notice I'm not saying that all strong candidates will win, but that whoever wins must be strong. Winners are strong. The winner set is a subset of the Smith set. Okay. So let's think about this a little bit more. Um, let's do a little proposition on this. So I would like to convince you that um, Smith fair implies Condorcet fair, but not the other way around. In other words, I want to convince you that the Smith fair bubble is inside the Condorcet fair bubble in the great Venn diagram in your mind. Okay, why is this true? Smith fair implies Condorcet fair, but not vice versa. Well, proof. So suppose a system is SF. Um, I must show it's also CF. Um, to test that, suppose there's a Condorcet candidate, and then I have to show they win. Okay, but how do I do that? Well, as we saw before, if there's a Condorcet candidate, all arrows point out. And so the Smith set is just that one candidate. It's just a singleton. So if X is a Condorcet candidate, the Smith set is just X alone. Because it's clearly the smallest dominating set. It's the smallest set where all arrows point out. OK. But now what does it mean to be Smith fair, which is what I supposed Smith fair means that winners have to be strong, like only the strong can win, right? Only strong candidates can win. That's exactly what Smith fair means. But take a look here, there's only one strong candidate X. So if we're Smith fair, um, 
a strong candidate must win. And in this case, that's only X. So the winner set is X along the end. All right, so we proved Smith fair implies Condorcet fair. Well, actually, to be to be strictly accurate, we proved this part. Smith fair implies Condorcet fair. So let's take a second to see why not vice versa. And so basically that that just asks, can I come up with something out here? Can I come up with a really dumb Condorcet fair system that's going to fail the Smith test? Yes, I can. It, the, the usual kind of Frankenstein construction works really well here. Imagine a silly voting system that if there's the Condorcet candidate, they win. And otherwise, you take a week, the, all the weak candidates win. There's no Condorcet candidate, all the weak candidates win. So you can see that that's Condorcet fair, but it's clearly not Smith fair because it can lead to weak candidates winning. Okay. So that does both directions. I'll just write that down just for completeness. So see that not every Condorcet fair system is Smith fair. Use a Frankenstein system. If there's a Condorcet candidate, they win. Otherwise, the winner set is the all the weak candidates. Silly system, but it does the trick because it's Condorcet fair, but it can lead to weak people winning. So it's not Smith fair. Great. All right, let me try to do um, just a few more concepts here and then um, take a break. Next, um, let's let's. I'm going to take this one and call it a claim. It's a little bit lower on the hierarchy than a proposition. Um, let's pick a system and show that it's Smith fair. So let's show that um, the method of pairwise comparison. Remember that's the system where you count the out arrows. You count the other people that you beat head to head. So the pairwise comparison winners are the ones that have, the win the most head to heads. So I claim that this is Smith fair, right? So in other words, only strong candidates can win a pairwise comparison contest. Okay, that's my claim. Let's try to see why. Actually, this one is, it's kind of a fun proof. It's a very short proof, one line proof. Suppose there are S strong candidates and W weak candidates. So in other words, the size of the Smith set is S and the total number of candidates, which is n, total number of candidates is s plus w. I'm just using s as my name for the um, number of strong candidates and w for the number of weak candidates. All right, then let's think about all the arrows. So over here, I have the strong, and outside of their bubble, I have the weak, and all arrows point out. Right, that's what strong means. It's the smallest set where all arrows point out. Okay, so um, each strong candidate wins how many head to heads? Well, they have to beat all the weak ones. They have to beat all the weak ones. They might beat some of the strong ones, but they have to beat all the weak ones. So they win at least W head to head just by virtue of beating the weak ones. On the other hand, now suppose I have someone out here, someone who's weak, 
how many people can they beat? Well, they can't beat any of the strong candidates. They can only beat other weak candidates, right? And notice you can't beat yourself. There's no such thing as beating yourself. You tie with yourself, right? <laughs> and so how many can you win if you're weak? The best you can do is all the other weak candidates besides yourself. And so there are W minus one of those. All right, so this means, so every strong candidate has to have more pairwise comparison points than the weak ones. And since the winner is the one with the most points, the winner set must be within the set of strong candidates. The end. So we just proved pairwise comparison in Smith Fair by showing that the people who get the most pairwise comparison points had to have come from the strong set. It's a cute argument. It's an easy argument. Okay, good. So I think I can just introduce one more concept and then that's a good place to pause. So the last concept for now is I want to define smithification. Okay, so by the way, I'm trying to follow along with our book, Christoph Berger's book, pretty closely. Um, but there's a few places where I think he does things in a way that's a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. So smithification is a term I made up that I think is a little easier to understand uh, than the stuff in the book. I guess this is chapter five. Um, on, he calls it a priori Smith fair, a posteriori Smith fair. I'm not gonna use that Latin language, although I have to talk about it if anyone wants to chat about what it all means in office hours. I'm gonna replace that with this idea of smithification. So here's the idea. Um, any winner selection method can be smithified. All you have to do is you do a couple of steps. Step one, finds the Smith set. Step two, consolidate to the Smith set. Step three, run your method. Okay, so this is the definition of Smithification. So what is it saying? Like on the worksheet, there's an example of Smithified plurality. So usually for plurality, you count who has the most first place votes. For smithified plurality, you would um, first find who's strong, then consolidate to the strong candidates, and then check who has the most first place votes. Okay, so you can smithify any method. And I'll give you the punchline, the reason that we care, and then I'll come back and do a couple more examples and so on in the next lecture. So the proposition that explains why we care is Here's what we're building up to, right? The whole notion of strong was to help us think about spoilers. And, you know, we can't have spoiler proof elections that are still democratic, that can't happen. Um, and so we might want to actually think about which kinds of spoilers bother us. And so here's the proposition. Um, smithified methods have no weak spoilers. Boom, that is the point. <laughs> that is great. I can't, so the, the last thing I'll say is um, the idea here, I can't totally banish spoilers. Uh, but I can eliminate the possibility of weak spoilers. Someone who kind of wasn't as compelling as the major candidates, but nonetheless changed the outcome. Smithification is a simple way to modify any election, well, relatively simple, way to modify any election system to make sure it's not gonna have any weak spoilers. Okay, so I hope that is enough to, you know, justify all the funkiness of the Smith set definition, it has a big payoff in the end, which is that it lets you get rid of the kind of spoilers that um, are maybe the most disturbing, the kind that are weak, but nonetheless change the outcome. All right, I will stop there.
Okay, let's pick up where we left off. So what did we do last time? Last time we left with this thought. There is no democratic system that is spoiler proof. I can't totally banish spoilers, but I can easily create democratic systems that have no weak spoilers. And the idea in my back pocket to do that is to make use of the Smith set. So that idea is called Smithification. And the point here is you can Smithify anything. You can Smithify Borda, plurality, secondality, dot, dot, dot. You can Smithify any system. All it means to Smithify is first find S, the Smith set, then consolidate down to those candidates. And then with only those candidates, run your system, Borda, plurality, secondality, et cetera. Okay, so find S, squeeze down to S, run your system. That's smithification. So I had two IOUs, two things that I mentioned but did not prove about this idea. So let's go back and finish those IOUs. And then my other goal for this mini lecture will be to introduce a brand new system called VPath. Okay, first IOUs. So let's start with IOU number one. When a weak candidate is removed from contention, the Smith set does not change. So let's try to see why that is. I'm gonna make a handy little cartoon. Suppose these are all the candidates and this is the Smith set of candidates. And now I'm gonna take a weak candidate over here and call them X. And then I'll say, I must show If X is removed, say disqualified, S neither grows nor shrinks. It stays the same. That's what I need to show you. You can't get any new members in S and you can't lose any members, neither grows nor shrinks. Okay, so first, the easier one is that S can't grow. Okay, so let's see why this is true first. So why can't S grow? Well, what it is to be the Smith set is to be the smallest dominating set for the original election. And that means that all arrows point out of S, including to X, but to everyone else as well. All arrows point out that's what it is to be a dom set. So with or without X, all arrows point out. So S remains a DOM set. And therefore it can't possibly, the new Smith set can't be anything bigger because the new Smith set is the smallest DOM set. This is a DOM set, right? Um, I'll call it S prime, just like for spoilers. After I make a change, I call the new winner set W prime. So in this case, I want to call the new Smith set S prime. So the new S prime can't be bigger because it's the smallest DOM set. Right, this is a DOM set. So it's in contention for the smallest. Okay, so that's why S can't grow. And now let's see why S can't shrink. All right, so S can't shrink. So I wanna see why it can't be the case that there's some candidate over here, let's call this candidate, you know, Y, who used to be strong, but falls out of the dominating set. Why can't that be? Well, imagine that it was possible to make a smaller dominating set without Y, so just cut them out. Imagine it was possible to cut them out of the DOM set, right? That must be because all the other strong candidates have arrows pointing towards Y, but if that were the case, they already didn't need to be in the DOM set. You see, my explanation sounds like it's going in circles, but that's because it's doing something so natural. It's just saying, we've already noticed that Taking X in or out doesn't change any of the other arrows. And since the Smith set was essentially determined by things to do with the way the arrows point, taking out X can't change 
the Smith set. But I'll, I'll try to write that down anyway. But if this sounds like way too obvious, it's because it is fairly straightforward. So S can't shrink um, if Y were to drop out of S prime. So if Y weren't going to be in the new Smith set, then all other strong candidates B Y So they shouldn't have been in the dominating set in the first place. <laughs> okay, voila, that's the argument. So that completes my IOU. When you disqualify a weak candidate, it's truly irrelevant from the point of view of the Smith set. Okay, it's my first IOU. So now let me finish up my second IOU and then we'll get on to something new. So my second IOU was the following claim. Um, any Smithified election has no weak spoilers. Okay, so that's what I wanna convince you of. So this turns out to be pretty easy, thankfully. Not that hard to see why this is true. Okay, so why is it true? Uh, since the system is Smithified, all right, so let's remember, what does that mean? Smithified means you shrunk down to just the strong candidates before deciding on a winner. So necessarily it means that only the strong candidates from the original preference schedule can win. So the weak can't win. <laughs> That's what we've done. We've kind of tossed the weak before doing anything else to find a winner. Therefore, the weak can't win. So since so the system is specified, the weak can't win. And furthermore, um, the winner set depends only on the Smith set. Because again, what is Smithification? Toss out everyone and just consider the Smith set. So the winners depend only on the Smith set, okay? But this means since removing the weak doesn't change us, and the winner set depends only on S, it doesn't change W. So no weak spoilers, just as we desired. That's what we wanted. Okay, again, the weak can't win. So when you drop them out, you don't change S, but the winner set only depends on S, so you don't change the winners. Therefore, they weren't spoilers. You threw them away and nothing changed. They weren't spoilers. All right. Okay, let me bridge to our next topic, which is beat path. And um, this is gonna be a new system. It's one of the last ones we're going to encounter, maybe the last one, actually, this might be the last new system we're going to meet. It's a little more complicated to run, but you won't have any trouble doing it with a little practice. Um, it's called the beat path system. So what is this? It's like Pairwise comparison, this is based on the graph with arrowheads. In other words, to, to find the beat path winner, I don't need to see the preference schedule. I only need to see the graph, but I need to see the margins of victory, not just the directions of the arrowheads. That's the idea. So let me explain what it is and I'll explain it with an example. Let's consider 
this election here with four candidates D and I'm just going to put some arrowheads down, put some numbers on them just to illustrate. Okay. Let's see if I can manage to copy this a few times to make some points. Okay, so I have three copies of the same election. I just want to use this to make some definitions. So a beat path from candidate X to candidate Y, which I'll write like this. Actually, maybe I'll write it like this. Okay, I'll put the double arrowhead on there to indicate that it can be a whole path. It doesn't have to be just one step. It could be two steps or three steps. So it's uh, B path is any path in the graph following the arrows. Okay, so in particular, let's look at some B paths from C to B. All right, so let's mark one over here in red. So from C to B, what can I do? So from C to B, I can go this way and then this way. So what is the beat path? It goes from C to A to B. That's a beat path because it follows the direction of the arrows from C to B. And this is the only one. Right, because there's no other way to get out of C. And then once I move to A, there's no other way to get out of A. So this is it. All right, let's try something a little different. Let's try to get from B to A. Okay, so now there's more than one way to do it. So what might I do to get from B to A? Well, I can go this way. That's one thing I can do. And it looks like from B to A, I can also go this way. That's another thing I can do. And it happens that both of these have length two, but I'm allowed to take any number of steps and it's still a B path. So for instance, let me write these down. So this is B, C, A, and then there's another one that goes uh, BDA. And then of course, let's, let's look for one that has length three. So how about from C to D? Well, I see one way to do that in particular, I could go from C, I can go one, two, three, right? So there's a path, a B path that goes C to A to B to D. All of those are examples of B paths. Okay, so the next notion we need is the strength of a B path. So by definition, the strength of a B path is the strength of its weakest link. So the margin of its weakest link. So in other words, I look at all the segments of the path and I look for the lowest margin. So what are they? Well, for this one over here, um, which is C to A to B, that's the one that's C to A to B. 
yeah, from C to A to B, that's not good, but it, that's the B, C to A, that's the one that's shown above in blue. So B to C to A is shown in blue. Um, B to D to A is shown in green. B to D is shown in red. Okay, so let me just write their strengths. What are they? B to C to A, the strength is two. B to D to A, the strength is two. And C to A to B to D, the strength is also two. That's how you do strength. You just look for the smallest margin along the way. Okay. So now we're almost there. How does B path work? So candidate X eliminates candidate Y. And my notation for that, it's denoted X triangle Y. So this, this triangle, it sort of looks like X is greater than Y, but I close it off with a triangle. That's how to remember that it's X beating Y because it looks like a greater than sign. Okay, so devoted, denoted by X triangle Y. When does it candidate X eliminate candidate Y? If X has a stronger beat path to Y than Y has back to X. Okay, and that's it. You go through and you look at the eliminations and then the winner by the beat path me method is every candidate left standing after all the possible eliminations. And for small examples, which are the only kind that we're ever gonna look at, it's not that hard to do. So let's go do it for this election and then I'll stop this lecture. Okay, so what happens here in this election? Let's take some two candidates and compare them. Actually, here's a nice tip for you. It helps to work from the biggest margin down. So for instance, that margin of eight, that occurs from D to A. So D has a beat path of strength eight to A given by the direct path. And uh, here, I'll erase this blue so it doesn't get in the way. And then what I can see is A is eliminated because D eliminates them. D has a stronger path. D has a path of strength eight to A. And of course, look at the rest of the graph. There are no more eights anywhere else. So there's no way A could possibly have as strong of a path back. So A is out. And now I can look at the rest of the numbers and try to repeat my luck. Even though the A is out, I can still use them in the argument if I want. I don't, I don't have to consider them, but I can still consider them. So A beats B by a margin of six. And if I look, the only paths out of B have strength two. So there's no way B is gonna have as strong of a B path back to A, right? Because anything coming out of A has strength at most two. So B is gonna be eliminated by A. A eliminates B. All right, so my B path winner better be either D or C. So look at them. Well, um, D has a path of strength four to C. And now um, there is a path from C back to D. Look, it's over here in red, but its strength is two. And that's the only way to get from C back to D. So since the red path has strength two, but D to C has strength four, C is also eliminated. They're eliminated by, uh, D is, it eliminates C. D is greater than C. All right, there's only one candidate left standing. And so I'll convince you of this next time, but this process will always end in at least one winner. So at the end of the day, so for the example above, The winner by beat path is D alone. And that's how it works. That concludes our example. So what did we do? We examined this graph and we compared some of the candidates to see which ones eliminate the others. 
And we were able to get three of them eliminated, leaving only one of them left standing. And that candidate was D and so D wins. All right, so that is how to run the BPATH method. And then in the next lecture, I'll show you why it works and why we care, right? It seems like just another kind of crazy thing to do, but actually this is not so crazy. It has some pretty good properties. Um, and so we'll stop here and pick back up with that. Okay, so we have a new system of election, basically the last one that we'll be introducing this term. And it's called beat path. And again, the idea of beat path is that you look to see when a candidate eliminates another. Elimination is when you have a path to them that's stronger than any path they have back to you. Um, and then if you just sort of do all the eliminations that you can find, then whoever's left standing, those are your beat path winners. So there's a couple things I want to point out about BPATH, about like why it works um, that are kind of interesting, I think. And um, and then let's, so, so that's properties, and then we'll do a little, so what? Okay. So to introduce the properties, let me start with an idea for math that you may not have heard before, but it's an important one. So math idea. It's called transitivity. Okay, so transitivity. What is transitivity? Transitivity is a property that some relations have. Um, I'll write down what it means to be transitive in a kind of mathy way, but then I'll just also give some English examples so that we really wrap our minds around this idea. I think you'll find it useful, you know, elsewhere in your life besides just in this class. So, um, so a definition, if star is a relation between, you know, say elements of a set, Um, it is called transitive if x star y and y star z implies x star z. All right, so this might look a little intimidating because it's all symbols, but the idea is really, really intuitive. The idea is let's let's sort of think about an example and a non-example. Okay, so let's think about one example, taller than. And then let's think about the definition. So the definition says, if I'm taller than you and you're taller than the other guy, we can conclude that from that that I'm taller than the last guy, right? I'm taller than you, you're taller than him, so I'm taller than him. That's transitivity, right? Transitivity just says sort of when you have a chain, the property passes all the way from the beginning of the chain to the end of the chain. So taller than has that property, okay? What's a non-example? Um, parent of. So that's a relation between people. Parent of is a relation between people. But if, you know, a is the parent of B and B is the parent of C, then there's a name for the relationship between A and C. It's called grandparent. It's not called parent anymore, right? So if, if uh, A is the parent of B and B is the parent of C, it is not true that it follows from that, that A is the parent of C. So parent of doesn't pass all the way from the beginning of a chain to the end of a chain, right? And that's the idea of transitivity. Okay, so at this point, maybe like throw me on pause and stop and try and think of three examples and three non-examples. It's a really good thing to do. Go ahead, I'll wait while you pause me. And we're back. <laughs> pause is a beautiful thing. Um, so hopefully you came up with your own examples. Um, I wanna name a few more. Um, so one example is 
So by the way, I should say taller than applies to people um, or houses <laughs> or, you know, other structures taller than uh, parent of applies to, to people or just let's say, you know, animals. Animals can be parents of each other. Um, and now let's, let's think of some other relations and what they apply to. So another example is greater than or equal to, and this applies to numbers. If X is greater than or equal to Y and Y is greater than or equal to Z, it certainly follows that X is greater than or equal to Z. In fact, that sort of works just like taller than. It's like, it's what it means for one number to be taller than another, I guess, <laughs> right? So greater than works. Um, another example that works is subset of, which applies to sets. So if A is a subset of B, and B is a subset of C that, well, just look at the nesting, A is inside C. So it passes all the way from the first thing in the chain all the way out to the last thing in the chain. So the set relation is transitive. Um, another important, like a really important, really fundamental example is equals, right? If this equals that and that equals that, then equality passes all the way from the beginning of the chain to, to the end of the chain. And this applies to, for instance, uh, you know, certainly applies to numbers, but um, other kinds of things can be equal as well. It applies to sets, it applies to lots of other things. Equals is a really powerful notion. Okay, and now what are some non-examples? Um, let's see, how about, um, What's another non-example of transitivity? How about um, is five greater than, right? So this applies to numbers. Eight is five greater than three. Three is five greater than negative two, but eight is not five greater than negative two. It doesn't sort of pass down the chain. Okay, so hopefully these examples and non-examples clarify this notion of transitivity. And now actually let's get back to voting and you'll see that um, this really is actually going to be kind of right at the heart of what is so hard about voting theory, right? So a fundamental non-example of a transitivity is beats head to head. Right, and this, or in other words, this, that's the same thing as like having an arrow from one to the other. This is a relation that applies to candidates in an election. I can, I can note that if A beats B head to head, and B beats C head to head, that doesn't tell me anything about A compared to C. Right, transitivity would mean that if A beats B and B beats C, then A beats C. And that need not be so. It might be so, but it need not be so. In fact, we could have C beat A. This is called the Condorcet cycle. And so Condorcet cycles show that the relation of beating someone head to head is not transitive. And this is, remember like Condorcet cycles are our big sort of engine of paradoxes in voting theory. They're what makes voting and elections weird. That's what creates all the paradoxes and pathology, right? So this makes us very sad as fans of good voting systems because it gets in our way all the time. This, this like failure of transitivity, the fact that you can go all the way around in a cycle um, makes it hard to make decisions, right? And so wouldn't it be nice if we had some other relation, some other way to compare candidates that is transitive, where there can't be cycles, right? Where you can sort of once and for all compare the candidates and um, you know that information passes down a chain. Well, there is. Um, and this is like beat path elimination. And this is why it's so beautiful. This is the secret to why it's kind of a big deal. So that's this thing that we're 
denoting with a triangle, right? Um, and so the point is, if um, if I have a candidate A and they dominate, they, they I should say, eliminate B, and then I have a candidate B and they eliminate C, then it follows from that. I'm gonna prove this for you. It's not obvious, but it's true. It follows from that, that this arrow goes the same way, no cycles. So this elimination relation is exciting and you'll see that what that's good for shortly um, because it's transitive. Okay, so this is something that we, with our math hats on, are very excited about. Okay, that's awesome. Great, all right, so um, let me try to convince you why it's true. All right, so this, um, by the way, you know, this class isn't really premised on the idea that to, do, to succeed in the class, you need to learn to write a proof. Um, I hope that that's a skill that many of you will pick up in this class. You'll learn how to make coherent arguments that are mathematically convincing. And that is what proof is after all. Um, so I wouldn't call that, you know, the kind of focal point center of the class, but it's, it's a really great aspiration. What is important to me though, um, not so much that you all learn to write a proof, but proof appreciation, that you learn to follow a proof and tell when you're convinced by a mathematical argument and when you're not so convinced, when it seems to have holes or gaps in it, right? So that's what I'm calling proof appreciation. Great, so now I'm gonna prove this and I consider this result a kind of big deal. So I'm gonna call it a theorem. Mostly I've been calling things claims or propositions. Theorem just means a mathematical fact that's kind of a big deal. That's all it means. So I'm gonna call this a theorem. Okay, so what is my theorem? Theorem is beat path elimination is a transitive relation, meaning that if A eliminates B and B eliminates C, it follows from that logically all the time and without fail that A eliminates C. Elimination kind of passes down a chain. Great, this is the theorem, let's prove it. All right, it's kind of a cool proof. It's not long, um, but it's a little subtle. So let me prove it for you. I'll prove it in cases. So here's candidate A, here's candidate B, and here's candidate C in our pairwise comparison graph. So, well, instead of drawing all the, there might be lots of other candidates too in the selection. Maybe there's 35 candidates, this is just three of them. So I'm not drawing the whole graph. I just want to draw some pieces of it that show the paths between these guys, between these candidates. All right, so um, A by, I get to assume that A eliminates B and B eliminates C. So what does that mean? That means there's a beat path. Let me draw that a little nicer. There's a beat path. Double arrowhead means it's a path. It might involve many steps. There's a path from A to B. Um, I'll call this path P following the book. Um, uh, and I want the strength of this path. So this is a capital P for the path. And I'll say with the strength of P equals lowercase p. Now, capital P is a path, lowercase p is a number like five or 12 or two, right? It's the, it's the strength of the path, which means it's the margin of the weakest link in the path. Now by hypothesis, right? So this is my hypothesis. And this is my desired conclusion. This is what I have to convince you of. Um, so by hypothesis, this is stronger than any path from B back to A, right? It's unmatched. It's not, there's nothing that goes the other way that's as strong. So I'm not gonna write that down, but I wanna keep that in mind. Exact same thing happens when B eliminates C. This means that there's some path, which I'll call capital Q from B to C. And let's say the strength of this path is little Q. Okay, so I've got these two paths. Uh, 
So what do I want to show? I want to show that A beats, that, that A eliminates C, right? And so what I have to do is I have to consider what's a beat path from C to A and what's a beat path from A back to C and C like sort of which is stronger. That's what's going to show me which of these two eliminates the other. All right. Well, I know there's at least one path from A to C. What is it? It is, um, let me draw it like this. So this might be a whole bunch of edges that make up path P. And this might be a whole bunch of edges here that make up path Q. So if I can follow the arrows, I can just sort of swim downstream and follow those arrows. I can do path P followed by path Q. And that is a way to get from A to C. So I'm going to write that over here. I'm going to call that PQ because what it means is do P then Q. So that is a way, like blue followed by green is a way to get from A to C, right? Do you guys see that? I ask the air. Um, okay, so how strong is this path? Stop and think about that for a second. So a path is only as strong as its weakest link. So think about it this way. If the blue path, if its weakest link had strength three, and the green path, its weakest link, its weakest link had strength seven, what would be the overall weakest? Well, it would be three because it's less, right? So the strength of PQ equals P or Q, whichever is less. Why is it the one that's lower? Because the strength is the weakest link. So for the concatenated path that does one than the other, the strength of the overall path is just the lowest number we ever saw. So it's whichever is lower, the lowest number on blue or the lowest number on green, whichever is lower. Okay. All right. So my question is, might there be a path back? This is a question. Might there be a strong path back from C to A? Right, because that's what I always have to ask myself for elimination. I look at a path one way and then I ask if I can match it with a path back the other way. That's the question for B path. Okay, well, I don't know. And so a powerful thing to do in math when you're not sure is suppose that such a thing did exist and see what you could say about it. So let's suppose that R is the name of some B path from C back to A. So this is a path from C back to A. Okay, so let's try and figure out um, what we can say about the relative strength of the two. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna break, because this is um, the strength of PQ is P or Q, whichever is lower. I'm going to do uh, one of my other proof techniques and I'm going to break this into cases. So case one um, would be the case that like P is the bigger of the two numbers. P is bigger than or equal to Q. That means Q is the lower number, you know, or they're tied. Um, so the strength of the path PQ equals the smaller number, so it's Q. Right, the only other possibility is that P is less than Q, either it's greater than or equal to Q or it's less than Q. Uh, so in this case, the strength of PQ is the smaller number, which is P. Okay, great. So let's figure out um, what the problem is here. So, if, uh, I should actually, I should give a name to the strength of this. Well, you can probably guess what I'm gonna call it. If the strength of P is P and the strength of Q is Q, I'm gonna call this strength R. Okay. All right, so now what I wanna show is that R uh, can't 
be the stronger path, right? I'm trying to convince you that A eliminates C. So I wanna show you that that B path PQ is unmatched. So if R were bigger than Q, right? I'd get a contradiction. The reason is the path um, RP red than blue would have strength Is this the one I want? Let me think about this. R were bigger than Q, path RP. No, I don't want this. If R were bigger than Q, the path QR um, which goes from B to A, right, has strength Q, ah, confusion, all right, let's fix it, bigger than Q, the path QR, the strength Q. No, I think I was right the first time. Then RP, which goes from C to B, QR goes from B to A. QR has strength Q. QR has strength Q. P is bigger than Q. No contradiction. <sighs> Okay, so confused myself a little there, so I'm gonna pick up where I left off. <laughs> All right, what are we trying to do? So we're trying to prove that B path elimination is transitive. And so we drew ourselves this little picture to show the possible eliminations between three candidates, A, B, C. And there's, we suppose there's a B path from A to B that's unmatched, a B path from B to C that's unmatched, and then we want to see what we can say about A versus C. So one thing to note is that there is a path from A to C that you get just by doing P then Q. I'm going to call that PQ because it's doing P then Q. And then maybe there's like in red path, B path back from C to A. There might be paths both ways. Be paths both ways. So where I left off was suppose there's a B path R from C to A, and let's say that the strength 
of that b path i'm going to call little r reasonably enough since the strength of p is called p the strength of q is called q so the strength of r will be called r and now i must show to show transitivity i must show that pq is stronger than r all right so what we'll see is if I suppose that R is stronger, I'll get a contradiction. I'll get something that's impossible. It'll contradict one of my assumptions. All right, so I'm gonna do that in two cases. Why two cases? Because what's the strength of PQ? Well, it's little p or little q, whichever is lower. Okay, so which one's lower? So case one, P is lower or equal. Case two is that Q is lower. So these are the cases, right? This covers all the possibilities in the world. They're numbers. One of them has to be lower than or equal to the other. Okay, so let's see. What do I want to do in this case? Here, since the strength of PQ was whichever is lower, in this case, it's P. And in this case, it's whichever is lower. And now that's Q. So I want to suppose um, so I want to suppose that R beats this, or at least matches it. And in this case, I'll suppose that R beats or at least matches this one, right? And now I need to get a contradiction out of that. So let's do it. So in this case, I look at the strength of QR. This time I'm not, uh, okay. So what's QR? It's green followed by red. QR is green followed by red. How strong is it? Well, it's either got strength Q or it's got strength R, but both of those are bigger than or equal to P. The strength is QRR, so it's bigger than or equal to P. So if I do this path, QR green than red, that's stronger than or equal to P. So um, I claim that can't happen. Why? Because the blue path was supposed to be unmatched. The blue path has strength P, it's supposed to be unmatched, but I just found one that goes the opposite way and matches it, at least. This can't happen. This is a contradiction. Boom. Can't happen. This contradicts my hypothesis that blue is unmatched. And the other one's going to be just the same. Actually, let me try to keep the picture just in view. So the other one's going to be just the same. In this case, R's at least as big as Q. So what happens if I do R followed by P? Well, how strong is R followed by P? It's either R or P. And both of those are bigger than or equal to Q. So now red followed by blue is at least as big as Q, but that contradicts my assumption that the green beat path was unmatched. Okay, so I conclude that PQ is stronger than any R and therefore transitivity. A eliminating B and B eliminating C led to the certainty that A also eliminates C and that's transitivity. Throw myself a little party. Okay, <laughs> so what's uh, what's happened here? 
I've just gone through, I promised you that this proof wasn't too hard, um, but it is a little involved. Basically the logic of it is really nice. It's that if I know blue is unmatched and I know green is unmatched, I can use that fact to like string them together and get a really good candidate beat path from A to C. And then just by kind of chasing inequalities around the world, I was able to show that that concatenation is unmatched. And so I get what I want, the desired conclusion. Good, okay. Um, so let me conclude this little um, finishing note with a challenge problem. Just kind of a fun thing that I wondered about while I was preparing this lecture and that maybe you wondered about if you have the soul of a mathematician. Um, here's my challenge problem. If we were considering how many possible paths there are um, from one candidate to another candidate in a graph. Well, the only possibilities for how to get between those two is I can go directly or potentially if the arrows favor me I can potentially go indirectly. There's only two paths between a pair of candidates. Um, what happens if I go to four candidates and now I'm trying to get from A to B? How many ways are there to do that? Well, there's a few more. Now I can go direct. There's this way to go in a path of length two. There's this way to go in a path of length two. Or I could do various uh, three-part possibilities. I could go one, two, three. That's a way to go. And then finally, I guess I'm kind of out of colors. So let's pick a nice purple. Finally, I could go one, two, three. <laughs> OK. So if we're keeping track, what was that in all? That was two ways to connect of the path. And in this graph, there were one, two, three, four, five, five ways to connect for the path. This is when n equals three, and this is when n equals four. And so now, of course, you will have guessed my challenge problem. How, you know, when there are n candidates, How many ways um, can you connect? Some two of those candidates AB with a path. To make the problem a little bit structured, I'll say the path shouldn't be allowed to go through any vertex more than once. Okay, so I shouldn't be allowed to just sort of go back and forth a lot and call that a path. So each path must visit each candidate at most once. So I've got this pattern, two ways, five ways, what's next? Okay, um, I'll try to do this occasionally over the course of the semester is uh, for those of you who are either getting good at programming to answer questions like this, or if you just like the math enough to bash it out on a piece of paper, um, give you a little bit of a challenge problem. You can do that uh, and turn it in and it's extra credit. Um, and I think this one's kind of fun. So feel free to talk about it with me in office hours or give it a try on your own. And I will wrap up with more thoughts on BPATH in the next lecture. All right. So let's pick up with um, a little bit of payoff for our labors. Let's try to figure out what are the consequences of transitivity? What does it do for us? How does it help us think about what a beat path election is like? All right, well, first of all, there's kind of an IOU that, that I have to finish up from before that shows that no matter what the election was like, no matter what the preference schedule, we have to convince ourselves that beat path always has a winner. 
right? It would be kind of disastrous if this elimination idea is like everybody pulls out a gun and everybody shoots everybody and everybody ends up dead, right? <laughs> we need to guarantee ourselves that at least someone is left standing at the end so that there is at least one beat path winner. So that's what this proposition says. For every preference schedule, there's at least one candidate that nobody eliminates, i.e. the winner set has at least one member. That better be true, otherwise it doesn't count as a valid system of election. All right, so we're gonna see that we get this really cute argument that proves this, and we're gonna get this kind of painlessly as a consequence of transitivity. All right, how does that look? So, um, well, start with any candidate. Say the candidate that I start with is called A1. That's the name of the candidate, A sub one. Right, that's the name for A subscript one, first candidate A1. Um, all right, then if they're not eliminated, I'll be done because they're the candidate that's not eliminated. I just have to show that someone's not eliminated. If they're not eliminated by anyone, I'm done. I just have to find one winner. Okay, so suppose they are eliminated by someone. So here I'm gonna draw a little schematic of this. Here's my candidate A1. Suppose that they are eliminated by someone. You won't be surprised to hear that I'm gonna name that candidate A2. So suppose A2 eliminates A1. Okay, now I just apply the same reasoning. Does anyone eliminate A2? If they're not eliminated, I'm done. So I'll say either they survive or I continue. So if they don't survive, they were eliminated by someone, call them A3 who either survives or was eliminated by someone, call them A4, and so on. This is a little bit like, remember when we constructed the Smith set, we started with a strong candidate or any candidate really to construct a primitive DOM set. Start with the candidate and ask, who don't they beat, who don't they beat? So I'm doing the same thing. I'm asking who eliminated you, who eliminated you, who eliminated you? And I kind of get the sequence of eliminations. Well. If at some point this stops and I say A4 can't be eliminated, I'll be done. Um, and so otherwise I just keep continuing. But the thing is, what would happen if I kept on eliminating and kept on eliminating and then eventually got back to somewhere that I'd already been? Suppose that I found like a loop of eliminations. Well, I claim that this can't happen because if I had a loop of eliminations, that's a violation. So any loop, AKA cycle of eliminations violates transitivity, right? So transitivity was exactly the thing that said there are no cycles that if you, you know, if you, if you follow the logic of transitivity, you'd end up with A2 eliminating themselves, which is nonsense, that can't happen. You can't have a candidate eliminate themselves. So, so this can't happen. And that's how I know that this process has to terminate. It can't go on forever because there's only N candidates. So I'll just run out of candidates at some point and I can never go back to someone that I've already visited. This process terminates. And the last, the end point, right? So if I do this all the way, dot, 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 all the way, so I have A1, A2, A3, keep going all the way. Um, and maybe I'll call the last one AK. Wherever this ends, right? So this went like this. Wherever this ends, the fact that I can't go any further means that no one eliminates AK. So wherever this ends, that's my beat path winner. All 
and I'm done. Okay, so that one really was kind of painless. I wanted to show that somebody survives. And I said, well, start with anybody and keep tracing back who eliminated them and it has to stop somewhere. And that person isn't eliminated at all. So they survive. Okay, so um, I'll just conclude the discussion of beat path with a couple of more observations as a consequence of all this hard work trying to understand how how all of this goes. So one observation is that um, only strong candidates can win. That's kind of nice if you believe that the notion of strong is valuable, right? If you believe that that tracks with something valuable, then it's pretty good that it's Smith fair, only strong candidates can win. Um, why is that? Because, well, let's think about the strong candidates and the weak ones who are everybody else. The fact that all arrows point out of the Smith set, what does that mean? That means that if I'm in the Smith set, I have arrows pointing to everybody weak, but there's no way to get back into the Smith set. Once you, if you're following the arrows, once you leave the Smith set, you can never come back. So every strong candidate eliminates every weak one. So if I continue my metaphor from before where like the beat path system is like everybody takes out a gun and shoots at each other and tries to eliminate each other. This says all the weak candidates will drop dead instantly. They'll be eliminated by all the strong candidates right away. So that means that certainly no matter what happens within the Smith set, Certainly everyone outside the Smith set, you know, drops right away. Okay, so there's a related observation, which is that if um, a beat path leaves the Smith set, it can never come back. Just because there's no arrows back in. So that means to find beat paths between strong candidates, I can just completely ignore the weak ones. So the beat path is never gonna go to that part of the world. So the, the weak are made truly irrelevant in beat path. And again, if you believe that the strong and the weak is a valuable notion and really tells you something about who deserves to win, this all makes beat path sound very attractive because it's designed to make the weak candidate truly irrelevant to the outcome. Um, and so the last thing I'll just observe about this is this means in particular there are no weak spoilers. So this is a great example of uh, an election with no weak spoilers, which was kind of our attempt to rescue the, the hope of banishing spoilers. Right, so why is that? Because, well, there's a, there's a lot of ways to see that this is true, but here's one of them. Um, so remember when you smithify an election, when you just first restrict to the strong candidates and then do your thing, that's guaranteed to have no weak spoilers, right? Smithification produces a method with no weak spoilers. We showed that already. And so the observations one and two guarantee that beat path works like a smithification. It immediately eliminates all the weak candidates and then holds them completely irrelevant and only bases its considerations on the strong, right? And so in particular, the weak can't alter any outcomes among the ones who might have a chance of winning. And so the weak cannot spoil. Okay, so this, this, you know, this sounds, uh, I think, pretty attractive. Um, and it puts beat path in kind of a list of elections which 
for all the things we've considered, you seem to have really good properties. Um, it satisfies a whole lot of our reasonable fairness criteria. You can't have everything, but you can have a lot of things. Um, I, maybe I'll leave on one more good note for beat path and then uh, sound a note of, uh, you know, real world caution about all this optimism. So one more good note is um, beat path is unanimity fair. So like the accolades are piling up for B path. It passes a whole lot of tests. So remember what unanimity fair means. It means that if everybody likes X better than Y, Y can't win. Super easy to see why this is true for a beat path election. Why? Because, well, let me just draw a little. Here's how I like to draw um, unanimity. So X is ranked over Y on every ballot. And that could look lots of different ways. Um, but no matter what, every voter puts X above Y. That's the hypothesis of unanimity. All voters rank X greater than Y. And now I claim that Y can't win. So why is that? Because if I look at the pairwise comparison graph and I have candidate X and I have candidate Y, what happens head to head? Well, I had N voters, remember capital N is my number of voters. It's my standard notation for the number of voters. All of them like X better than Y. So that means X beats Y head to head with the biggest possible margin N. Right? Biggest possible margin. So could there possibly be a matching B path from Y back to X? No, because if there were to be a matching B path, every one of its links would have to have strength N. And that means Y would be unanimously preferred to someone unanimously preferred to someone unanimously preferred to X, right? That can't happen because Y is below X on every ballot. So they can't be above someone who's above someone who's above someone who's above X. And so you see transitivity is doing some work here. Namely this, so this can't be matched. So X eliminates Y. So Y is not a B path winner. Um, What's the transitivity logic here? It's that, notice this works because um, above on every ballot is itself transitive. You can't have someone who's unanimously preferred to someone who's unanimously preferred to someone who's unanimously, you can't have a cycle of unanimity. Cool, I think that was kind of neat. So we just showed that BPATH has all kinds of attractive properties relative to all the things that we've been thinking about. And I'll just, like I promised, I'll close with a little note of pessimism. <laughs> um, I care very much in the study of elections about how everything works in the real world. I care a lot about real world notions of democratic fairness, of good representation, of justice. Um, and so I care about practical reform. And if we think about BPATH, what if we tried to have an actual reform movement <laughs> that pushed for, I'm laughing because it's so hard to get any electoral change. Now think about trying to get people to adopt the BPATH method. It's actually pretty hard to figure out. Like think about all the things that we had to do to do it. We had to tabulate the votes, use that to draw a pairwise comparison graph, and then consider all of these many, many, many possible pairs of elimination, which to get any two to think about elimination, you have to look at all the paths from one to the other. We could do this by hand for small examples because there's only so many paths. But now think about doing this in a complicated election that has a lot of candidates. And I think you'll see that usually it's impractical to push for a reform that's hard to explain, right? And actually this is one of the obstacles to ranked choice voting in general. 
um, is that reforms can often get hung up on accessibility. I mean, you know, I think some of that is perfectly fair. Um, some of that is is just inertia, and some of it is perfectly fair. So one thing that's the BPATH doesn't have going for it is transparency. It's a little bit hard to explain how it works, and it's a little bit hard to explain why it has the good properties, as you can see, because I'm literally a professional, but it's taken me quite a few uh, of these little mini lectures to try to draw out for you why BPATH has these good properties. Um, the other thing that I'll say is that I've been selling you on this idea of weak and strong, but what I'm going to pivot to when we get to talking about civil rights and um, ideals of justice is that um, the notion of weak and strong isn't always going to be great when we see how it plays out in real world examples. So it's, it's kind of in this category of good on paper, um, but we'll get there. And so for today, that is a great place to stop. All right, so up next, we are going to talk about monotonicity. Let's see if I can get this working. Okay, there we go. Slight technical problems. So um, what's happening here with the topic uh, at hand? So we've been doing voting theory. And so monotonicity is one of the last few topics in our abstract voting theory uh, to set up the big kind of crescendo of the voting theory part of our class, which is the impossibility theorems. Okay, what are those? Those are the theorems like Arrow's famous theorem from 1951 that started the whole topic of social choice that say, all right, you can say what you want. You can axiomatize your properties of a good system that you desire, but you can't have them all. And in fact, you can't even have a few. <laughs> and so um, in a, it's a mathematical framework for, for forcing us to re-examine whether we care about edge cases, like things that are really weird or rare, like maybe Condorcet cycles are weird and rare, and should those actually rise up to the level of uh, making decisions for us about what the good systems of election are? That's kind of the question. Okay, so let's dive in. So this here, this is a recap from way at the beginning of the semester, describing what the topics are in voting theory. So. To recap from earlier, we heard about a voting system or system of election. We know about ballots and preference schedules. And then to that, in the last few weeks, we've added the concept of spoilers, talked about dominating sets as a way to get to a strong and weak stratification or classification of, of candidates. Um, and the point of that was to be able to say, maybe you can't totally eliminate spoilers, but you can have systems that have no weak spoilers. So that's like a prototype move of this voting theory is to say, well, maybe an axiom you would have desired is out of reach, but if you modify it a little bit, then it's attainable. In recent days, we've been talking about the beat path method. It's the last in this list of systems, although I'll add over here smithification, which is like a modification that you can do to any of these systems to give it slightly better properties from a math point of view, right? And the, the whole idea that went into to beat path was that by defining this notion of elimination that was transitive, we got rid of cycles and we came up with like a more consistent and paradox proof kind of system. That's nice, you know, I like to say that's great on the chalkboard, it's not clear how great it would be, you know, at the ballot box. So along the course of these you know, weeks in the last month and a half, we've been introduced to fairness criteria. So we started out with the idea of majority fair, interchangeable voters, i.e. anonymity, uh, doesn't no voter special. So that's the, that's the thing that rolls out dictatorship, interchangeable voters. Interchangeable candidates, that's a fairness criterion. You know, so it doesn't matter kind of what the candidates' names are or what order they, um, you know, signed up as candidates. None of that should matter. All that should matter is their votes. So that rolls out systems like sequential, where they're given an order and the order matters. Um, Condorcet fair. So this is a big one, 
big, big one. And in the wider space of voting theory, a lot of people think this is where all the action is. If you have a system that says Condorcet candidates will win, then in many people say in most real world elections, there is a Condorcet candidate. So that's all you need to know, um, right? Okay. Um, one can investigate whether that's true, but that is often claimed. Uh, unanimity fair, again, to remind you, that's where if everybody likes X better than Y, then Y shouldn't win. All right. Today, we're going to talk about monotonicity and strong monotonicity. Um, the idea of Pareto efficiency, and maybe a little bit about what it would mean to be strategy proof. And this will round out our discussion of definitions, systems, and criteria or properties that we apply to those. And we're going to bring it all together in this, I think, beautiful whole, which is um, the impossibility theorems. All right, so let's make some definitions. So what is monotonicity? Well, monotonicity and strong monotonicity, they both use the concept of changes or moves in a preference schedule. In other words, you imagine that there's some election, we're gonna do an example right here below. There's some election, it happens in a particular way, and then some voters change their preferences how should the outcome change? So monotonicity really is the idea that if um, your system is logical and fair, then certain kinds of changes should have certain kinds of effects, right? That's the idea. Okay, so to explore that, let's introduce two kinds of moves. So a favorable move, we'll talk about what that is, uh, and then a neutral move, we'll talk about what that is. All right, so a favorable move for a particular candidate X means that some voters move X up on their ballot, but no other relative preferences are affected. So like you, you sort of reach into the preference schedule, grab X on a ballot and just go tick, 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 tick and move X up. And favorable moves can happen if one or a few voters move X up. Neutral move for X is kind of what it sounds like. It means X stays in the same position on everybody's ballot, X does not budge. If they were second, they stay second. If they were third, they stay third. In a neutral move, what can happen is that the candidates above X on some ballots can be rearranged. The candidates below X on some ballots can be rearranged, but nobody hops over X. Nobody below goes above, nobody above goes below. That's a neutral move. All right, so let's see that in action. So what I'm gonna do here, I've written out the first example that Kristoff uses in the book on monotonicity. It's this particular three candidate election, right? So this is a fairly small election. It has N equals three candidates and big N equals how many voters? Let's see. So I see 17, 25, 35 voters. Okay, so I have 35 voters and three candidates in this particular election. And they voted this way. So 14 like A, then B, then C, and so on. And now I'm to imagine that there's been a change right, in the election. And what's happened in that change is that the new schedule looks like this. So let's take a moment and ask ourselves how the new schedule differs from the old. All right, so if you inspect this visually for a minute, you'll see that the eight voter and 10 voter columns are unchanged. So what's happened in this schedule is that the these two columns have kind of fused into this one, right? And so what does that mean? That means that in particular, these three voters here, I'll mark them red. These three voters here change their view, they change their ballots from BAC to ABC. And so they got merged with the other ABC column, right? So if I write down what the move was, I have three voters who used to be BAC changed to ABC. Right, and then again, they got added to the 14 because they had the same preferences as the, as the other 14. Okay, so what kind of move is this? So take a look, um, B moves down. So this is neither neutral nor favorable to B. But what about A's point of view? A moves up while the B and C, they stay in the same order. So the only thing that from A's point of view, the only change here is that A moves up and the other two stay right where they were in order. And so this is a move favorable to A. But you know you can also view the same move 
instead from C's point of view. And when you do, what do you see? Look at C. C stays in place and nobody jumps above or below. The other two just switch their order. So this can also be regard regarded as a move neutral to C. It's either one, it's from one point of view, it's one from the other point of view, it's the other. Okay, so this is a move favorable to A and a move neutral to C. Um, all right, um, by the way, I've also written down the, the graph here, the pairwise comparison graph. I like to do this before I conduct almost any kind of election, just because it's a little lookup sheet for the head to heads that I might need later. Let's check that I did it right. Um, C over A happens on 18 as opposed to 17 ballots. So that's a margin of one. A over B happens on 24 as opposed to 11 ballots. So that's a margin of 13. And B over C on um, 25 as opposed to 10. So it's a margin of 15. Okay, so this looks correct. It's always good to double check. All right, so now Christoph says, look at what happens in this election, uh, in this preference schedule, the results of this election. Um, if you tabulate a winner by runoff, um, and we're gonna do that before the change, after the change, and then ask ourselves, was this weird? You know, just like spoilers, a spoiler is defined as a situation in which someone's disqualification had a weird effect, basically. This is gonna be the same thing, this is gonna be um, monotonicity is all about situations where favorable moves had a weird effect. And strong monotonicity is where favorable or neutral moves had a weird effect. Okay. So who wins? So let's conduct a runoff election. Here's the original election right here. Okay, so the runoff says you take the top two first place vote getters and you compare them head to head. So I see here A has 14 and B has 11. So the runoff is A versus B head to head. I go to my little graph as a lookup table and I see that A beats B. So the runoff winner would be A. Cool. Now the move is favorable to A. You wouldn't expect that to hurt candidate A because the move is favorable. But what happens? Well, let's take a look. Who's in the runoff in this new election? Like who even makes it to the runoff? Now A and C have the most first place votes. So I have an A versus C runoff election. And again, uh, I can take a look at A versus C. I should do that fresh here. So A beats C on 17 ballots as opposed to C beats A on 18 ballots. Hey, look, C edges out A to win. Okay, this might seem funny. So what just happened is that a move favorable to candidate A took them from winner to loser. And that is not so monotonic. And so that's the definition. So the definition is monotonicity is the property that moves favorable to X shouldn't change X from winner to loser. And so what did we just prove we just showed that the runoff system is not monotonic because we created a scenario in which under the runoff system, a move favorable to A made A lose. Okay, um, not that hard once we've got that to say what strong monotonicity means. Strong monotonicity is that moves favorable or neutral to X shouldn't change X from winner to loser, right? That also sounds kind of reasonable, but we will see that this is essentially impossible. <laughs> right? Um, that's gonna be at the core of one of the interesting impossibility theorems that we're gonna prove. Okay, so, um, Good, so let me take a moment now to convince you that even though strong monotonicity is too much to ask, monotonicity is reasonable. There are plenty of systems out there that are monotonic and we just have to decide how much it matters to us. So let's try to prove that. So let's prove some uh, propositions. So I'll show that claim that plurality is monotonic. 
and then I'll also, next I'll show that the pairwise comparison system is monotonic. Okay, so let's see why this is. Why is plurality monotonic? Well, um, suppose that under a certain preference schedule, the winner by plurality is candidate X. What does that mean? That means that X has more first place votes than anyone else. Now I'm gonna make moves favorable to X. So that just means that some voters change their ballots by moving X up. Well, what does this do to the first place votes? Since X is being moved up, they can't lose any first place votes, but they could of course gain first place votes if they're moved up into first place, right? X can only gain first place votes. All right, well, what about other candidates? So, you know, Maybe X gains three, but someone else gains seven, right? And then that could make X lose. But actually, um, favorable moves don't budge the order of the other candidates. They merely move X up, and therefore everyone that X jumps over moves down. So other candidates can only move down. In particular, if X does gain first place vote, someone else must be losing them, right? So other candidates can only lose first place votes. And since plurality is judged by whoever has the most, X already had the most, now they only have more and others only have less. So certainly X still has the most first place votes. Um, and so the new winner by, by plurality is still X, end of proof. Okay, this is a really easy argument. Plurality is monotonic, why? It was just about counting first place votes. Favorable moves can only give you more and give other people fewer, right? And so that means if you had the most before, you still have the most after, so you still win. Once a plurality winner, still a plurality winner. That's monotonicity. It can't cost you a win when people move you up. <laughs> That's monotonicity. All right, well, let's, uh, let's do it for pairwise comparison. So to do that, let's do a little warm up. Let's go back up to this election up here that we were looking at before. And let me make some space over here. And let's think about what, how this preference schedule changed here when I made the change to the ballots. All right, well, what do I see? Well, um, quick thing to notice is that because favorable moves, so this is gonna be a favorable move to A, because a favorable move to A cannot affect the order of B and C on anybody's ballot. If B was over C, they stay over C. If B was under C, they stay under C, right? That means that the margin between B and C is unchanged. So I can just recopy this right, a move, so this is an observation, a move favorable to A only affects arrows to A. That's actually important, right? Um, so that means that the rest of the graph, in this case, that was just one edge, but it, with more candidates, it would be a more complicated graph. The rest of the graph is unchanged. The direction of the arrows is unchanged. The magnitudes of victory are unchanged. So all that can change is the arrows to A. How can they change? Well, A is moving up. So if they beat someone head to head before, they still beat them, but maybe by a greater margin. So arrows that are out may go up. So 
So the strength of an out arrow might go up because A is moving up. The in arrows might get weaker. You, you could lose to a candidate, but lose by less, of course. So the in arrows may decrease. And here, of course, I mean decrease in magnitude. And then the last thing that can happen is that maybe that you lost to someone before, but now you just flipped over them and a loss turns into a victory. In may flip to out. Okay, so these are, these are the only ways that a favorable move can change the graph. First, it only affects the favorable to A, it only affects the arrows to A. That out arrows can go up, in arrows can go down, or in can flip to out. All right, well, what actually happens here? So look at A versus C, and you'll see it's still 18 to 17. So actually, this one didn't change, and that's fine, that can happen. How about A versus B? Now A beats B on uh, 27 to 18. So this actually got stronger, this went up. And that's the thing that can happen. The out arrows can get stronger. So that 13, that victory by 13 went up to a victory by 19. Okay, so just, this is just like a helpful observation. It's gonna help us reason about favorable and neutral moves. Um, these are the effects that favorable moves can have. By the way, while I'm here, don't I'll make myself some more space to write this down. Um, what about neutral moves? What can neutral moves do? Let's think about that for a second. So neutral moves, remember, that means that your candidate stays in the same position on every ballot. Whoever was above stays above, whoever was below stays below, right? And so if you think about the effect that that has, that means that the relationships among the other candidates can change, right? Because you can scramble them around. But your relationship to the other candidates can't change because you stay above whoever you were above and below whoever you were below, right? So observation two, a move neutral to someone, in this case, we'll say C because this, this particular move is also neutral to C. Move neutral to C leaves C's arrows unchanged. Right, that's the second observation because it keeps everyone who is above above, everyone who's below below. So notice, since this particular move here was both favorable to A and neutral to C, now I can see why that one and 15, you know, these ones here stayed the same because the move was actually neutral to C. It couldn't have affected C's relationship to the other candidates. Okay, just a little observation. It's gonna come in handy. So let me copy that observation down here uh, as part of my proof. So this makes sense to use here because pairwise comparison is all about the graph. So let's say, you know, moves favorable to X can strengthen out arrows, weaken in arrows, or flip in arrows to point out. Those are the only things that favorable moves can do. All right, well now think about how a pairwise comparison election works. The pairwise comparison winner is the one with the most out arrows. So that's the greatest number of head-to-head -head wins, i.e. out arrows. Well, suppose that the initial winner of a pairwise comparison election was X. And now suppose we make a change favorable to X. What can happen? Well, their number of out arrows can only go up because this doesn't, this doesn't change the direction of the arrows. This doesn't change the direction of the arrows, but this does, and it can only increase the number of out arrows.
So we can think about this as their number of pairwise comparison points, right? That's counting the out arrows. Can only go up. All right, well, how about everybody else? Other candidates? Well, the relationship of other candidates with each other doesn't change, but they might go down by one because they might have beaten X before, but after the favorable move, they don't beat X anymore. So other candidates pairwise comparison points can stay the same or go down by one. All right, so if X used to have the most points and now their totals went up and everybody else's can only go down, they still have the most points. And that means that the winner prime, you know, we're thinking about these as the before and the after winner. The before winner was X, the after winner is still X. And that completes the proof of monotonicity. So again, what is monotonicity? A move favorable to X can't make them lose. We showed that if X was the winner, and actually we showed something stronger than what I wrote. So I'll tell you in a second what that is. But if X was the winner and there were favorable moves, they're still the winner. I should say incidentally, we actually proved something stronger, which is, I can just strengthen this a little bit. I didn't have to assume that X was the only winner. I could just suppose they're in the pairwise comparison set before, the, the winner set before, right? Maybe they were in there and so was candidate Q. I don't care about that. The point is, if they had the most or possibly tied for the most before, their total can only go up and everybody else's can only go down, then, um, so X still has at least a tie <laughs> for the most points. So that means X is in the winner set prime. So before I had written that as though they were the solo winner, but actually the argument goes through whether they were the solo winner or whether they were tied. Cool. All right. Um, so monotonicity is not a crazy thing to ask. We have systems that have this property um, and um, we have systems that don't like runoff. Okay, the last thing I'll do for this mini lecture is to just go back and do what I like to do when it comes to math at all levels. I like to do this for, for, for teaching uh, introductory courses all the way up to research. Um, when you look at an argument that proves something in this case, it was an example of an election that proved non-monotonicity. It is so valuable to go back and look at it again and say, what really happened here? What was the feature that made this work the way that it did? So let's, let's think about that for this particular election. How can it be, like, is runoff just totally broken? How can it be that moves favorable to A hurt A? Well, basically the reason is the way runoff works is by getting the top two first place vote getters and comparing them head to head. So the, the failure of monotonicity happened by changing who, the, who those first place vote getters even were. The point is in this particular election, we had A win before and C win after, but that's because they faced a different opponent in runoff. So the move favorable to A, it didn't hurt them in the sense that it didn't take them out of the running they were still in the runoff, but it changed who their opponent was in the runoff, right? And sometimes you'll, you'll win if you face one person, but you'll lose if you face a different person. So the, the move favorable to A had the kind of funny effect because what it did here is it stole first place votes from B. The move favorable to A, moving up A, stole some first place votes from B. So it knocked them out of contention and it forced A to face C instead of B in the runoff and then they lost. That's the point, right? Just worth doing when you see an argument like this going, um, you know, especially because on your homework, uh, you know, the question was to try to come up with an example like this. So that forces you to sit down and think about what can produce funny effects. And in this case, with runoff, with elimination, with a lot of our systems, what can produce funny effects is like changing who faces whom. A little bit like in a sequential election, a lot of the funny outcomes for a sequential election happen because of the order in which people face each other. Just a little observation. All right, so I'll stop there for now. Okay, 
so this is the mini lecture that I'm calling run up to impossibility. And it's just sort of getting all the last little ingredients in place that we need to understand some of the sophisticated results. Oh, and the other thing I should do quickly is turn off the chimes in case anybody joins. Done. Okay, so the last major concept that I introduced was monotonicity and strong monotonicity. And let me just remind you what those are and ask you if you have any questions about that. So monotonicity is about favorable moves. And this uh, strong monotonicity is about favorable or neutral moves. And then the, the idea of the properties is that those things can't change you from a winner to a loser, can't make you lose. <laughs> right, so a system's monotonic if favorable moves can't make you into a loser, <laughs> right? They can't take your victory away. And it's called strongly monotonic if favorable or neutral moves can't take your victory away. All right, so there's a couple more little ingredients I wanna make sure we have. One of them is called Pareto efficiency. So this was explained on the worksheet, but let me tell you slash remind you <laughs> what it is. Pareto efficiency is the totally necessary sounding property that if everybody agrees on their first place choice, that should be the winner. If there's complete agreement, First choice. That should be one. So even dictatorship has this. Most systems have this. The only one that we've talked about or named so far that doesn't have this is the ridiculous system called secondality, right? <laughs> um, so this I think we would call like a bedrock requirement. <laughs> Like we wouldn't take a system seriously that didn't have this property. I would say, you know, your mileage may vary. All right, um, and there's one more thing I wanna introduce, which is the idea of a tiebreaker. So, so far we've been a little loosey goosey about how we've dealt with tiebreakers. If more than one candidate, if you're in plurality and more than one candidate has the most first place votes, you just say they all win, right? We haven't really been super demanding about this, but for the impossibility theorems, I'm really gonna want tiebreakers because I want everything to have a well-defined winner because um, there are nice theorems about that. So let's, let's use for the next two weeks, a tiebreaker convention. Convention just means it's something we all agree on in advance. It's a little arbitrary, but it's agreed in advance, right? And so Kristoff in the book usually uses alphabetical tiebreakers. That's fine with me, but what I wanna do is more like what's on the, the worksheet. You pick any sequence and call that your tiebreaker sequence, right? I don't care what it is. It could be alphabetical or something else. So um, what I'll do is fix a sequence of candidates before we look at the preference schedule. And then the way I use that list of candidates is if I ever have a tie situation, whoever comes earlier in the sequence wins. It's just a, it's like a coin flip done in advance in a sense. <laughs> Okay, so far so good? Cool, all right, so let's prove a little lemma. Um, this is the, the sort of warm up to the theorem. Because I mean, here's the big challenge facing us. The impossibility theorems say of all the infinitely many possible systems that have been dreamed up or could ever be dreamed up, the following is true. And if we're in this for math appreciation, we should be asking ourselves, how can you prove something for systems that haven't even been invented yet, right? Sometimes if you wanna prove something for all of whatever, you'll find a common property that they have. But how could we find a common property for all systems that haven't even been invented yet? That's the challenge, right? And so the way we're gonna approach that is the impossibility theorems all have some hypotheses. Like for instance, 
every strongly monotonic single winner Pareto efficient system. So we're gonna use those properties for our leverage, right? Okay, so, so then the last little lemma, the sort of small statement that I need as an ingredient, I'll call this a proposition. Um, I'd like to use the fact that Pareto efficient plus strongly monotonic implies, you know, I should really have better handwriting. Okay, I'm not going to go back, but I'll try to write better. <laughs> implies uh, unanimity fair. So this is just gonna be an example of how you can show that some combinations of properties ensure other properties. But also I wanna use this in the proof. I wanna be able to use, cause I'm, I'm gonna be assuming Pareto efficiency and strong monotonicity. If you believe me that this proposition is true, I'll also be able to use the unanimity condition cause it comes for free. That's what this is saying. Okay, cool, let's prove it. And then I wanna get you guys talking cause that's why we're all here. So first stop me if there's anything you're wondering about but then we'll work through some examples after this. So what's the proof? Well, what do I have to show? So I, I have a system, I have a proof, I have a mystery system. And all I know is that it has those two properties, Pareto efficient and strongly monotonic. Um, Okay, I must show that if every voter, well, what's unanimity fair? Can actually one of you remind me? Remember the unanimity criterion? Everyone agrees on who the first, if everyone puts the, uh, a candidate on the first place, then uh, they the win. Should win. That's called Pareto efficiency. So but you're you're right that that's a flavor of unanimity. The only candidate that they want is that what it is? Um, yeah. So so the, you're right. So unanimous in English means everybody agrees, right? And so it sounds an awful lot like Pareto efficiency, but unanimity is a little bit stronger. Unanimity isn't just about first place votes. If you think back a couple weeks, unanimity is if everybody ranks X above Y, then Y shouldn't win. So oh, right. Right, so Ira, in particular, you're right that it sounds a lot like Pareto efficiency and that's what I wanna prove right here. That's this proof that Pareto efficiency implies this stronger sounding unanimity condition. So I must show that if all voters rank X over Y. And you know, as you say, ranking X first is a special case of that. <laughs> but this, is, this applies even if everybody ranks X third and ranks Y fourth, right? All right, I must show that if all voters rank X over Y, then Y can't win. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is this totally standard, powerful, powerful technique in math. I wanna prove that something's true. So I'll show that if it wasn't true, we'd, we'd have a contradiction. We'd have some two things that couldn't be compatible. All right, so um, suppose all rank X over Y, but, you know, usually, by the way, I've been writing the winner set equals whatever. But now that we've decided amongst ourselves that we're going to have a tiebreaker, I can just write the winner equals. I don't have to write it as a set anymore because it's just one, one person now. So suppose that all rank X over Y, but Y wins. This would be a violation of unanimity. I want to show that this is impossible. You all with me on that? Is that good? Okay, great. All right, so let me draw myself a little. This is how I like to draw everybody liking x over y. I just, this is like just a cartoon form of that so that I can keep track in my mind of the fact that x is over y on every ballot. They might be in first place. They might be in next to last and last place. They could occur anywhere as long as x is always over y. Now by, by my hypothesis, who wins this election, this preference schedule, who wins? Raquel Why? Owens. Why? Yeah, because I've supposed that, <laughs> right? Good. Okay, so Sloan, can you help me use strong monotonicity and Pareto efficiency? 
So to use Pareto efficiency, I better have the same person in first place on every ballot, right? Who do you want to move to first place on every ballot? X. Great choice. Let's try X. If yeah. that didn't work, we'd try Y. You know, we're just trying things. Mm -hmm. I want you to kind of have the attitude to prove like, I'm going to try it, see if it works. Okay. So let's do exactly what Sloan suggested and just move X to the top of each of these ballots that I've drawn here. And I won't touch anybody else. <laughs> All I'll do, let's just try to make these look similar. All I'll do is move X up and leave everybody else in place. Okay, this is, how do I describe, Karina, how do I describe this collection of moves. Is it neutral to someone? Is it favorable to someone? What do you think? Would it be favorable to X? Looks favorable to X, yep, because X moved up <laughs> and nothing else changed. So this is favorable to X. Ali, what else do you see? Any other way to describe it's, it? It's neutral to Y. It's neutral to Y. The reason it's neutral to Y is that not only did Y stay put, but nobody jumped over Y because X was over Y before and they just moved up. So nobody jumped over Y, that's the definition of neutral. You guys happy with this? Great, okay. So now who's the winner and why? I just, I'm, I just have a question because we have a mystery system. So yes. then it depends on the system, right? Because if it was sort a of. Yeah, you're right, you're right. But I know only two things about my system. Strong monotonicity, oh, right. and burrito efficiency. Oh, right. <laughs> and it, X would need to win. Yes, you got it, exactly. So this is by burrito efficiency. Do you guys see that? Cool, and now we have a contradiction. I had a move neutral to Y that turned Y into a loser. That's a contradiction to strong monotonicity. I have a quick question. Yeah, please. If we're going um, with a system that's Pareto efficient and strongly monoton monotonic, then how would why have one in the beginning or was that not oh, okay the question one? let's i mean look at it right let's look at this initial thing how would y have won in the beginning well i can't be sure that y would win in the beginning but i can't be sure that they wouldn't why winning this boxed election doesn't contradict Pareto efficiency and in itself it doesn't contradict strong monotonicity so i can't be sure and now i'm like well suppose the winner was y well, now moves neutral to Y, make X win, couldn't have happened. Do you get the logic? Yeah. Okay. Thank awesome. you. Yeah, of course. That's, that's what we're here for. <laughs> so we, we mathematicians are so addicted to this way of proving things. We call this proof by contradiction. You want to show something. Suppose it's not true. You get a contradiction. So we like to, at the end of that, put down a, like a little triumphant signal. You might have noticed in my lectures, when I finish a proof, I often put a little box. That means I'm done. When you're done with a proof by contradiction, you often put a little lightning bolt, boom, <laughs> right? Well, you thought that was possible, but boom, it's not possible. Okay, and so this is, this has been a important style of proof for like literally thousands of years um, called proof by contradiction. Okay, so I'm done. Um, and now you get a little tiny taste of the, the sort of power of proving things by properties. Right? I had a mystery system, but I was still able to do logic to it only by using its properties. And that's going to be the exact same style of the impossibility theorems. Okay. All right. Questions about that? So now we, we have a little extra tool in our toolkit. Whenever a system is supposed to be Pareto efficient and strongly monotonic, I can now use the unanimity criterion for free. It comes for free. <laughs> Great. Okay. So let me just mention one more um, concept. I won't strictly need it for the impossibility theorem that I'll prove next, but it's good to, to have heard and other impossibility theorems reference it. And that's called strategy proof. Let me just sort of tell you what that is. 
So strategy proof systems. Ask a quick question. Yeah, please. Um, sure. So then did we prove that like from the proposition mm -hmm. that Pareto efficiency implies unanimity fair, but strongly monotonic does not imply it? Oh, okay, good. No, not exactly. What we proved is that whenever I know both of these together, then I can conclude unanimity. Okay. Neither one of them implies it on their own, but together they do. Okay. That's important. So glad, glad you asked. <laughs> okay. If we were, by the way, if we were going to try to represent that with like a Venn diagram, so maybe like Pareto efficient looks like this and maybe strongly monotonic looks like this. What we just showed is that whenever you're both, so whenever you're both Pareto efficient and strongly monotonic, then you are um, unanimity fair. So in other words, the, the unanimity fair bubble contains the overlap between PE and SM. I don't know if that's helpful or not. I just want to say like, you know, we talked about so many different criteria and they all have different complicated logical relationships. But this just means that if you're in the overlap, if you're PE plus SM, I can conclude you're also UF. Okay. I just like pictures wherever possible. All right, so last little mini concept here is what does it mean to be a strategy proof system? So I bring this up just because some of our conditions sound like they're reasonable to demand and some sound like they're unreasonable. Some of our conditions just give a name to something that bothers people about elections, like spoilers. That makes people uncomfortable. They don't like it. So we come up with a name and a definition and then we study what creates spoilers. So here's another thing that bothers people about elections, <laughs> uh, strategic voting. So that is kind of what it sounds like. Strategic voting is where you have a certain set of actual preferences, but you vote differently from your actual preferences in order to get a better outcome. Right? So um, what is a strategic voting? Just write that down. Strategic voting is a circumstance where uh, voters' true preferences lead to a certain outcome. But if they vote differently, they can achieve an outcome they prefer. <laughs> so just let's just think about this for a second and then we'll stop here. Um, and I can show you, yeah, we can, we can do an example later, but this is a good place to stop. So can you think of, think about real world elections? When might you have a particular preference, but go to the ballot box and don't exactly vote for your favorite candidate? When might you do that? Allie, yeah. Um, in a presidential election, mm -hmm. let's say your preference wasn't one of the uh, like majority leading uh, yeah. candidates. So like the Democrat or Republican, let's say another party then you might know that if you vote for them, you for them, that probably won't win. So then you would vote for maybe like your second choice you'd prefer over the other. Absolutely, that is the prototype situation, at least in US voting, is you might really prefer a third party candidate, but you're afraid that it's so close between the two major party candidates that if you vote your heart, if you vote for that third party candidate, you'll get the, the like worst choice will get into office. And so you vote strategically. You vote for someone who's mm, kind of maybe acceptable to you in order to prevent the worst thing from happening. Like Bernie supporters voting yeah. for Biden. Like Bernie supporters, right? This is the whole phrase, hold your nose and vote for so-and-so, right? <laughs> strategic voting. So we feel a voting system shouldn't require you to be dishonest. People who are very passionate about this issue call this dishonesty rather than strategic voting, right? As voting for not the true preference. Um, and what we'll see is that this turns out to be impossible. There, aren't, there are not reasonable strategy proof systems. They don't exist. Okay, that's a good place to stop. So I'm gonna pause the recording. Okay, so let's pick back up where we left off. So, 
So the next thing, so let's take a look back at what we just did over here. We did this kind of, I think, clever thing where we took a mystery system that had some properties. We started with a supposition about the winner and then like change it and change it and change it and kept track of who the new winner was in order to make a conclusion. All right, I wanna do something similar um, because remember what the impossibility theorem say, which is what I'm about to prove one of. There's a whole bunch of these, but they basically say any uh, system with nice properties, and you can vary what the nice properties are, <laughs> must be dictatorship. You know, surprise, <laughs> right? So since we don't want to live in a dictatorship, it must be that we can't have all those nice properties. That's why they're called impossibility theorems. So that's the prototype. Um, okay, and so to prove any theorem in this family of theorems, what I need to do is take a mystery system and show that it's dictatorship, right? That's, what I, that's gonna be the proof technique. I'm gonna take a mystery system, I'm gonna poke at it a little bit, and behold, I will reveal that it was dictatorship, even though you didn't know that at the outset. So as a warm up to doing that, let's try to look at what you might do if you wanted to see a dictatorship in action. So I'm gonna give you a quick example. Okay, so let's suppose we had some system, I'm gonna call my candidates PMNO. And suppose I have five voters just for the sake of argument and all five voters, right now what I'm giving you is a detailed preference schedule. Usually I give you like a summarized or condensed preference schedule where all the voters with the same ballot are condensed and I just put a times five to tell you there were five of them. But this time, because I wanna pick the, I wanna find a dictator. So I'm gonna have a different column for every single voter. I'm gonna treat the voters separately rather than combining them. So these are voters number one, two, three, four, and five. Okay. So let's just talk this through. Suppose I have a suspicion that this is, system is a dictatorship and what I have is like an oracle. It's a mystery system. It doesn't tell me it's internal logic, but if I give it a preference schedule, it tells me who the winner was. Suppose I can just ask who would win this? Who would win this? Who would win this? All right, well, certainly for this particular preference schedule that I have here, if I fed this one to any Pareto efficient system, it has to tell me that the winner is who? P. P, right? First choice, consensus first choice, okay? So, um, okay, suppose I have a Pareto efficient mystery system. All right, so I have the winner is P. Now, imagine that you have that oracle. That's what I was just describing. In computer science, we call that an oracle. It's, I don't know how it works, but I can ask it questions and it gives me back the answer. <laughs> Okay, so suppose I have a voting oracle here and I can like tweak this and see how the winner changes. So Karina, what might you do if you had access to the voting oracle? How might you tweak this if you're looking to see whether there's a dictator? I'm not sure, would I just move around some of the candidates? Absolutely, yes. You'd, you'd start moving around some of the candidates. Now tell me what a dictator is so that we can go looking for one. <laughs> What's a dictator? Someone that everyone votes for, right? You, yeah, no. Oh no, a dictator is a voter whose preferences are the only things that matters. That's what a dictatorship is. Yeah, so actually that's, that's a good, good point. Let's rewind and remember what that means, right? Dictatorship is a voter, one of these voters, one, two, three, four, or five, I don't know who, <laughs> <laughs> um, and their opinions matter and nobody else's opinions matter. So Karina, now that, that we have that in mind, mm -hmm. what, give me an example of a change to test whether voter number one is a dictator. Um, sorry, my sister's sneezing. <laughs> no problem. Um, I don't know. What? Well, so a, a dictator, remember, only their opinions matter. And in fact, only their first choice wins. So would you just, could you move one of the candidates up or down? Totally. 
Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So one way to test whether number one is a dictator is I could try a modified preference schedule. I could put like O on top, say. I could do OPMN in the first column while leaving the others the same. See who wins. If the winner's still P, that's not a dictator. So I like to think of this as like a metal detector for the dictator. You go wave it around, you go beep, 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 beep. And then so sometimes you get to a certain voter and it goes beep, 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 beep. <laughs> and then you have a, someone who might be a dictator. So if, if this changed the winner, then candidate one might be the dictator. If this changed the winner to O. And then if I have this Oracle and I can ask it lots of questions, well then if, if, if now the winner is O, that means this candidate uh, voter one might be a dictator. Now I can switch it again and put N on top and see if N wins. And if so, that, that raises my confidence that this is the dictator. Making sense? But something else to notice is if the answer changed at all based on what I do to column one, right? Then nobody else could be the dictator. Because remember, only the dictator's opinions matter. So do you see what I mean? This is gonna be our dictator detection system is we're gonna make changes in individual columns. And if the winner is really sensitive to the changes in one column, then I might've found my dictator. Great, we buy that? Okay, cool, cool. So that was the last thing. Actually, let's, um, let's, okay, let's dive into the proof. I think that's enough warm up. So let's dive into the proof. So I'm gonna switch over here and let's, oops, not here, but here. Okay. So this is like a strategy sheet that I've got and it's complicated, but bear with me. <laughs> Here's what we're gonna do. So we're starting here with the exact same preference schedule I just showed you. I have five voters and they all rank P over M over N over O. And then I'm gonna assume that the system is Pareto efficient and assume that it's strongly monotonic. I know who the winner is here. Allie, who's the winner? E. Yes, and just so that I can keep track of this later, tell me how you know. Um, because he is ranked first for all of them and according right. to Pareto efficiency, Good. that has to win them. So I'm just gonna write down that it's by Pareto efficiency that I know that the winner is P. And then we're gonna track this all the way down. By the time we get to ballot nine, right? Which is gonna take us a little while to get to. By the time we get to ballot nine, P is last on everybody's ballot, but first on number four's ballot. If P still wins at that point, I think I've found my dictator. <laughs> you guys with me? Okay, that's the point. That's what we're gonna do. Great. All right, so let's do it. So we're gonna go step-by-step step, one at a time and we're gonna try and figure out who wins. All right, so first thing, um, I switch from, from preference schedule one to preference schedule two, what changed? Take a look at those ballots, tell me what changed. And then I'm gonna identify it as a move. Either it's a move favorable to one candidate or another, or I can just be sure who wins. What changed? Oh. The rank of O for uh, voter one changed. Yeah. Right. Favorably, o, o went up. So the only things that changed were these guys. They juggled around a little bit. Okay. But I still know who wins. Who's the winner? Karina, say it again. Oh, you're on mute. It's still P. Still P and still for the same reason, Pareto efficiency. Okay. Now let's go to the next from two to three. So take a look at the change. I have a good question. Yeah, please. Um, was the change in two done in the hopes to find the dictator? Because then I'm, I guess I'm just confused. What was yeah. the point of changing if the first place vote wasn't changed? Yeah, so what was the point? So if you, if you look ahead at all these different steps that we're gonna take, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab O who used to be last on everybody's ballot. And I'm gonna move O into first place column by column one at a time. And I'm gonna see when the winner changes. And right at that moment that the winner changes, I'm gonna go, aha, I think I found my dictator. That's the point. Okay. Cool. Glad you asked. It's yeah. really good to have the strategy in mind. Sometimes math proofs just have the spirit of like, believe me, step after step, 
but I've tried to break this down so that you can see where we're going. So where we're going is dictator detection by taking that last place O and gradually moving them up into first, one column at a time until something changes. That's our goal. Moon, can I ask a question? Okay. Mm -hmm. Karina, go ahead. Do you do, are you do, just doing it gradually so we can be able to see specifically, or could you just like skip those steps if you really wanted to? And well, like move. You could move summarize move. the steps all at once, but I'm trying to break it down for you slowly. But you'll see, this is still, like I said, um, part of the reason I'm glad that you've joined me today is like, this is one of the hardest proofs we're going to do. And so it really is a little subtle. So I am trying to break it down just yeah. enough to be understandable. That's the whole thing. <laughs> so, you know, tell me how I do. <laughs> Okay, so now the winner started out P, the winner is still P at step two. Let's look at step three. So first tell me what changed. And then maybe we don't know exactly who the winner is, but we can be sure of who it's not, right? So what, what changed from step two to step three? Oh, it was just moved up higher in the preference for voter right. number one. Exactly, so these two switched. That's all that changed. You guys see that? Okay, cool. So who's the winner? Well, I don't know. I don't have Pareto efficiency anymore. So I can't be sure P wins, right? And, um, you know, it could be a crazy system. It's a mystery system, I don't know. So the fact that O and P are the only ones with first place votes doesn't necessarily guarantee that those are the only possible winners. So I feel like I'm out at C. So what I wanna make a little observation that lets me at least know who doesn't win. So I know who the winners, I'm, I wanna see, it is true that the winner here has to be either O or P, but I wanna convince you of that and not just say that it's likely. Okay, so how do I convince you of that? So to convince you of that, I wanna use the fact that we proved a moment ago, which is that if you're Pareto efficient and strongly monotonic, you're unanimity fair. So if there's any unanimous preference, Whoever's dispreferred can't be a winner, right? So do you see any unanimous, within this preference schedule, do you see anyone who's unanimously preferred to someone else? Ira? To M. Who is preferred to M? Um, P is preferred to M and then P is preferred same to with M. M. And N unanimously. You guys agree? Okay, so that means M, the winner can't be M or N by unanimity fairness. So I don't know who wins, but the winner is either O or P. It's one or the other because it can't be M or N and there's a single winner. Okay, great. Cool, so notice all I did now in effect was I grabbed O from the last place position down here and I moved O up first to second and then to first and everybody else stayed in order. And in so doing, I kept a guarantee that the winner can't be M or N. So notice I can do this same thing now in the second column, now that I've done it in the first, I can do it in the third column, I can do it in the fourth column, I can go through and do this column by column, raise O to the top. And all the while, I'm gonna keep P unanimously preferred to M and N. So M and N can't be the winner right? So the winner has to be O or P. Well, at the beginning, the winner is P. At the end, after I've moved O up in every single column, the winner has to be O by Pareto efficiency. By the time we get to the end, the winner is O. So there must be some step. So this I, here, I, there must be some step where it changes from P to O. If it starts out P and it ends up O, it has to change at one point, okay? So what I'm doing next is I'm saying, okay, suppose that that change happened here. It has to happen somewhere. So for the sake of illustration, suppose it happened between columns three and four. You guys with me? Okay, so then the winner over here would be P and the winner over here would be O. And this is true like by construction. Like this is, I stop when winner flips from P to O. So that's why before is P and after is O because that's when I chose to, to pause and, and investigate. Okay, so you guys with me? Question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, why is winner P in the fourth one? Well, just because it had to be P at the beginning and O at the end. So there has to be a place where it changes from P to O. And I'm supposing it's this third column. It could be, Ira, that that change happened right away. Maybe that change happened between column one and two. But then I would just draw the dividing line between one and two and do the argument there. So it had to flip somewhere. And here I'm saying, for the sake of this illustration, suppose it flipped between column three and four. Might have been between one and two, between two and And three. I'm confused is because uh, the first place, like in terms of plurality, O has most first place words. And yeah, so- Yeah, but nobody said this was plurality. It's a mystery system. Right. Okay, so I should, shouldn't should think of it as first place votes. No, wins. it might have absolutely nothing to do with first place votes, right? That's the power of arguing about a mystery system. Is, you know, I have to use, I have to use very abstract reasoning because I don't know if it has anything to do with first place votes or border points or whatever. It could be an unknown system. Yeah, the reason I got confused is because we still, even if it's not plurality, we still mm -hmm. place some value into moving upward. Uh, but that comes from strong monotonicity. Right. We, we presume strong monotonicity, yes. That but, doesn't... but we still consider it a favorable move. We haven't done any of those yet, or at least we haven't done any reasoning from favorable moves yet. But no, I'm just saying in general, Yeah. the whole in concept general, of monoton monotonicity is yep. based on the idea that moving up is favorable. Yeah, and the idea is that moving up can't make you lose. Nobody said moving up makes you win. It just can't make you lose. That's monotonicity. Right. Okay. okay. Good. Good, good, good. All right. So, so I'm doing this process column by column. I'm moving O into first place. At some point, the winner changes. Suppose that point happened here for the sake of concreteness. Suppose it happened here. It has to happen somewhere. Okay. So now what? Now my suspicion, but right away, who might be the dictator? Al, you haven't heard from you in a while. If the change happened between column three and column four, who might be the dictator? Uh, would it be number four? It would, because that's the one who, when I changed their first place vote, the answer changed. So now I have a guess. So the guess is that number four is the dictator. Actually, when I wrote this problem, I said, if we're showing that the unknown voting system is dictatorship, what is the value of K? In other words, who's my suspected dictator? And the answer is K equals four. My suspected dictator is the fourth voter. That's my guess. Let's see if it works out. Okay, buckle up. We have a couple more steps to go. <laughs> okay, so next, um, what happens between five and six? Take a look at five versus six and tell me what's different. And we're going to describe that as neutral or favorable. And then we're going to conclude who the winner is. M and N move above P. Can't hear you. Say it again. M and N move. M and N above move P. above P, right? So I can't call it neutral to M, N, or P. But how about O? Does O move? No. And everybody who used to be below O stays below. Everybody who used to be above O stays above. So this move is neutral to O. Okay. And so who wins? Number six. Say it again. O wins. O right. wins. What's the reason? Well, if O is winning and if we, as we are assuming or maybe guessing that maybe four is the dictator and if O is winning in the previous schedule, then any change below that point. Ah, yeah, but I wanna use this neutral move, right? I'm, I'm trying to prove this as a dictatorship so I shouldn't assume what I'm trying to prove. Oh, strong. Right? There you go. <laughs> strong monotonicity because Strong monotonicity says a neutral move can't make you into a loser. And so we have a neutral move, O used to win, so they must still win by strong monotonicity. So what you just said is really important though, that exchange, let's notice. Don't assume what you're trying to prove. 
I think four is the dictator, but now I better prove it. I can't just assume it. I can use Pareto efficiency, unanimity, fairness, and strong monotonicity. Those are my like givens. I can use those. Okay, so far so good. All right, so now let's, I have these, I have these arrows now going this way, this arrow, and this arrow. And I want to, the reason I put those arrows there is so that we can describe, let me change my color here, change to gray. Um, I want to describe each of those moves. So look at, look at schedule seven compared to four, look at schedule seven compared to six, and describe it as neutral or favorable in both cases so that we can figure out who the winner is for schedule seven. All right, uh, how about Raquel, you do four to seven. Um, so from four to seven um, in voters one, two, three, one, two, three, and five, M and N had a favorable move up. M and N had a favorable move, let's see. Okay, so you're saying it's a combination of moves favorable to those. Do you see it overall as being either favorable or neutral to any particular one? Oh, um, neutral to O. Right, I agree. Okay. How about this other arrow? Um, Karina, you want to do this other arrow from six to seven? What do you see? Is it neutral to someone? Is it favorable to someone? Mm. It seems like the only thing that changed is the O in number four, right? That it moved up. Mm, I agree. Do you switch to places? Yeah, that's the only change. So that's the only change I see. Would it still be neutral to O then? Uh, it's not neutral to O because O moved. Mm. If it's neutral to you, you have to stay in place. Mm -hmm. But it looks like M and N didn't move, yeah. right? Okay. And everyone who was above them stayed above them. Everyone who's below them stayed below them. So this looks to me like it's neutral to M and N. Okay, so let's think about this for a second and try to decide who the winner might be. Who might the winner be? Depend on the system, because I'm 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 a little confused about mm -hmm. how. Well, I want to if 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 uh, four is not a dictator, then mm -hmm. right. We could, we don't want to assume four is a dictator, but we do want to say strong monotonicity means neutral and favorable moves can't turn someone from a winner into a loser. So actually, it would be helpful since the winner is O here. It would be helpful if we could characterize this as a move relative to O so that we could um, figure out. Um, uh, let, me, let me sort of think about this for a quick second. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Would that just mean that we don't know the exact winner. We know it could be O or P just because it couldn't be M and N since those are neutral. Yeah, but neutral moves just can't move you from a winner to a loser, right? Um, it can't move you from a loser to, it can move you to a loser to a winner though. Yeah, that's not part of the definition, right? That's not part of the definition. So let's see Got it. Okay. what I want to do. I would like to conclude that the winner here, I want to conclude that the winner here is P. Let's see, actually, so maybe the ones that I wrote down aren't the best way to do it. Let's all brainstorm together how to get this. How can I see that the winner is P? So let's just pause and stare at it together like good mathematicians and try to see why can't the winner be O? Why can't the winner be M or N? Let's see.
the winner can be M or N if the winner changes after number four's first place vote changes in four and five, right? Because winner goes from being P to O in four and five. So it has something to do with number four's choice. Yeah, right? but what we have to use right now is just the properties. So the only things we can use are Pareto efficiency. That's not gonna help us. Unanimity, that might help us and strong monotonicity. We can only use those three things. Those are the only givens. So let's actually all take a minute because I have to like get myself unconfused about this. Let's all take a minute and try to see why the winner can't be. So I wanna show that the winner here can't be M, N, or O. So let's stare at it and try to come up with some logic for that. M, N, or O. Oh, I got it. <laughs> All right, math in action, man. All right, so notice that if a move is neutral to M and N in one direction, it's also neutral in the other. So this is actually neutral to M and N in both directions. Stop and look at it and tell me if you agree. Okay, so suppose the winner was M or N here in number seven, but then by doing a neutral move back to six, it would make them lose. Neutral moves can't make you lose. <laughs> okay, so that's, so the winner isn't MN because strong monotonicity means neutral move from seven to six would make them lose. Right, that's the kind of sneaky thing here is that neutral moves in one direction are still neutral in the other direction. That's not true for favorable moves. A favorable move backwards is not favorable anymore, but a neutral move goes both ways. Okay, so do you guys agree that the winner can't be M or N? Cool. So let's try to do the exact same thing here because you already told me this is neutral to O, right? But that means it's neutral to O in both directions. So the, suppose the winner was O down here. If the winner was O down here, the neutral move up to four would make them lose. And that's a contradiction. So the winner can't be O because SM means neutral move from seven to four would make them lose. Okay. Ira, are you with that? I feel like I lost you somewhere. Okay, we can actually I'm just really recap. not sure where. Well, we can recap this in a little tiny capsule. You don't need the whole proof for this part. So all I want you to grant me is that suppose that the winner of this schedule here is P. And suppose that the winner of this schedule here is O. Okay. Now here's a brand new schedule. It's neutrally related by, with respect to M and N. From M and N's point of view, it's neutrally related to six. From O's point of view, it's neutrally related to four, right? Good, so all we need to know is, suppose O1 here in schedule seven, suppose O1, but then a neutral move up to seven, up to four would make them a loser. And that violates strong monotonicity. So the winner can't be O because then O would lose their win from a neutral move. Right? Exactly the same way 
for this schedule seven, the winner can't be M or N because then a neutral move over to six would make them lose and that violates strong monotonicity. Right. And by process of elimination, if the winner's not O, M or N, I know my winner must be the last candidate standing, which is P. Awesome. Okay, we did the hard part. The rest is gonna be pretty painless. <laughs> Um, so let me get through the end and then we'll stand back and go, what the heck did we just do? Let's just get through the end. Okay, so let's just do the next one. This one here is neutral to P. Um, and so the winner must be Allie. The winner would have to be P then. Right, because a neutral move can't make you lose. Right. And then finally, this very last one, this one's a little tricky again. So this very last one is neutral to both M and N. Stare at it and tell me if you agree that it's neutral to both M and N. They didn't move. All I did was exchange P and O down here, right? So it's neutral to M and N. Okay, and now I claim that the winner here can't be M or N because then going backwards to eight would make them lose and violate strong monotonicity. The winner here can't be O. Why? Because everybody likes M better than O. So this is, this is by strong monotonicity. This is by unanimity. And so the winner at the end here has to be P. And voila. Now I found a schedule that's terrible for P, except in column four. So this is strong evidence that only the preferences of column four matter because I've moved P last on everybody else's ballot and they're first on column four. And other than that, if you actually go back and compare that all the way back to the beginning, notice what I've done is taken P from first to last on every ballot but column four and they still win at the end of the day. Strong evidence that, col that column four is the dictator. I'll finish this off with conclusive evidence in a second, but first I just want to stop and pause and say what we've done. First, this is the very first proof that we've done in this class that's complicated enough that you can spend 10 minutes on each little step, but the whole thing has to fit together into a whole. So this has taken us about a half hour so far, by far the most complicated proof that we've done, um, but it's the most sophisticated. It, this is the theorem that launched the whole subject of social choice, right? So it's okay. If, maybe if it takes us a half hour, that's not so, not so very bad, right? Um, but, you know, more to the point to, to get you to understand kind of the project of proof, <laughs> what we've done is we've taken a system about which we know nothing but properties. And then we've taken a schedule and manipulated it to a very suggestive conclusion. Again, I'll finish that off with a perfectly airtight conclusion in a moment. But right now it's a very suggestive conclusion. P's last on everybody's ballot, but first on the fourth ballot. Seems like four is the dictator. Okay, so when you go back and look at this later, what you'll find, I suspect, is what we mathematicians often find when we read a complicated proof, which is I can follow every one individual step, but the big picture can get lost when I do, right? And that's why I've tried to present this to you in a big picture way, which is, we're doing dictator detection. We're manipulating ballots and making kind of careful reasoning about the relationship from one to the next until we get to something that we want. Okay. Any questions about this? I have like two more sentences to finish the conclusive proof that this is a dictatorship, but I just want, I wanna see if you let me bank this part of the proof. Namely, I can start with a ballot where P wins everywhere, can move them last on everyone's, I found a column that has the property that I can drop them to the bottom of every other ballot, but that one and they'll still win. So far so good? Yes? Sometimes we call math like proof by coercion, right? <laughs> like, do you agree? Well, if you agree with this, then you must agree with that. And you find yourself led along this, this system of inferences. So I'm subjecting you to proof by coercion now. But in any event, the, 
even if the individual steps were weird, the overall scope of what we just did is okay. Great, now let's finish it. Okay, what is a dictatorship? By definition, it's something where the first place vote of a particular voter determines the whole election. That's exactly what it is. Okay, so in order to conclusively show that this is a dictatorship, right? So to finish, I must show that any preference schedule where number four likes P best has winner equals P. Any preference schedule at all, not just this one, but any at all. Okay, and so the answer is, um, but then I'm happy because if I tell you to put P in a particular position on each ballot, you can get there from here. Here's how you do it. Um, suppose that, um, so Karina, give me what you want number three's ballot to be. Um, like just randomize? Yeah, MNOP, pick any order you want. Um, I didn't see any Ns first, so I'll do N, M, P, O. Great, and then let's just do another one. Let's do, Raquel, give me a first column. Um, Anything you want. Um, o, N, M, P. Great. Allie, second column. Um, N, P, O, M. Now I'm going to save that fourth column. Ira, fifth column, anything you want. Okay, you're, yeah, oh, you and then, sorry, I was muted. Yeah, no problem. And now the fourth column, well, what did we just say? As long as number four likes P best. So they have to like P best. And then I don't care about the rest. So I'll say the rest are O, M, N. Okay. So I want to see that an arbitrary ballot, I hope you agree that that wasn't rigged, right? That was an arbitrary ballot with P first. I can get there from number nine with just moves that are neutral and favorable to P. How do I do it? Ready? I first, I do um, neutral. Didn't save myself quite enough room for this, but we're going to make it work. First, I do neutral. Um, o, N, M, P, N, O, M, P, N, M, O, P, P, O, M, N, O, N, M, P. So check it out, you guys. See my pink arrow? All I did was juggle O, M, and N into the right order. I put them in the order that you guys told me to hit. So you must agree with me, see coercion. You must agree with me that since all I did was juggle around O, M, and N without moving P, this had to be neutral to P. Right, agreed? Now I can get to here by just moving P up. So I'll leave them in this column because they're already in the right position. I'll move them up in this column. I'll move them up one in this column. I'll leave this column alone because they're already in the right position. And I'll move them, oops, move them up to second in that column. Now they're in the right position. So just by moving them up now, I get, I hit the target you told me to hit. So that was favorable to P. Okay, so from ballot number nine, I can get to, from schedule number nine, I can get to any schedule at all with first neutral to P moves that put O, M, and N in the right order, and then favorable to P moves that put P where I want them. Who wins? Well, the winner was P before, and then I did things that were neutral to P and favorable to P. I'm in a strongly monotonic system. So who wins? P. Et voila, right? 
this is a true dictatorship. I was able to get any ballot at all that you guys made up on the spot with P as the first choice of the fourth voter. I was able to get any ballot at all with an assurance that the winner was P. That is the definition of a dictatorship. Okay, so again, let's look back at what we've done. We started with a simple ballot where I knew the winner. We put it into position. This was like the ideal position to get anywhere from. I put it in this ideal position with P still as the guaranteed winner. And then I was able to hit any old ballot at all with P first on the fourth voters, any old schedule at all with P first on the fourth ballot with the winner still guaranteed to be P. So in the end, you should think of all this complicated steps above as guessing the dictator and putting me in an ideal position to get to an arbitrary ballot. And that's what proves that the dictator is who I thought. Okay, let me wait a minute or two to let that sink in, see if you have any questions. We'll do one more simple example to cool down and call it a day. <laughs> Ira, a question. Maybe this is something you've already explained. So I don't mind. And, and this seems like a little too late in the oh, process. Never to too late, never too late. But why, who, how are these, how are the rankings moving? How are you know the rankings I mean? moving? Yeah, great. How are the rankings moving? Like, what are we even doing here? So what we're doing- How do we decide how they move? Like it's mm -hmm. if, cause if four is the dictator, mm -hmm. but all the other voters are not four. They're That's right. Different entities of That's themselves, right. That's right. right? That's right. So it's not like the dictator can make them change their ballot. No, that would be a dictator with a gun. No, that's a different right. situation, right. right? That's not no, like... right. So if you step back and, and remember like the conversation we started with, it was, imagine that I had an Oracle. I have a mystery system. I don't know what it is, but imagine that I could give it a ballot and it would tell me the winner and I could give it another ballot and it would tell me the winner, right? What we've done is strategically use the properties that were assumed to give us like an oracle. So that is, I know who wins in each of these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I can work out the winner in each just by the properties. And so it sort of functions as like a, a cheap oracle, right? I, if, if you give me some other ballot, I don't know who wins because it's a mystery system. But if I get there through a sequence of carefully chosen steps from one where I did know the winner, then I have control. And at the end, I might still know the winner if I'm careful. Right. And we had to think, I in particular had to think really carefully about how to figure out the winner in number seven, but we worked it out. And so step by step, just using the properties, step by step, we were able to deduce the winner in ballot nine. And from there, it was just a, a hop, skip and a jump to get to any old ballot in which voter four liked P best. So I guess there's two different things going on that could be confusing. I mean, you know, this is a sophisticated proof, right? There's, whoever told you social choice was easy was lying to you, right? So the sophisticated proof, but there's two different things going on. One is I've simply used the properties over and over. But the second, Ira, which I think is the thing that you're picking up on here is along the way, I've, you know, I stopped over here, back here at this point where I s sort of noticed something special happens between voter three and voter four. That's what told me voter four was my, candidate dictator. Once I knew that, all the rest of the moves were just dedicated to proving it. So I kind of did two things. One was I picked out a maybe dictator and then I did a whole bunch of other crap to prove it. <laughs> right. Okay, great. If that seems okay, I just want to do a quick, quick example with you of this like metal detector approach to finding a really important voter. <laughs> okay, so let's switch back here. And let's just do the same, same election. So number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, PMNO. And I want you to pick a system. Let's do plurality first, because it's really easy to handle, but we can do this for all the systems. I just want you to pick for any Pareto efficient system.
let's practice my like maybe dictator step. <laughs> I just want you to understand that step, the maybe dictator step. Now, of course, I propose that we try plurality and plurality is not a dictatorship. So, you know, the rest, the rest wouldn't work, but I can still try to find a, a, a really powerful voter, even though the example is plurality. Bear with me while we do this. Okay, so who wins the current election? So who wins this election by plurality? Sorry, can't hear you. Oh, P. Yes. yes, P has all the first place votes. So they certainly win by plurality. You guys with me? Great. Now let's do the thing where I move up O into first place. So this column becomes OPMN. I'm gonna make that yellow, OPMN. Well, I just moved O up all the way up into first place. Um, now, after, after column one, who's the winner? So now that I've made this change schedule, Karina, who wins this election by plurality? OP. Yep. Okay, next. So I'm gonna move this column to OPMN, if I can make my word green, OPMN. After number two, the winner is Raquel. P. Yeah, but you see what's about to happen, right? When I do this to the next column, who's the winner? Oh. Oh. And so the change happened. Where did the change happen? If I'm looking for, if I'm marking where the change occurred, this change occurred between columns two and three. So if I were doing this process, if, if plurality were the mystery system and I was doing my maybe dictator step, the maybe dictator would be three because that's the column where the winner changed. You guys get that? Now, of course, the whole rest of this wouldn't in the end give me the conclusion that I wanted if I tried to do it on plurality because plurality is not strongly monotonic, <laughs> right? Um, but any strongly monotonic system, I'd go through, I'd find my maybe dictator and then all the rest of the steps would work to confirm that strong monotonicity would help me confirm that they were indeed a dictator. But I just wanted to show you, you could do this maybe dictator step on any system that you want. Okay. Does that make some sense? You wanna try one more system? Try the maybe dictator or do you understand how it goes? You see who it is, you make a move, you recompute, you make a move, you recompute, you make a move, you recompute. And then you've got someone who seems to be a very powerful voter. And then you use lots of strong monotonicity logic to prove that they are in fact a dictator. Feeling good? Question? Good Fire. question. Oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Um, I know we weren't doing plurality with the other system where we mapped out everything, mm -hmm. but how did we decide when we did the fourth and fifth step mm -hmm. that it went from, because I brought it up because I thought we were doing, like I was thinking in terms of plurality right, and right, right. It was like three waters against two waters have yeah. selected O. No, but so. It, so the logic is no matter what the system is, as long as it's Pareto efficient, there's going to be some place where the winner changes. In plurality, the change happens between two and three. In, you know, some other system, it happens somewhere else. Should we, we can try it and see. Um, but because before, at first the winner is P, by Pareto efficiency. And at the end, the winner is O by Pareto efficiency. After you've moved O first on every single column, they must be the winner, right? So if at the beginning of the day, 
the winner is P. At the end of the day, the winner is O. There has to be a place where it's switched. And that place- Wait, I'm just trying to get, understand because period of efficiency is basically if everyone is agreement is in agreement about who should be the first place. That's right. Who should be the winner. Right, yeah. So, so think be. of it like this. Think of it like this. So we have these steps. This is like just a chart of our progress. At the beginning, the winner equals P by Pareto efficiency. And then I go through all these mystery steps where I don't, it's a mystery system. I don't know who the winner is, but I do know that at the end, the winner equals O by Pareto efficiency, right? So everyone agrees that O should be the winner? At the end, because at the end, I've got O first on every ballot. By the time I get all the way through to the fifth column, O is at the top of every ballot. Okay, so- Great, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> so if at the start, the winner is P, and if at the end, the winner is O, right? Um, then there has to be a place where O became the winner for the first time. There must be some first place where it happened. So maybe it happened here. And then I draw a line here and I say W equals O for the first time. So you can isolate this. This is what I'm calling like picking your maybe dictator. I can isolate this from the whole rest of the proof. This is a self-contained strategy to find a powerful voter that works on any Pareto efficient system. Then when I employ that strategy together with strong monotonicity, I can prove they're a dictator. But this strategy works on any Pareto efficient system, including plurality, including uh, runoff, including everything we've met all semester, pairwise comparison, except secondality, because it's the only one that's not Pareto efficient. On any Pareto efficient system, I have P wins at the beginning, O wins at the end. So there must be a place where O wins for the first time. This is a self-contained strategy to find a powerful voter. This is my powerful voter. So, yes. Um, for the previous, what? Because I'm still stuck on that a little bit. Because, um, how did you know? You didn't know for was the dictator. Uh, no, 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 no. I just no. yeah, right. So the the logic says I have n voters. I go through and I identify the kth voter as a powerful one. There must be a kth voter who's powerful. And then I can do the whole rest of the proof with respect to that voter. In order to be concrete in the particular example that I showed you, I supposed it was voter number four. But under different kinds of conditions, it could have been voter number one or voter number 12 or voter number 27. But then the whole rest of the proof is geared to clarifying the power of that voter. So Karina, does that you make sense? Decided Ira, I, that Ira, I want to make sure this is kind of working for everybody. Karina, does that make sense for you? Yes, I think I sort of understand it. I think my only question is if, like, it doesn't necessarily have to be O, right? Like candidate O, it can be another sure. candidate. I could have done this one. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. There's a lot that's arbitrary here, yeah. right? Raquel? Yeah, I think it makes sense. I think the only question is like, um, like based off what property did you just decide that at that point the winner switched to O? Oh, so I didn't decide. I know that it started this way and ended this way, so it had to switch somewhere. Yeah. And I just stopped where it switched. Okay, so just like going along voter like one, yeah. you're like, this is still P, this is still yeah. P. Yeah, yeah. Remember my metal detector analogy? I'm okay. going boop, 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 beep. It lights up at a certain point. And that's when I identify that person as the powerful voter. Okay. It has to happen somewhere. It could happen at the beginning. It could happen at the end. It could happen in the middle. It has to happen somewhere. Okay. Allie, what do you, Ira, I'm coming back to you for sure. <laughs> Allie, what do you think? Um, I might be a little bit unclear about the same thing, just because are we just given at that point that the winner is, oh, do we just, are we like have something so, that is telling uh, us that? Yeah. Okay. So how, how about if I put it to you this way? Um, so at, at a certain point you were born now, I don't know exactly how old you are, but I know you're more than 10. So at some point in the past, you were 10 years old <laughs> to get from zero to 20, you had to be 10 at some point. Right. Um, so this is 
if, if you were in one state at the beginning and another state at the end, there had to be a change. There had to be a time when you transitioned, right? So there had to be a time to get from zero to 20 when you crossed over age 10. And here, if the winner is one thing at the beginning and one thing at the end, it had to change. It couldn't have stayed the same the whole time, right? And so I'm no, I, asking, I can, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Oh, no, I completely understand that it has to change and that makes sense why it would be like, I don't know what our example is before, but let's say it's, you know, voter four out of five. That, yeah. that makes total sense it would have, that that would get us the Navy dictator. I guess yes. my question is, I guess, because number by that logic, let's say it was like three or four and say between three and four, then O becomes the winner mm -hmm. for the fourth time. And that's when we know that the winner is going to be O overall. But that's not Pareto efficient, right? Because wouldn't Pareto efficient mean that all of them Yeah, have yeah, to be yeah. O? You're right, you're right. I can apply Pareto efficiency at the beginning. I can apply it at the end, but I can't apply it in the middle. Pareto efficiency yeah. doesn't apply in the middle, but that's okay because I had to get from this winner to that winner by a step-by-step -step process. So it had to change at some point. It couldn't have been P the whole time because it was O at the end. Yeah. So I'm not using okay. Pareto efficiency in the middle. I'm just using the fact that to get from one thing to a different thing, you have to change. That's all. Got it. Okay. No, that makes more sense. I, I think I was using Pareto efficiency in the middle. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Sense, but, so this is a okay. great point. Not using it in the middle because it's unavailable to me in the middle. I'm not in a, yeah. I'm not in a consensus situation in the middle. Yeah, okay. got it. So okay, I, I, was hoping, I was hoping if I toured through those guys and came back to you that some of what you're thinking about would be addressed by their questions. Did it work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because I, I, I was having trouble putting all those things together. I realized I had, I wasn't taking into consideration that the, f the place where we find out four changes the verdict. Yeah. Is because I was like, how did we find out that, yeah. that it was changing? And it's because the Oracle is telling us yeah, that's who right. the winner is. That's right. That's right. Like, so we already know the winner. We are just trying to figure out how it got there. That's a way you could say it. Yeah, I mean, basically what we're doing is we're trying to use the properties to reason about what the system is. This is a very difficult thing to do. And so we had to break down, in order to prove it was a dictatorship, we had to break down the meaning of dictatorship. The meaning of dictatorship is that there's a powerful voter and anything else doesn't change the outcome, only the powerful voter does. And so first we ran this little, in computer programming, we would call this a subroutine. This is like a little self-contained process that we use to find the person we thought might be the dictator. And then all the rest of those steps were to actually show that only their preference matters. But first I had to find out who to test. And this was the step to tell me who to test. Okay, all right, so this took longer, but for the best reason, which is that like, it's hard. You guys asked excellent questions and I hope I convinced you of how the, all the pieces fit together. Now. Um, this is also, it's in the book, but you know, I like to think that my explanation is a little simpler, but your mileage may vary, as I like to say. So you could also compare this to the argument in the book and see how it goes. But let me just conclude our little mini lecture with what we've proved. So we've showed, uh, this is called the muller satterthwaite theorem. We've proved muller Satterthwaite theorem. This is one of three impossibility theorems in the book, named, of course, for the two people who are, get credit for proving it first. We've showed any Pareto efficient, strongly monotonic, uh, single winner system. Must. Okay, we just proved one of the like major theorems of the 20th century. <laughs> um, okay, so we think that is a good place to stop the recording. All right, so welcome to installment two of Math and Social Choice with a live studio audience. <laughs> um, and so let me share my screen and tell you what I wanna do. All right, so uh, I wanna start with some just general kind of like where we are in the semester structure of the class stuff. 
briefly. And then my, my main goal for this uh, mini lecture is to help wrap up our discussion of the impossibility theorems. So in the last one, I introduced one of the major impossibility theorems, proved it, and, um, and now I wanna talk about the others and how they all fit together and kind of try to bring things to a good like round stopping point because we're coming to the end of the voting theory part of the class. Okay, so I'm gonna start by zooming back out and talking a little bit about like the class and how it's going and how these mini lectures represent a little shift. So this class was always designed to be like an experiment because here we are living on Zoom. And the question was, can you do a good math class that way, right? And so what I did was I went out and I recruited some really talented TAs. They're great. They're all like really thoughtful. They have lots of chops at math, but also I think they're all really good explainers in my experience. And then the way we decided to do it was do these lectures asynchronously. So you could watch them whenever you want because everybody's lives are complicated. Um, and then the, the hope was that we would uh, see each other because you'd have to go to the sections and also that you'd come to office hours and with so many people on staff for the class, there'd be lots of office hours. And here how the, here's how that's working out just like as we round the corner towards the midterm. The office hours are not um, so well attended. People definitely are consuming the lectures, but maybe not quite in the way that I had intended. So my model of how you would um, use the lectures was that expressly you'd get the worksheet first, like that was the idea. And that way you could start working on problems and start like getting your hands in the subject matter. And that would prime you for the lecture. That was the, the kind of principle of how things were going. But uh, instead what I'm hearing from people is like they really expect, and partly this is because of the math classes you've had in the past, people really expect to get the lecture first and they sit there and they receive the information from the lecture and then they're like tested on how well they understand it. So like the experiment really is trying to do something a little bit different, which is like tell you just enough to get you working on a problem and then prime you to hear a lecture about it, right? So you have, I know that's a little different from what you're used to, but that's kind of what we're going for. Having said that, I'm making a little course correction at this point in the term um, and you're part of it. And that is like, as the material gets harder, I'm finding it really difficult to lecture to empty air <laughs> about it because I really need to know if the explanations are landing and if it's making sense. Um, and so I'm gonna keep doing this for a while. This is, this is experiment stage two in Zoom semester, right? Um, and see how this is going and check in with you. So I wanna know if this works for you. Okay, all that to say like what we're all doing here, um, partly I'm trying to adjust the timing and the sort of manner of doing these lectures to make them the most usable for you. But it's still true and it's gonna stay true all semester unless we're magically all vaccinated tomorrow. <laughs> it's still true that it's on you to like make the most of all the stuff we're offering in the class. And that means it's on you to go to office hours. We give a lot of them and you should find ones that work for you and show up. It's on you to like choose to do the worksheets and hand those in. You really have to be active participants in Zoom learning or it's gonna definitely fall flat. So that's my little pep talk. Okay. Um, otherwise we've got a midterm coming up next week. I posted a little FAQ about it today, but do you guys have any questions about what to expect? Uh, I just, it did move to the week after next week. Yeah, right? um, I got zero objections. <laughs> So hearing no objections, we're postponing it a week. And I think that's great because that gives us this week to work on this last worksheet, another week to kind of put it all together and synthesize it into like democracy talk. <laughs> and then we have a midterm. Um, and so I also put in the FAQ, like when you can expect practice problems, when you can expect solutions to those practice problems, just so you can kind of plan ahead to use your time well. Um, anything else? All right. Okay, so let's get started. So what are we doing here today? So here are the things that I have on my little list that we should talk about. So I introduced the idea in the last lecture of a strategy. Um, and so let's talk about strategy and strategy proof systems. That's one thing I wanna do. 
Another thing I want to do is um, so discuss the impossibility theorems in plain English. And then um, kind of along with that, I always like to ask as we encounter these theorems and we learn how the axioms interact, we want to revisit the question of how reasonable are the axioms. Here, by the word axiom, I don't know if that's a word that people outside of math use all the time. Your axioms are just like your basic assumptions or demands, right? And so you could say, you know, like in geometry, the fact that between any two points, there's a straight line, you just think of that as obvious. But when you try to do like set up geometry in a really careful, rigorous, deductive way, you just make that an axiom. That's an assumption. And then you build on that assumption. See what I mean? Right? And so here, all of these fairness properties, we can think about them, the ones that are demands, we can think about them as axioms. And then we can ask what systems satisfy these axioms. So it's sort of another way of thinking about our fairness properties. And so one of the goals of these impossibility theorems is to keep interrogating which are the reasonable axioms. And then if you put them all together, do they help us decide which systems are better than which other systems? Okay, and then um, I have a few more things I wanna do. I wanna prove that dictatorship is strategy proof. We're also gonna see that dictatorship satisfies the hypotheses of all three impossibility theorems. Um, and then finally, if we have time, we'll prove um, that um, the impossibility theorems kind of um, are related. In particular, the, the one that was from last time, Gibbard Satterthwaite, uh, sorry, Muller Satterthwaite was from last time. implies the other Gibbard center. Right. Okay, this is just like a preview. Right, so what's this overview? What is strategy? What do the impossibility theorems actually say? What do they make us feel about the different fairness criteria? And then we'll show that, we'll confirm that dictatorship satisfies all the axioms. That doesn't make it good, right? <laughs> but it satisfies all the axioms that are embedded in these theorems. And then like as a little, you know, dessert, we can show that the impossibility theorems, they're not just completely unrelated, but actually as theorems, they, they kind of imply each other. They, they turn out to be equivalent. And so if you if you've proved one with that, you can prove the others much more easily. So all that hard work that we did last time to prove molar satterthwaite, it gives us another possibility theorem for free, kind of as a consequence. All right, that's the agenda. Anything else you guys would like to add to the agenda? Anything else you want to go over? I have a question. Yeah. Um, will we have to know the specific terms like Muller, Sather's weight? So something that hopefully you've noticed by now is that like I don't believe in a whole lot of memorization. And so mm -hmm. like, I try to make stuff self-contained. So for instance, this week's handout has like the impossibility theorems listed on the back by name. Mm -hmm. right? And that's kind of that's a, that's a good reminder of how, you know, I don't think taking a math class is about like learning to prove an old theorem from the 1970s like these two, or an even older theorem from the 1950s like Arrow's theorem. It's not about learning to do the proof, it's about learning to understand how the pieces fit together, right? So sure. accordingly, I am not a big fan of memorization. Um, so narrowly when it comes to taking the test, um, you'll be able to ask questions to your section leader in the chat. 
for the midterm. You'll be able to ask questions to me in the Slack. Um, and if you have any clarifying questions, you can ask them. Um, we're asking that you take the test without your book and without your notes. And so we're gonna write the test so that you don't wish you had your book for your notes, right? That's the hope, <laughs> right? So like the project here is try to understand how to do reasoning with these definitions. Cause that's what it is, A, that we're gonna test you on. B, that's the thing you can take with you from the end of the class. Like in two years, even if you know what Gibbard Satterthwaite is for the test, you're not going to know it anymore. Like that name isn't going to mean anything to you in two years, but you are going to learn how to kind of relate axioms to each other. Like that's a skill you can take with you out of the class. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, let's get started. So strategy, what is strategy and what might it look like to be strategy proof? So we talked about this in section today. So can someone get us started? What is strategy? What is strategic voting? It's like when you vote um, in order to maybe like not get the person you want the least, you vote against your actual preference. Like you dishonestly vote for, in order to achieve like a more desirable outcome than like the worst case in your mind. Yeah, well, it could be in order to avoid the worst case or it could be just to go from your fourth place preference up to your third or it could be to go from your second to your first. It's um, a kind of voting, it's where changing your ballot causes an outcome that's preferable right so let's oh and i should say i think i've kind of mentioned this in the past but let me emphasize this again you guys know the word polemic right Pole polemic is when you like rant or give a speech that's intended to like really bias people you're you're creating a bunch of you're using a bunch of really colorful extreme language in order to invite an extreme reaction Right, like, uh, you know, some would say Bernie Sanders is a master of polemic, right, about the 1% the and the 99%, right, and just trying to get people stirred up. So I would say talking about dishonesty is polemic, right? You don't need to call it dishonest in order to describe strategic voting, but people very often do because they're trying to convince you that it's bad, right? So polemical phrasing is often like value laden words that you use in order to increase people's sense that something is good or bad behavior. So if I call it strategic, that doesn't sound like immoral, but if I call it dishonest, that sounds immoral. I just wanna point out that they're actually synonyms when you break it down mathematically, right? So I'm not personally gonna use the word dishonest, although certainly Christoph does in the book and that's another way that you could talk about it. But so what I'm gonna say is that strategic voting, if I can get my pen to work, strategic voting is when one or more voters by changing their ballot can get a preferred outcome. Okay, so let's Think about this by the way you know the real world example let's let's stick with bernie sanders since i just brought him up so the real world example that that came up last time is for instance maybe you really prefer bernie sanders but you're trying to think about between sanders and clinton this many 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 thousands and hundreds of thousands of voters thought this way they truly preferred bernie sanders but they thought sanders might lose to trump whereas clinton might beat trump so they voted strategically for Clinton as someone who would prevent their, their least favorite thing. This is, I'm just describing a, wide, a widely held belief. You can call that strategic. I'm not sure you'd call it dishonest, right? It's only dishonest if you interpret the ballot as like a description of your heart. And you know, a lot of people don't necessarily think that the, their vote has to be exactly like that. Just pointing out the way we talk about these things is actually kind of really consequential for people's intuitions about fairness. Okay, great. So that's our definition of strategic voting. Uh, one or more voters by changing their ballot can get a preferred outcome, right? And so if you posit that the original ballot was the true preferences and the changed ballot was the strategic preferences, then you're looking to see whether that strategy can ever succeed. Okay, so let's see an example of this. Quick example.
All right, so here's a basic example, the first one from the book, when the strategy is being discussed. So suppose an election starts out B, A, C, A, B, C, C, A, B, with preferences four, three, two, that's before, and then after we have B, A, C, A, B, C. So actually, I think this is the same example from the worksheet. And C, A, B, and A, C, B, or, or very similar to the one on the worksheet. Okay, so what's happened that's different in between before and after? Well, I used to have two C, A, B voters, and now one of them has changed their ballot. Okay, so one voter changed C, A, B, two A, C, B. All right, so let's see who won before and let's see who won after. And let's try to understand what might happen. Okay, so let's try plurality for instance. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna compute the winner. I'm gonna compute winner prime. And as usual, winner means before the change, winner prime means after, just like when we were talking about spoilers. Okay, so Autumn, who's the original winner by plurality? B is the original winner. Right, with four first place votes. And Elena, who's the winner after by plurality? B and A? Yeah. Okay, now if we use an alphabetical tiebreaker, then I can break the tie between A and B. And Emily, who wins? A runs. Okay, so this raises a question that came up in some of the sections today, which is like, what is the role of the tiebreaker, right? And so in short, when you adopt a tiebreaker, whether it's alphabetical or sequential or some other kind of tiebreaker, what it does is it takes a potentially multi-winner system and it converts it into a single winner system. Do you guys see that? Okay, so in this part of the course, when we're talking about comparing the properties of single winner systems, we often just adopt a tiebreaker so that we can convert any system into a single winner system. That's the role that it's playing here. Questions? Cool, all right. So under plurality with alphabetical tiebreaker, um, the winner changed from B to A, all right? And so if I posit that the original was the true preferences, that constitutes an upgrade from my third choice to my second choice, okay? So I would say this is a successful strategic vote. And that's how strategic voting works, right? So what have we proved? We've proved that plurality with tiebreaker, right? That's the name of the system here. Plurality with tiebreaker is not strategy proof. Or equivalently, we've shown that the system is vulnerable to strategic voting because look, <laughs> we evidenced that with a case in point. Questions? Okay, so that's how that works. Um, and how this fits into the whole, you know, edifice of what we've been building in the class is one by one, all semester long, we'll meet a reasonable selling property and say it's impossible, right? So like, for instance, we, early on, we met the property of spoilers. And then we said, hey, you know, spoilers really make people uncomfortable. They don't feel very democratic. They don't feel very fair. So what if we tried to make a spoiler proof system? And then we found that that's incompatible with two-way fairness. And so that's kind of, we can't achieve, we might aim for, but we can't achieve a democratic system that's spoiler proof. Okay, so what we're about to see is that strategy proof is in the same category. Um, it's incompatible with the other basic things we demand from democracy. Even though it sounds nice. 
<laughs> okay, questions? By the way, let me ask you at this point, even though I'm, I've already kind of previewed for you that this is going to be ungettable, unhavable, unobtainable. Um, what do you think sounds more important, being strategy proof or being strongly monotonic? Which one sounds more important? Let's just remember what those mean. Well, you know what strategy proof means. It means no one should ever vote differently from their actual preferences in order to achieve their actual preferences, right? In other words, another way to say strategy proof is the best way to get your preferred outcome is to vote your, pre your preferences, <laughs> right? Okay, so sounds nice. Strong monotonicity. Can somebody remember for us what that is? Well, it means a move favorable to a candidate within the winner set that's favorable or neutral to that candidate will never result in them leaving the winner set. Yeah, within a preference schedule. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's recall what those words mean. We have favorable moves. Um, move, say, X up and leave others in order. Neutral moves. Leave that particular candidate X in place and nobody hops over X in the other, in any ballot order. Am I making sense how I'm phrasing these is okay? Okay, and then monotonic systems, Favorable moves can't make you lose. Strongly monotonic systems. Neutral or favorable moves can't make you lose. Okay, so my question to you is on the kind of hierarchy of reasonableness, how important does this sound versus strategy proof, right? We talked about what strategy was up there. How important do they sound? How reasonable do they sound? Right, important means how much you want them and reasonable means how much you might be able to find them, <laughs> right? Just like intuition wise, I feel like, um strategy proof feels more important because it feels like in a de democratic system you should be able to vote how you actually feel um whereas like especially all the cases we've talked about with like monotonicity involve these like hypothetical like someone steals something in the ballot box and moves stuff around and like I, I do understand why that works in terms of like the properties we've talked about but I think just like my gut reaction is um the other one feels more democratic cool what do you think Emmy um, I agree, like, with the idea that everyone should be able to vote honestly, but I just think, like, realistically, there's no way of knowing who is voting on, or who is voting based on their opinions and who is voting strategically, and I also feel like the idea that a system would be strategy proof would, like, then we would have to rethink having a primary and just, like, all of these other systems in our democracy that would make it so impossible so i it just seems really contradictory to anything you just said two different things that i think are really interesting so let me like pull those out one is about how kind of desirable it is and the other is about how doable it is right you just sort of said a little bit of both which i think is really useful so in terms of doable, you said, well, if we tried to strategy proof the system, think about all the things we would have to change. Because primaries happen, you know, we have party primaries that happen at the same time, and then those winners advance to face each other. When we're actually doing strategic calculations, we're doing them, you know, based on all these different interlocking 
things that are dependent on each other and where we don't know how they'll turn out. So I was talking about pe calculations people were making about Clinton versus Sanders in the primary, but partly that was to do with who they'd be facing, right? Um, and so I think um, our system has strategy baked into it everywhere. That's a good observation. And to actually try to literally make it never advantageous to plan ahead and think about what comes next and think about your relative preferences and how much you care about them. It's unrealistic to try to make reforms that would make our system strategy proof. So that's that's one thing. You said you said something else earlier than that, which is like, what does it even mean to, to have true preference? <laughs> I actually think that's that's a really smart point. Like, what does it even mean to have true preferences? Um, is is one ranking actually like truer than another? Um, very often you might have feelings that are roughly equal about a, a bunch of candidates. And if you have to actually rank them on the ballot, like there might not be such a thing as your true preferences lurking behind the scenes. Right, Autumn? I think I'm gonna go against Ravi and I would say that strongly monotonic systems, like I would prefer to have a strongly monotonic system than a strategy proof system um, because like if somebody's moving up a candidate into a more favorable position, then I don't think that that candidate should lose because it feels almost like like anti-democratic if somebody's, you know, moving like a candidate into a more favorable position, then I feel like that shouldn't, that should only increase their chances or make it stay the same of them winning or losing the election. That's great. And it actually helps us think ahead where I was saying that all the impossibility theorems are interrelated. You just predicted one of the ways they're going to be interrelated essentially is that a favorable move to a candidate that makes them lose could be a strategic vote right so it could be that you bump someone up to make them lose not because you like them better but because you want them to lose so that's that's a bridge between the theorems that's favorable move as a strategic move do you see what i'm saying yeah that's interesting okay and we'll we'll see that um when we get there yeah these are all great points um, good. This is exactly what I want is to get you thinking about kind of how what the what these things all mean. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to point out that's really unrealistic about the way that we're turning strategic voting into math. So what would this voter here have had to know in order to correctly pick the, you know, to pick the right strategy. So this voter would have had to know everybody else's preferences. Right. And so the way we've conceptualized strategic voting here also assumes that it's possible to have total information, total knowledge of everybody else's preferences. You'd need that to like calibrate your strategic move. And you know, in reality, you have some hunch about how people are going to vote, right? But um, but you can always be wrong. There's incomplete information about other voters. So this particular way of modeling strategic voting, where you assume that a voter has access to the preference schedule is also unrealistic. That's another way that it doesn't totally track with the real world of voting. Okay, cool. All right, so let's, um, actually, this is probably a good time to take, since we've just recapped what monotonic and strongly monotonic are, this will probably be a good time to say how they relate to um, pairwise comparison graphs. So this is earlier, um, we, observed how mono, how favorable moves can change a graph, a pairwise comparison graph. So let's recall that because that's gonna be a nice way of thinking about what these things mean. Okay, so how we observed how favorable moves can change a pairwise comparison graph. All right, so here's some candidate X and here's all the other candidates. So an observation from the last lecture about favorable moves. So since favorable moves move you up on the ballot, they can jump you over some other candidates. But since they leave all the other candidates in the same relative order, they don't change anything about the head-to-head -head wins among the other candidates. Is that clear, everybody? So that's a really important point. I wanna make sure that's clear. Okay, so that means when you do a favorable move, these arrows don't change. The ones that kind of compare all the other candidates stay exactly the same. 
So a favorable move can only change the arrows that connect to that candidate. So a move favorable to X can only change. And in fact, by change, it can only improve the arrows um, from X to others. Right, so what I mean by improved is that the, the arrows facing out can get stronger, the arrows facing in can get weaker, or the arrows facing in can flip to out. Those are the three flavors of improvement. Got it? Okay, so let's do the same thing for a neutral move. We haven't done that yet, that's new. Okay, so I'm going to draw the same kind of cartoon schematic. So here's X and here's the rest of the world. What can neutral moves do? So recall what they are. Neutral moves leave X in the same position on every ballot that they used to be in. They can swap around the people above X. They can swap around the people below X, but nobody can jump over X in either direction, right? Does anyone have a theory? What does that do? Which of these arrows can change? So how about you, Maya? Which of these arrows can change and which ones can't? Well, if candidates can move above and below X, that means that the arrows pointing to and from X can change direction. Okay, but so neutral moves. So let's just draw this as though it's a preference schedule. So I have some folks above and some folks below, right? some folks above and some folks below, above and below. Neutral moves not only leave X in place, but they can, the people who are above X can move, they can permute, they can kind of reorder the people who are above. The people who are below can also move around, but nobody who was below can switch to above and nobody who was above can switch to below. So the red ones stay red and the blue ones stay blue in my little picture here, okay. Then the arrows on either pointing out of X stay the same. Yes. Exactly. They stay in the same direction. Exactly. Same direction and even the same magnitude. Right. So it's kind of the opposite from for the favorable move, the arrows touching X were the ones that can change. But actually now for a neutral move, so these the arrows involving X do not change. I want to make sure that, that you all understand that. That's because, well, on each ballot, if you used to beat X, you still do, because you can't hop over X in the order. Is that making sense? And on each ballot, if X used to beat you, they still do. So if I go through the preference schedule, I have some other candidate Y, and I ask, are you above X or below? The above or below answer doesn't change. It might change how many places above or how many places below, but whether you're above or below doesn't change. And that means not only the, the kind of condensed preferences between Y and X don't change, but you know, even, even the margin can't possibly change. So the arrows involving X do not change, not even their margin. And then how about the arrows in the rest of the world? So like here's a candidate A and here's a candidate B. What can you tell me about the connection from X from A to B? Autumn? Uh, the direction of the arrow can change given that both candidates are either above or below X. Exactly. If they were both in the red zone, they can swap, right? And so it, it could be, you could make an example where like maybe X is in last place on everybody's ballot, stays in last place, but everything else changes. And so I think that example makes it pretty easy to see that all bets are off. So in here, all arrows can change. They can change their numbers, they can change their direction, they can completely change. So this is a sense in which like favorable moves and neutral moves are different. Favorable moves only affect the arrows involving X, neutral moves um, only affect the others. You guys get that? And so now stop and think about it and you can see why strong monotonicity is so impossible in practice. Because now by making a combination of favorable and neutral moves, you can change everything. <laughs> Do you guys see that? 
right? And so it would be unreasonable to expect that combinations of neutral and favorable moves can't change the winner because they can change the whole pairwise comparison graph, right? And so with that, under just any system, essentially, it would change the outcome. Okay. Questions? Cool. All right. So let's get back to the statements of these three new theorems, these impossibility theorems. So let's write them down. I'm going to tell you what they're called, but Emily, don't memorize it, <laughs> right? This is just so we have a thing to call them. So the first one is the one that was already proved last time is called Muller Satterthwaite. It's a terrible name except that these are the two people who first wrote down a proof and put it in a journal. <laughs> um, and so this theorem gets to be named after them because it was important and novel. This is from the 1970s. Um, and this theorem is gonna be the one that says you can't have strong monotonicity. So literally what the theorem says is any single winner system that is Pareto efficient and strong and monotonic must be dictatorship. So I'm going to put an exclamation point because this is kind of surprising. Gibbard Satterthwaite is identical, but it swaps in strategy proof instead of strong and monotonic, otherwise identical. So Satterthwaite was busy in the 1970s. <laughs> this is also from the 1970s. Any single winner system that is Pareto efficient and strategy proof. Must be dictatorship. So surprising. And now let's write down the third theorem and the one that actually came first historically and kind of kicked off the whole subject. So this is arrows and possibility theorem. It's, you know, we, we use these pairwise comparison graphs so much in this class they have these arrows in them, you know, and his name is arrow, coincidence. I work, you know, I, I run a lab that works on redistricting. So we, we work on maps and the newest member of the, of the lab is named Jamie Atlas, not a coincidence. I don't know, <laughs> um, but okay. Arrows and possibility theorem is in a way all about the arrows. Um, so this was from 1951. Unlike the other two, it's about rankings. And so let me pause before I try to write it down and just kind of tell you where, where we're coming from. So in the last worksheet, um, we looked at how you can take one of these systems that we've been focusing on single winner systems and, and use it to, to compile a social ranking. So in other words, so here you are, there's seven of you talking to me now. If I pull you all for your preferences on something, I could take all your preferences and organize that in a preference schedule. And then a ranking system is a way of taking those all into account and coming out with like a group ranking, right? And so on the last worksheet, you came up with a few ways of doing that. So one was you could do rankings based on plurality. Namely, you could just look at how many first place votes everybody gets and you could say, all right, the group ranking, whoever had the most first place votes comes in first, whoever had the second most first place votes comes in second. And you could go on down until you've filled out the complete ranking based on that. Is that cool? Everybody happy with that? Right, and that's easy to do for any points-based system like Borda or pairwise comparison. You can just compute everybody's Borda points and then list them in order and that's your ranking. That seems like a, I don't know, I think that seems like a pretty reasonable way to do rankings, right? There are others. So did you guys try those? Did you come up with any like, is there a way to get rankings out of a runoff system or rankings out of an elimination system? Did you try those and come up with any other one?
That sounds like a no. <laughs> All right, so let's try it live. Um, give it a try. So runoff, what is runoff? You take the, the sort of top two first place vote getters and you compare them head to head. That's runoff, right? So suppose I have an election with, you know, 10 candidates and I do the runoff thing. So I take the top two first place vote getter, when two top two first place vote getters, I compare their head to head, right? And suppose the top two are called A and B and the one that wins is called A. If I wanna build a ranking out of this, who should be first probably? Maya? A. Sure. And then it's up to you what happens next. Since B was the runner up, should I put them next? Or should I throw them back in the pile and do a new runoff? It's really up to you. You can turn things into a ranking in more than one way. What seems more logical to you, Maya? I think throwing them back in and doing it again. Sure. Uh, so that's called like the Maya runoff ranking system, right? And you can make your own. There's just like actually infinitely many ways to do this. All right, so again, let me just repeat Maya's protocol. She says, take your top two, compare them head to head, take the winner, put them in the first spot. Take the second one, throw them back in the pot, consolidate down to those and do it again. In the book, Christoph calls this recursive runoff because you're doing the runoff kind of over and over and over again. You guys okay with that? All right, let's think of a different thing you could do just to illustrate that there's lots of ways to do this. So Elena, you wanna give this a try? So suppose again, you start with a, a runoff, you grab your top two first place vote getters, A and B, you pair them off head to head and A wins. So you put A in first place. Now, what else might you do if you don't wanna throw B back in the pot? B is in second place. That's totally reasonable. So B is in second place. Now you have some choices. Now you could redo a runoff with everybody else, or you could say everybody else comes in, is tied for third place, and then use your tiebreaker to order them. That's another thing you could do. You guys get that? Okay, so there are so many ways to turn a preference schedule into a ranking, and we just came up with a few on the fly. So arrows and possibility theorem is about all possible ways to derive a ranking. Okay, so here's the system. Here's the theorem. Any ranking system, and it's gonna, it's gonna be the same general recipe. Any ranking system with these nice properties can't happen, right? And so here's how we're gonna make this precise. Any ranking system that is unanimity fair and where, and I'll put this in, brackets so that you can it on the on the worksheet I put it in italic so that you could read it separately so where um, the relative ranking of x and y only depends on which is ranked higher on each ballot So I'll put that in brackets. So these are two totally reasonable sounding things to ask for a ranking system. And so of course the punchline is it must be dictatorship. Boom. This is why we can't have nice things. Okay, any questions about how I've stated this? I'll just quickly note to, to really like spell this out in full detail, you'd need to say, what does unanimity fair mean for ranking systems? Like, so for single winner systems, unanimity fair meant that if A is ranked higher than B on every ballot, then B shouldn't win. For a ranking system, unanimity fair means if A is ranked higher than B on every ballot, then A should be ranked higher than B on the consensus group ballot at the end. You see how that's the right interpretation of unanimity for rankings? Okay, good. Do you understand the axiom in brackets here? Do you understand what this means? The relative ranking of X and Y in the output ballot 
depends only on who's, uh, sorry, yeah, the, in the output ranking, right, the ranking that you derive from the group. So whether X is above Y in the end only depends on whether X was above Y on each ballot. That's what the, the bracketed statement says. Um, Christoph gives this a name in the book. He calls this the IIA property, but I try not to give things names when I don't have to. Okay. Okay, cool. So these are, this is, this is it. This is like where we've been building to all semester. This is the, the like pinnacle of the voting theory part of the class. And so I just want to devote the next 10 minutes, which is the rest of the time that we have together to like making sure that we understand kind of how all these words fit together. Cool. Okay. So notice all three of these end with the same punchline, which is each of these, it starts out sounding reasonable and it ends up being a dictatorship. Right. And so in particular, we should see, I'm trying to convince you that dictatorship is the only system that has these properties. So up on my agenda, I wanted to convince you that dictatorship does have all these properties. Dictatorship has all these properties. Okay, so we already did part of that on worksheets. So we already saw that dictatorship certainly has, as a, as a single winner system, dictatorship just takes the dictator's first choice and anoints them the winner, right? And so that is a perfectly viable single winner system. Um, and on the worksheet, you also showed that it was Pareto efficient and strong and monotonic. We can go over that again if you want, but otherwise I'll just assume you're, you're happy with that. Okay. So that means if I wanna show that it satisfies the hypotheses of Gibbard Satterthwaite, I've already showed that it's single winner, I've already showed that it's Pareto efficient. So what's left is I wanna convince you that dictatorship is strategy proof, right? And then, you know, if we have time for good measure, I'll convince you that as a ranking system, dictatorship is unanimity fair and it has the, the bracket property. All right, so let's, let's start with why is dictatorship strategy proof? All right, so claim dictatorship is strategy proof. Okay, let's prove it. So, I must show that there's no possibility for a successful strategic vote. In other words, I have to show, given a preference schedule and its outcome, I have to show that there's no way for anyone to make a change that leaves them with a preferred outcome. Okay, so. Um, I'll do this in two cases. Case one, not the dictator. So I'm asking who's the voter who's attempting to vote strategically. Case one, case one is not the dictator. Case two, the dictator. That covers all the cases, right? If I can convince you that the non-dictators can't vote strategically and the dictator can't vote strategically, then nobody can, right? Okay. Roger, do case one for me. Well, um, strategic voting, uh, you're gonna try to manipulate it, I think so, you know, at, at some degree of preference, uh, you'll have to control it even if your preferred candidate doesn't win. Well, in the case of the dictatorship, only one voter matters. So anyone right. who's not the dictator can change their votes all they want, but no matter who they rank first, second, or otherwise, um, right. will not make a difference. Yeah. <laughs> I, Probably too many words for that. Simple no effect at all. <laughs> That's actually the meaning of dictatorship is that the other voters changes do nothing. Perfect. We're done with case one. So any non-dictator can't have a successful strategic vote because they don't matter at all. <laughs> okay, case two, the dictator. So Emily, you wanna try this one? Tell me why the dictator can't vote strategically. Um, the dictator can't vote strategically because they're only choosing like one candidate and that 
Canada is going to win. So like they don't need a strategy because their candidate is bound to win. Right. The dictator is already getting their most preferred outcome. If they can't improve that. Right. So no changed ballot can improve that. And okay, you guys did all the work for me. That's great. So dictatorship is strategy proof because non-dictators don't matter and the dictator already gets what they want. <laughs> Questions? Okay. Good. So um, we're done with the two Muller satisfy and Gibbard satisfy. We showed that dictatorship does at least have all three properties. And then the hard work was done to show that nothing else does, that only dictatorship has all three properties. Okay. All right. So we have just like five minutes left. So I think those five minutes, I, I was going to show you how to get Gibbard satisfy from Muller satisfy, but I think I'd rather, with the last five minutes that we have, I'd rather kind of probe the wording of errors and possibility theorem just to make sure you really understand it because I think this stands a chance of being one of those things you remember in 10 years. <laughs> it stands a chance, right? So let's try to increase the chance by making sure you understand what it's saying because it is pretty surprising. Okay, so now in this context, we're looking at dictatorship as a ranking system. This is a little different from dictatorship to pick a single winner. As we just heard, Dictatorship to pick a single winner just takes the dictator's first choice. Okay, so Autumn, how do you think we should use dictatorship to pick a whole ranking? Let's see, I think you could use dictatorship to pick a whole ranking by just like using the ranking of the dictator. Yeah, so absolutely. Like the dictator's second. ballot is the, is the outcome. It's a very easy algorithm as a like recipe for making like a ranking in the end, this is very easy. I just go to my dictator and I copy their ballot and that's my output, right? Everybody buy that? Okay, cool. So that's the dictatorship ranking system. So let's check that it's unanimity fair and let's check that it has this bracket property that the relative ranking of X and Y only depends on which is ranked higher on each ballot. Okay, so I'll just write those down as claims. So claim the dictatorship ranking system. Is unanimity fair? And just as a reminder, that means if all rank X over Y, then output ranks X over Y. Does that make sense the way I wrote it down there? That's what unanimity fair means for rankings. Okay, but the proof is kind of obvious. <laughs> There's not much to write down. So if everybody ranks X over Y, then the dictator does, because the dictator is one of the everybody, right? Right, and so since the outcome is just the dictator's ballot, that means the outcome ranks X over Y as well. And okay, so that was pretty easy to see why dictatorship is unanimity fair. All right, so let's just do the last part here, which is so let's look back at this claim here. The relative ranking of X and Y in the output only depends on which is higher on each ballot. It doesn't depend on candidate Q and candidate Z and candidate P, it doesn't matter. All I have to do is ask each ballot who's higher X or Y, who's higher X or Y. And that's going to determine who's higher in the output. Okay, so let's let's write that claim down. In dictatorship, 
sort of knowing whether x is greater than y on each ballot is enough to know if x is greater than y on the output. That's just a rephrasing of what was in the brackets above. Happy with that? OK. So this proof is also going to be blazingly easy. Anybody see how to write it down? I mean, it's almost so obvious it's hard to write down. But let's try anyway. Right? So suppose you're able to look at each ballot and see whether x is higher than y. How do you decide whether x is higher than y in the output? Um, can I give it a shot? Yeah. If you look at each one, um, even if you don't know the, who the dictator is, one no, of them will be. Well, actually, that's important, right? Just oh, like, if oh, all okay. x is greater than y, then the dictator does. Oh, right? sure. Well, you, if you look at the case of the dictator, um, and you basically just see which is higher, x or y, um, and if, yeah, if x ends up being higher than y such that it's the first choice, then... That's the winner, and vice versa. But it doesn't actually matter if it's the first choice. If I want to know whether x is higher than y on Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah. All I have to do is ask the dictator, is x higher than y for you? That answer is the output, right? So knowing the knowledge of the dictator's ballot gives me total knowledge of the output. So if I want to see whether x is higher than y on the output, I just have to look at the dictator's ballot. And so in particular, if I have knowledge of whether x is higher than y on each ballot, in particular, I know whether X is higher than Y on the dictator's ballot, and that's all I need. Does that make sense? Emmy, you buy it? Yes, I think so. Okay, but you know, great point though, Roger, to make this logic work, this is a point Christoph makes in the book. I can't just say dictatorship. I have to say like dictatorship of the case voter. I have to know who the dictator is to make this argument work. Okay, make sense? Cool. Well, this is a great place to end. Um, so we got through basically my whole agenda, which was strategy and strategy proof systems, discuss impossibility in plain English, how reasonable are the axioms, we showed dictatorship the strategy proof, we showed that it satisfies the hypotheses of all three theorems. So that leaves me with like one IOU. And other than that, like we've blazed through chapters nine through 12. <laughs> um, basically, I'm giving you like a highlight tour of like the things I really want you to understand from, from those four chapters distilled. All right, any last questions before we stop the recording? Let me go do that. Okay, hi, welcome. Um, you are my guinea pig batch number three, I think it is. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk through some of the material, which is impossibility theorems and how to think about where that brings us at the end, at the conclusion of the voting theory part of the class. Um, and I'd really like this to be a discussion. So uh, just tell me what you think um, as, as we go and please be warmly invited to interrupt, ask questions, make complaints, and so on. Okay. Um, all right, so we have these three impossibility theorems that were stated on the last worksheet. So the, the very first thing I want to do is remember what they are, recall together what they are, and then just talk about what they mean. And um, then I want to do something constructive because Right, if you end voting theory with just impossibility theorems that say we can't have nice things, right? Um, that's That sounds sort of bleak. It might be mathematically beautiful, but clearly if you care about democracy and democracy reform, the way forward is to say, okay, which of the demands can be softened or relaxed? Um, do we need to transcend beyond this preference schedule 
framework? Do, what do we need to do? Right? The practical step is like, where, where does this lead us in terms of thinking about a better functioning democracy? So my goal is uh, after reviewing the three impossibility theorems, I wanna go back to a topic from the last worksheet, which is, um, and related to Arrow's theorem, the topic of rankings, instead of picking a single winner or just a few to just be able to rank all the candidates. And I wanna introduce in particular, the ranking version of elimination that a lot of people like Pedro, our guest speaker, um, advocate for. So this is using elimination uh, to build a system called STV or single transferable vote. And this is the thing that a lot of people are now kind of advocating for. So that's the, that's the hope here is to sort of talk about the bad news and the good news a little bit. <laughs> um, so what are the impossibility theorems? Well, we have three written down. And so I'm gonna do the, the usual like polite mathematical thing where we say recall, acting as though we all agreed just a little while ago and now we have to collectively recall. Um, we have the uh, muller satterthwaite is listed first. I do not care if you remember these people's names, that's not the point. <laughs> um, the gibbard satterthwaite is listed second. And Arrow's theorem is listed third. Let's just remember what they say, at least. Uh, at least sort of vernacularly. Um, so the first two are about single winner systems, which is where a lot of our focus has been so far. And so what do they say? They say um, a single winner system Um, that is Pareto efficient and I, I want you to think about Pareto efficient as the like consensus property. If everybody agrees on a first place they win. That's Pareto efficient, it's the consensus property. The single winner system that is Pareto efficient and um, this one says and strongly monotonic Um, and the second version here, Gibbard Satterthwaite is kind of just like Muller Satterthwaite. Let's see if I can actually succeed in copying this. Never quite does what I want. Ah, amazing. Okay, so this is almost the same theorem, but instead of strongly monotonic, we say strategy proof. Quick reminder, what is strategy proof? Could one of you guys just recall for me what strategy proof means? Um, I think sorry. it's that, oh, sorry, go ahead. Kylie, you get started. Okay, um, I think it's that uh, the, um, like a strategic voter won't change the outcome of an election or like strategically voting won't change the outcome. Yeah, or put another way, it's exactly right. Put another way, there is no possibility of a successful strategic vote. Right, you can attempt a strategic vote, but it won't actually move things up in your preference. It won't actually give you an upgrade in your preferences. All right, and in both cases, they have the same conclusion. A single winner system with the consensus property and like one additional nice thing um, is dictatorship. Okay, so you see why these are called impossibility theorems. They're saying, um, another way to say the theorem is, if you demand um, voter anonymity, that's the, that's the principle that says that all voters are treated just like all other voters. So if you, if you have a single winner system that's consensus, strongly monotonic and anonymous, it's impossible. This is why it's an impossibility theorem. Does that make sense, right? Okay, it's impossible to make a democratic system with a few nice properties. Okay, so that's these two, they're very similar. The only difference is you swap out strongly monotonic versus strategy proof. And then Arrow's theorem, well, I wrote theorems, but here I just wanna state one. Arrow's theorem is a very similarly flavored thing that actually came first historically, it comes from the 1950s um, for um, ranking. So it is any ranking system that has the unanimity property uh, 
Um, and now what, what swaps in for strongly monotonic or strategy proof is something that says, if you wanna know how two voters are ranked, two candidates are ranked relative to each other in the output. So you wanna know which one of them did ranked higher than the other. Sorry, I'm gonna to have to keep dodging the sunlight beams here. If you wanna know which one ranked higher than the other, all you have to do is consult the ballots and look at which one ranked higher than the other on the ballots. It shouldn't, this is in the book, Christoph calls this independence of irrelevant alternatives. If I wanna know who is ranked higher, Harrison or Grace, it shouldn't matter where Raquel is ranked. I should be able to figure out the order of Harrison and Grace in the output consensus ranking based only on the Harrison versus Grace head to heads on every ballot. You guys get that? Okay, so maybe, you know, and I'll put, I put this in, in brackets here, the relative output rank of candidates depends only on the relative ranks on the ballots. This property here, um, again, in the book, uh, Christoph calls this IIA. Uh, independence of irrelevant alternatives. Again, just like for figuring out the ranking of Harrison and Grace, it shouldn't matter how Raquel compares. That's this bracket property. Okay, and then of course the conclusion is the same. So this, this statement is like, plays the role of the other two that I underlined in green and the output is the same. Ranking system that has this is dictatorship. Okay, and you probably already know my take on this because I've been kind of planting it all along. My take is that it just, one way of interpreting these is that the green properties were just too much to demand. You asked for too much and it doomed you to a dictatorship, right? And so in a way, some of what we can do is like soften those properties that sound nice in the abstract, but they don't play out well for actual voting systems. That's one strategy we can take. Okay, so first thing I wanna do is just talk about these theorems for a little bit before we probe this ranking part and introduce STV. So first, do you guys have any questions about the theorems and what they say? How about questions about how to use them? So a quick example, if you go to the worksheet, this week's worksheet, which is worksheet seven, let me pull it up. Uh, here we go. There's a question that says, show that sequential voting is vulnerable to strategic voting, that you, there can be st successful strategic votes under a sequential system. So what I asked you to do on the worksheet was to explain why that's true using the theorems. So this is problem 3A. Using the theorems, explain why the sequential system with some tiebreakers must be vulnerable to strategic voting. So this is when you wanna talk through how you reason that out using these theorems. So if we if we look at the the arrows theorem, then um, if it's only like relative rankings that matter. So if it's like me to recall, for example, a strategic vote, and that would be like favorable to Grace, for example, might would it? I'm sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought. But it would. But wait, I want to hold your thought for a second because you're doing something excellent. You're explaining why sequential might be vulnerable to strategic voting. But I don't know that you're using the theorems to do it, right? So what you're doing is absolutely correct, and we could pursue that. Maybe we should pursue that together. We can just come up with an example that shows sequential as vulnerable to strategic voting. But if you want these theorems to save you work and kind of you want to harness the power of these theorems, you have to first you have to quote the right one. Um, so if we're interested in strategic voting, we should probably look at Gibbard Satterthwaite because it's the one that's got strategic voting in it. So Harrison, tell me what you think. So give or seven a, a single winner system. Well, is sequential single winner? Yes. Yeah, especially with tiebreakers, right? Okay. That is Pareto efficient, has the consensus property. 
Is that true for the sequential system? Someone else want to take that? Grace says yes. Why? I said yes, because if everyone ranks one candidate first, then that candidate's going to win. Because? Because then it doesn't matter, like, which ballot you're looking at. Yeah, which ballot you're looking at. So the way a sequential system, that's the pool table style of election mm -hmm. system, where you run two off and then the winner advances and then the winner advances and the winner advances. So sequential is based on a bunch of heads to heads. Mm -hmm. right? If you had someone who was first on every ballot, they would win every head to head, right? right. And so no matter where you place them in the tournament, they would beat everyone they face. Right. Do you buy that? Yeah. Okay. All right. So what, we, what we've seen here is that Sequential with tiebreakers is a single winner system and it's Pareto efficient. Okay, so could it be strategy proof? Raquel or Kyla, what do you think? What if it were also strategy proof? What would what would Gibber Chatterley tell us? If it was also strategy proof, then it would be a dictatorship. Yeah, but is it? That's not a dictatorship, so then it can't be strategy proof. Yeah, and just to nail this down, how do you know that sequential isn't just some fancy description, but it amounts to the same as a dictatorship? Convince me that sequential is not secretly a dictatorship. Because like in a dictatorship, only one voter's ballot matters. And in a sequential election, it's like based off the tournament system. So it's not by just one voter. That's right. Because sequential is based on heads to heads, it takes all voters into account, right? Which dictatorship doesn't. Okay, so we have, now we can sort of see some of the power of these theorems. So Harrison, you were about to do something very hard and valuable, which is like, show that sequential is vulnerable to strategic voting by coming up with a strategic vote. That would probably take us a well-spent half hour. But in a well-spent 30 seconds, we can say, nope, <laughs> Gibbard Satterthwaite rules it out, right? Because if it were strategy proof, it would be all three of the hypotheses would be satisfied. So it would have to be dictatorship, but it's manifestly not a dictatorship. Couldn't have been strategy. Okay, make sense? Cool. Okay, so um, anything else just to talk about the theorems and kind of how they're thought about and how, they're, how they might be useful? Okay, so let's talk about, um, well, let's talk about two things. So, so these theorems sound bleak. Um, how shall we, you know, kind of respond? <laughs> what do we do in a world where these theorems are true? So I already mentioned some of our strategies in here. I'd like you to brainstorm with me, like things that we can do. The one thing we can do is like re-examine our fairness properties and try to come up with kind of less demanding. So try to soften them. And what I mean by that is for instance, if you think back to a month ago, we, we looked at spoilers and kind of the property of having spoilers. And we said, boy, we would really like it if our elections could be spoiler proof, but they can't. So we weakened no spoilers to no weak spoilers. Okay, that sounds confusing because I used the word weak twice, right? So for example, spoiler proof is too much to ask. Uh, but several reasonable systems have no weak spoilers. So maybe we could do the same thing here. Maybe we could look back and say, okay, strategy proof is too much to ask. Maybe I can just bar the following kinds of strategies. You guys see what I'm saying? Like relax the fairness condition a little bit to something that isn't quite as stringent so that there's still some systems left. That's a, that's a possible, that's one possible response. What are some others? What, this is, I really wanna brainstorm together. Like in the face of these theorems that say you can't have all the good properties that you want, how might you respond? Could you look at the different theorem, like properties and kind of rank what you think is most important? Yeah, relatedly. So 
if option one was to take them and soften them, option two is to drop some requirements entirely. <laughs> right? And so that's a that's a really good idea. For instance, maybe the single winner part isn't so important. What if I allow ties in some cases? Does that get me out of the jaws of the impossibility theorems? You guys see what I'm saying? Okay, so that's definitely a, another approach. Um, can you think of anything else we might do? This is an open-ended question. We're not gonna stop voting, I don't think, <laughs> right? Kyle, what do you think? I'm kind of struggling to think of something different than what was already said. Um, <clears throat> but I guess like I don't right now just thinking about like ranking like voting systems as well, like by how oh great like, like yeah. fairness criteria they meet. That's a really great idea. If we look back at our fairness properties and we think about which ones were important to us, we can also just rate various systems by how many properties they have. Stop wanting them to have all the good properties these right that's a that's a really good idea so evaluate the potential voting systems you know by a, some sort of scorecard <laughs> right <laughs> of how many features they have um i think these are all good suggestions um uh, let me add a couple more here's another one Sometimes the things that create, and you know, this has been coming up for the last few weeks a little bit. Sometimes the things that create weird, bad properties are, um, are rare. So like Condorcet cycles. You heard Pedro, if you came and heard his talk or if you listened to the recording, one of the things that Pedro said is that in all the elections that have ever been done in the Bay Area with ranked voting, there's always been a Condorcet candidate in every one. Right, and so in particular, if there's a Condorcet candidate, there's no Condorcet cycle, at least not one involving all the candidates. Right, um, and so maybe we're all getting super worried about something that doesn't happen in the real world. Right, so then another thing we could do is look at our kind of weird pathological examples. and see how realistic they are. So another way of kind of softening the fairness properties, instead of making them logically softer, another way is to just rate them by how likely they are to occur. So have some kind of like probability, for instance, and Christoph does this a little in the book, although I, I'm not covering it in any detail, but in, in chapter eight, he says, well, are ties common or rare? Like he just looks at various kinds of things that can happen and asks how frequent are they? What, what, what will they, it look like typically? Um, and so there's a whole area of research today. Um, we're doing social choice theory, which as you've been hearing, like kicked off in the fifties with this theorem and then on into the seventies with those theorems. It's really what we now call like classical topic. But today it's being studied in a computational way, computational social choice. And there are people have they're using computers for various things so they don't have to do all these b path elections by hand for one thing <laughs> right but for another thing it allows you to look at much bigger and more realistic systems you will have noticed by now that all of our elections in this class have at most five candidates right and that's just because you don't really want to draw the graph on 10 candidates it just gets unwieldy to do by hand but like the the research frontier definitely uses computers um, and kind of computation elections. okay so um what I want to do now is parlay our discussion of rankings into the, you know, this new idea called STV, single transferable vote. And I want to claim that it, it kind of hits on these four strategies pretty well. Um, okay. So back to rankings. So first let's recap rankings a little bit. So the idea of a ranking is you could take most of our winner selection methods could be repurposed to produce an output ranking rather than just a single winner, right? So on the worksheet, I think this was on worksheet six, but let me double check. On the worksheet, I had you 
kind of say how this would work for um, points-based systems. And then I mentioned that you might wanna, as a challenge, imagine how it would work for non-points-based systems, right? So um, for points-based systems, it's pretty clear, but let's recall. The output ranking, do you guys understand what I mean by output ranking? Am I making sense? No, can you, can you explain that really quick? Sorry. Yeah, please just interrupt, right? Um, absolutely important. So I've got these candidates, like for instance, here's the election that was on the worksheet, nine, six, two, and seven voters vote A, C, B, D, C, B, A, D, C, A, D, B, and B, A, D, C. And instead of trying to come up with a single winner, I'm gonna to try to come up with a ranking. I'm gonna to try to rank them in order from first to fourth. That's what I mean by the output ranking. It's sort of like nine voters had this ranking. That's kind of their input ranking. That's, that's how they cast their vote. Six voters had this ranking, two had this ranking, and seven had this ranking. A ranking system is gonna be some way of taking that all into account and coming up with a ranking that's like for the society overall. So this is what I'm gonna call the output ranking. So just like a winner selection method that we've been doing all semester is a way of turning a preference schedule into one or several winners, a ranking system is a way of turning a preference schedule into a ranking. Okay, so if we did this by plurality, what would we do? Well, we'd take the person with the first, most first place votes and put them first, and then the next most, the next most, and next most. So Raquel, fill, fill in for me the output ranking under plurality. So it would be A, um... C, B, D. Good. By the way, we should, I'm just gonna put a tiebreaker down um, in case we need it. We didn't need it there. Um, but Raquel, can you also give me a tiebreak sequence? Put the four in order. Um, in you want. Alphabetical. Sure. Okay. So now if I wanted to do this by any other method, like for instance, if I wanted to do this by Borda, I'd do the same thing. Everybody's got a certain number of Borda points. I'm not gonna calculate them right now but first most, next most, next most, next most. And if there's ever a tie, I consult my tie break. So far so good, right? And then also on the worksheet, we did pairwise comparison. So there you draw the pairwise comparison graph. You'd count how many arrows go out. In other words, how many heads to heads are won by each candidate. And then you'd rank them. Most wins, second most, third most, fourth most head to head wins. So these are all points-based systems. So it's not that hard to see a reasonable way to, to kind of order everybody just by like one shot. Yeah, and in the book, Christoph calls these one shot ranking systems where you only need to do the system once to fill out the, the output ranking. Okay, but now let's try to get a little more creative. So pick your favorite system. It's not one of these three. And we're gonna try to use it to build a ranking. Pick a system, any system. Elimination. Sure, that's the one, that's the one that I think is going to produce something especially interesting. Um, so I'm going to do that for you, but first, let me just make a quick comment. Suppose you had picked something. Elimination is not points based, right? It takes the candidate with the fewest first place votes, throws them out, squeezes down the schedule, right, and then iterates until you're down to kind of the right number of people. Um, likewise, B path is not points based. B path just in one shot, B path has some winners and everybody else is a loser. It just has a winner set and a loser set, right? And so I'll just mention quickly, if you wanted to use say B path to make rankings, there's a lot of things you could do. One thing you could do is um, just take the winners and use the tiebreaker to rank them and then take all the losers and use the tiebreaker to rank them and you're done with beat path in one shot. Everybody see that? All the beat path did was cleave the winners from the losers and put the winners at the top. But another thing you could do, and in the book, Christoph calls this recursive, is you could take the winners, slot them in, then take everybody else and run beat path again on everybody else. Take the winners, slot them in, and keep going until you've exhausted everybody. So that's called recursive when you do it over and over. Just wanna mention that. But all to say, all of this is to say, there's not just one right way to build a ranking. There's 
just like there were with linear selection methods, there are infinitely many. So you get to be a little bit creative thinking about this. Okay, let's do it for elimination. So uh, here's here's my election. There's my preference schedule. So here's my abstract cartoon of an election. And at the end of the day, I want to fill in a ballot. Here's my ballot. And I need to rank all the candidates. So if you think about running an elimination election, like I said, you would find the one with the fewest first place votes, not to be confused with Coombs, which is the most last place votes. Okay. Take the one with the fewest first place votes and you throw them out. So if you conceive of doing this repeatedly, how would you fill in a ranking based on the results of an elimination election? So the candidate eliminated first would be last and then yeah, that's a next totally one. reasonable thing to do. So you take the one who's first eliminated and you slot them in last place. And then conduct your normal elimination election, but just keep filling it in from bottom to top as people are eliminated. And this amounts to kind of a record of your elimination process. And in the end, it gives you a rank. That's a totally reasonable thing to do. Okay, so now I want to introduce to you something very similar to that that's called single transfer limit. And I'll tell you the idea. It is we're going to do two things. We're going to fill people in on the bottom if they're eliminated. But we're also going to fill people in on the top if they're over some threshold level of support. And then we'll do both. Bottom, top, bottom, top, bottom, top until the whole thing's filled out. Everybody happy with the strategy? Generally, okay. So single transfer vote will um, consider voters, uh, candidates to be elected if they're over a threshold level of votes. And then eliminated If they have the, you know, least, if they have least first place support. And then we repeat until complete. I have a question. Yeah, please. Couldn't that lead to multiple people? Like, couldn't multiple people be over the threshold number of votes? Great point. So what's my threshold? It's based on how many people I want to elect. That's exactly right. Okay. So this threshold is based on the number to elect. OK, so what is this actually used for? Single transferable vote is used to fill a body with more than one representative. For example, I live in Cambridge. And in Cambridge, we elect our city council this way. We elect nine people to the city council. How do we do it? Like 23 people run and we rank all 23 or however many of them we have the patience to rank. And then this procedure is done until nine winners are selected. Okay, so the, you're right that this sounds like it might elect several people, but you carefully pick the threshold so that it elects the number you want to elect. And I'll tell you how to do that in a second. Okay, so how to use so uh, this is for, well, generally, we imagine that there's some fix magnitude, it's called. Um, uh, my handwriting is terrible. I clearly haven't had enough coffee. Um, and this will select a top. Yeah. Okay, for example, okay, so now maybe you guys can, using this, you can help me kind of work out what the threshold should be. So, if I make my threshold about a ninth of the votes, 
then I can't have more than nine people over the threshold. Does that make sense, you guys? If I make my threshold about a ninth of the votes, then I can't have 10 people with more than a ninth of the votes at the same time. Okay, so idea, set threshold roughly one over M so that you can be sure you don't get like too many people over threshold. Okay, and so this is how it's actually done. And so I'm, I'm just gonna kind of repeat. I'm not gonna walk through an example, but uh, you'll have a chance to kind of play with an example on the next worksheet. But um, you, you have an election like say this one here. Let's go back to this election just as an example. And suppose I'm trying to elect two people, right? Suppose I'm trying to elect two people. So I'd say, well, you need, so how many votes are there in all in this election? So this particular election here has uh, nine and six is 15 and eight is 23 votes. Right? If I'm trying to elect two people, then 13 votes is just a little more than half. So once anybody has 13 votes, they're going to be elected. Is that making sense? And on, in order, and if nobody's over threshold initially, which they're not, if nobody's over threshold initially, I'll keep on eliminating people until I've either filled in the whole ranking from bottom to top, or I've gotten some people over threshold. Okay, there's one more thing I have to do. Is the idea of this clear, even if I haven't given you like totally spelled out mechanics for doing it? So there's one more thing I have to tell you to make sense of this. So what if someone passes the threshold by a lot, right? Then they're kind of hogging a bunch of first place votes that I need for the other people to start being considered viable and getting close to the threshold. So the other thing is if they, if you eliminate someone if they have the least first place support, but one more thing you need to do is also I redistribute excess first place. You know, I say re redistribute excess uh, support once a candidate passes the threshold. Basically, the idea is if I have what I needed to get elected plus 20% more, then I should go and look at my voters second place votes and I should transfer some of my vote support down. So conceptually, I don't, I, I don't want to like kind of get into the mechanics of how to do this. There's actually a lot of ways to do it and they're, they're all just a little bit complicated to spell out. But now the idea is complete. I start with an election. I ask who's over threshold. If they're over threshold, I slate them in at the top. And I take their excess votes that they didn't need and I distribute those down to the second choices of their voters. That might take some other people and put them close to threshold. If they're over threshold, they're in. If nobody's over threshold, I start eliminating the weak, <laughs> right? And I, if everybody filled out a complete ballot, I can, I'm guaranteed that eventually um, I'll complete the ranking either by filling people, eliminating people up from the bottom or having them over threshold down from the top. Um, and in so doing, I can elect M candidates. And that is called single transferable vote. Okay, now, you know, is this practical? Yes, it's done. Um, single transferable vote is done. And well, I give you one example. The, this elimination ranking system is used in many parts of the country, but often with magnitude one just for like a mayor. And if you do this with, with magnitude one, it's a lot more like conventional elimination because there's no such thing as, you, you keep going until someone has a majority of the votes. That's a nice way to think about this. Yeah, actually I'll write that down because that's useful remark. If you carry this out with magnitude one, This amounts to just continuing elimination until someone has a majority. This is called IRV. 
that is doing all of this, but with just to elect a single person is called IRV, it stands for instant runoff voting. And this is used all over the country. It's used to elect mayors everywhere from like Memphis to uh, Minneapolis to uh, Oakland and San Francisco, it's used all over. Um, and uh, these two kinds of reforms, IRV and STV are kind of in the mix um, as reformers kind of look at systems around the country and kind of try to see what they could practically change. Okay, so to wrap this up, I wanna bring it back to our goals in the face of the impossibility theorems. I wanna say, all right, so we just talked about the use of elimination to build a ranking system. I kind of want to argue for it a little bit as a partial response to impossibility. If we scroll back up to the impossibility theorems, we see that elimination version of ranking, um, STV, Arrow's theorem still applies. So it doesn't have the green property, right? It may not even have the unanimity property. You have to check and see if it has the properties. Um, but that's okay. Um, it's still in the mix. It has a lot of good properties. And um, it might even have some new ones that we didn't talk about yet that are kind of, um, as we re-examine our fairness properties, we drop some of our formal requirements. We can evaluate it based on a partial list and we can see what actually happens in real cases as a way of doing like on the ground realistic response to impossibility. All right, and so to finish that up, do you have any questions? Okay, so to finish that up. Yeah, I have a question. Sorry, I'm kind of a bit confused about the redistribution part and like what that yeah, please. actually looks like. Yeah, well, it's because I haven't said too much, but here's what it actually looks like. I'll tell you, in, in, in different places do it differently. Um, in Cambridge, here's what we do. So suppose I needed 100 votes to be elected, but I got 120. So I have 20 extra votes. In Cambridge, what would actually happen is that out of the 120 ballots that ranked me first, 20 of them would be picked at random and the vote would transfer to their second choice, right? Do you see what I mean? It's kind of interesting. So like here, for instance, let's take a look at this one. Um, if, if like voter A had more votes, uh, actually let's do, it, let's do the example of voter C. If voter C had more votes than, than were needed, I'd randomly pick a ballot, either this type or this type. And if I picked this type of ballot, their support would transfer to candidate B, but if I picked this type of ballot, their support would transfer to candidate A. This is, by the way, thanks for asking, Kyla. This is why it's called single transferable vote, because votes actually, vote support actually transfers down the ballot. So it matters not only who your first choice was, but it also matters who your subsequent choices were. Okay. Um, there are other ways to do this. Uh, there's another one that I think is better, which is instead of transferring a fraction of your ballots, you should just take all the second choices of all your voters and the vote strength should transfer to them fractionally. So for instance, if I got 120 votes, but I just needed 20, that's like one sixth extra, right? 20 out of 120 should be a sixth. So then I would just look at all the second choices of all my voters and that vote would transfer down to their next choice with, instead of counting as a full vote, it would count as a sixth of a vote. So that would be a fractional strength transfer. And if you go into the like morass of Wikipedia and you look at all the different ways to do transfers, there are a lot of them. And I didn't wanna kind of focus on any of the details, but on the idea. The idea being that um, if you have a very strong candidate, they're elected and the next choice of their voters is taken into account, Right? But if you have someone who's totally unpopular and is eliminated, then that, the support of their voters fully transfers. And so that's a way of being sure that you have like a conservation of total voters um, from one round to the next. So actually, here's how this plays out in practice. And I'll link this from the um, course website so that you can play with it. Well, the way this actually plays out in practice is that there are rounds. Um, you, you have just one preference schedule for the whole city of Cambridge, but then there are rounds. And if you go to their website, it'll be like, so-and-so was elected in the first round. Then some eliminations happened and some transfers happened. So-and-so was elected in the second round. And you can see how many rounds it takes to actually fill out. Is that making some sense, Kyla? Does that help answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. Cool. 
Um, you know, as you maybe heard me and Pedro talking about when he visited, one of the impediments to getting this reform implemented is that it is the details are persnickety, right? <laughs> and so there's a question of if you educate voters about this reform, is the best way to talk about it to describe its properties or is the best way to describe the algorithm, right? And I think from what I've observed, I go to community meetings, I listen to people argue on both sides for different kinds of reforms. And when I hear people talk about this, I think the mistake that reformers make too much is to try to explain the algorithm when actually what's much more relevant to like democracy is the properties. Um, but you know, you have to do a mix. And of course this is a math class, so we need to understand both. Any other questions? Thanks for asking, Helen. I'm curious about when you start eliminating the like weakest candidates. Does that change anything about how the votes are like distributed? Sure, because um, let's imagine that uh, candidate D, who is the weakest in this election, let's imagine that they'd had a little bit of first place support. So maybe like two voters put D, A, B, C. So that's, they're still in the last place in terms of their first place vote support. Sorry, that's hard to say last place in terms of first place, but that's what it is. So if you were gonna eliminate someone, D would still be the first to go. But now when you eliminate them, look what happens. Um, when you eliminate them, that means those two votes transfer to A. So someone can okay. be really weak, but still have some support enough to be worth transferring. And actually glad you asked because this is the key to one of the properties that I really care about. So let me explain. All right, so one thing that I think is behind our collective intuition that spoilers are a problem, like why don't we like spoilers? Why do we think spoilers are unfair? Well, partly it's because what we see is people with aligned interests are kind of splitting their vote, like with Gore and Nader say, people with aligned interests are splitting their vote and it causes someone they like least to get elected. So I think part of the idea behind people's negative intuition about spoilers is that um, vote splitting has all kinds of problems. It's vulnerable to strategy, because if you know that the coordinator vote is gonna be split, but that you like both of them better than Bush, then your strategy would be to, even if Nader's your preference, you'd go for Gore. So it's a, it, it, vote, the fears of vote splitting give us strategy, strategic voting in real life you guys see that? Do you buy that? Um, but also, fears of vote splitting also activate our anxieties about irrelevant candidates, right? Which was the, the IIA property, independence of irrelevant alternatives. We sort of feel like, oh, did you guys see this in the news yesterday, actually? Um, there was a, a, a politician in, I want to say Florida, who's being brought up on charges now for um, like making up a fake, he's a Republican political candidate who made up a fake Democratic candidate to split the Democratic vote. This, this was in yesterday's news. This is a real thing, right? <laughs> and so this is another part of the worry about vote splitting is that the outcomes then become highly sensitive to how many candidates put themselves forward. So if your side had too many candidates, you worry that it'll split the vote and, and, and give it to the other side. Am I making sense? Okay. So. Um, I'm just going to note, these are things we might worry about. So vote splitting. Um, just it leads to all kinds of worries that I've just mentioned. But there's another thing that we have talked about, like perilously little, almost zero all semester long, which to me is right up at the very top of the fairness criteria that I care about. Um, we might we might worry about kind of um, what's the right way to say this? Well, uh, minority representation, and I mean this extremely broadly. So, if you went to the lecture, the guest lecture that we did on the Massachusetts Republicans, that's a great example. So, minority representation could be Republicans in Massachusetts just as easily as it could refer to racial, ethnic, language minorities, any kind of minorities. So. A real worry that you have to have, I think, when you encounter a voting system is you have to ask if like the American voting system with its plurality 
rules, if it tends to reward majorities, might it totally fence out a minority? That's something that has to be on the table. So these are two things we might worry about. And I want to kind of briefly gesture at why STV does a pretty good job of addressing these worries relative to other systems. Okay, so um, here the worry is, might we fence out minority preferences? So in a way, STV um, partially remediates some of the worst properties of plurality voting. Um, you know, by, by these lights, in the light of these kinds of priorities. Why? Okay, so let's look at vote splitting. So I'm gonna dial back up to this election. Sorry, I know it's a little bit disorienting to go back and forth a lot. Um, but if you have a system where you're transferring the votes, suppose there's vote splitting at the top level. I have a lot of people who generally like this kind of candidates. Let's imagine it as Democrats versus Republicans. So I have a lot of different Democratic candidates and only a few Republican candidates, let's imagine. And the Democratic votes are really split. Well, as long as it's the case that Democratic voters first choice and second choice and third choice, you know, as long as it's the case that they as a block tend to support other Democratic candidates, then the system of transfers means that eventually their votes will coalesce. Okay, does that make sense? So like, for instance, in my example, I might have a D1, a D2, a D3, somebody else ranks D3 above D1, above D2, somebody else ranks D2 above D3, above D1. And then there's other voters who vote differently. Well, if D2 is eliminated, their support goes to D3, right? And then if D1 is eliminated, their support will go to D2 and then to D3, right? So eventually by, the, by eliminating the least popular, the fact that there's a block of voters who all have aligned preferences means that the, the transfers will make those preferences coalesce until they get up over threshold. Did my little cartoon kind of make it clear what I mean by that? Okay, great. And so this actually is kind of the key to the property of STV that I really care about. And that property is what you might call, so STV provides a kind of um, rough proportionality. Uh, here's what I mean by that. If some block of voters tends to prefer some block of candidates, let's call that some slate of candidates, the sort of successive transfers will ultimately ensure that those candidates are elected in proportion to the size of the voting block. So, if you have a third of your city who all share some of the same interests and support some of the same candidates, it won't matter what order they rank those in because the transfers eventually make their votes coalesce, they'll seat candidates roughly in proportion to their population share. Okay, so I hope you see that this addresses vote splitting because now I don't have to worry if, there, if there's little coordination and no consensus and people split their votes because transfers make votes coalesce before all of the candidates from the slate can be eliminated, all the votes have to coalesce. Um, and minority representation, I hope it's clear. This is the only system of all the ones that I've ever studied. This is the only system that gets you proportionality as a structural property rather than by a quota system. What do you mean by quota system? 
Um, the, I'm contrasting it to, for instance, the party list voting in Europe, which is sort of a soft quota system in the following sense. So you're a bunch of IR majors, maybe you've encountered this already. So uh, Europe, Latin America, much of the rest of the world votes by what's called party list. And it goes like this. Um, well, I'll tell you, I'm a dual citizen of the US and France. So I get to vote in, in French elections, which are so different from American elections. They're also not quite party list, but still I'll give you the main idea. In a lot of other countries, there aren't two parties, but maybe there are eight viable parties or maybe there are 12, right? And those parties have different platforms and different ideological alignments, different personalities and so on. When we wanna fill the legislature, a party list system says, you go to all the parties and you ask them to make a list. They have to make a list of their candidates that they wanna seat and it's an ordered list. They'd most like to see this one, then this, then this, and this. Then everybody votes. We don't vote for a person, we vote for a party. Okay, so everyone votes, and then that party's share of support becomes their quota. That's what I mean by quota system, becomes their quota in the, in the legislature. So if my party got 15% of the vote, we should get to fill 15% of the seats in the legislature. Then we consult the list, and we just go down the list as deep as we can until we filled up our quota. All right, everybody with me on party list? Okay, so party list is proportionality by quota. In other words, it's it's designed to give you proportionality because it it, it gives every party its proportional share by you know de jure by by the by the law, right? And then they fill that from their list and so on. There's a few reasons that we kind of probably wouldn't really go for this in the U.S., but one is that. We really like to think about voting for people and not parties, that's one. And two is we don't really have enough parties to make this a viable way to express policy preferences. Okay, so something like STV doesn't even require party ID at all. And so it also does something which is structurally impossible in most of the rest of the world, which is it gives you proportionality um, in several ways at once, for instance, um, issue proportionality. Um, in the US, we have a real, we have the Voting Rights Act, which protects us from the worst impulses of our legislators to exclude minority candidates of choice. So something like STV can give you an ability for minority groups to seek candidates of choice, whether those minority groups are racial, issue driven, or anything else. Right? Okay, it's 12.59 um, and I promise we stopped by one. Um, any questions about this? Okay, and so just to recap and take us back where we started. So the, the goal was say what the impossibility theorems are, talk about them a little bit, discuss the use of rankings, discuss a new uh, idea, which is use elimination to build this single transferable vote system and then use our like jaded, cynical, post-impossibility worldview where you can't have it all, to kind of reevaluate and think about softer desiderata, like softer criteria, things we might ask of our systems that aren't quite as uh, strident, as strongly monotonic and strategy proof and so on. What are some kind of softer things we might ask of our systems that are possible to secure? Oops. And then what are the systems that, what are the voting systems that do that? And so for me, mitigating these worries about vote splitting and strategic voting and ensuring representational opportunities for minorities, those, uh, those strike me as some of the more important fairness properties relative to a lot of the other ones that we've talked about, which has led me to kind of be a fan of STV. Cool. All right, uh, it's not perfect. <laughs> Nothing is, impossibility lurks just around the corner. Um, but it does kind of balance the different priorities better than um, many other things that I've seen. Okay, I'll stop the recording here. Okay, everybody, thanks for joining me tonight. Um, what we're gonna do is talk a little bit more about the topic that I introduced last time, which is this single transferable vote um, idea and kind of how it leverages a lot of the different themes that we've been building up in our voting theory and then pivot to review because you have a midterm coming up and you can ask me questions. We can do review problems, anything that would be most helpful for you. 
Um, okay, so let me start by sharing my screen and reminding you the idea that I want to start with, which is single transferable vote. So, can one of you, if you if you got a chance to watch that last lecture where it was introduced, could one of you just say like a couple words about what the idea of single transferable vote is, and then I'll review the mechanics. Oh, and I should say, live lecture format means that you know this from watching the last few, but it means I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> um, so, anybody um, want to volunteer on this? If not, I'll start with Emmy. So say a thing about what the single transferable vote idea is. Okay, so from my understanding, basically candidates get, it's most widely used when you want like a group of candidates or more than one. And you consider candidates to be elected if they exceed a threshold that you set based on the amount of candidates that you want to elect. Exactly. So it's used to elect M candidates. We usually say STV when M is more than one, as you said, and we call the same system IRV when M equals one. It's just a branding thing, really. So to be clear, if you are a Massachusetts voter, this is what was on your ballot in November, <laughs> IRV. This is the thing that voters in Massachusetts just rejected. So this is an absolutely practical current events, real world political science kind of phenomenon, right? Um, I was actually a little surprised when it got rejected. I expected it to pass. We can talk about that and talk about maybe why it wasn't as popular as, as folks thought it might be. Okay, so um, the next is just as, as Emmy said, the idea is, um, so this is basically, this closely resembles the um, elimination system that we've been talking about all term, but you just sort of use it over and over until you get your group that's elected. Closely resembles a ranking version of elimination. And remember what elimination is. You take the candidate with the fewest first place votes and you toss them out, consolidate and repeat. That's how elimination works. So this is basically the same idea. Except now, instead of just having people be eliminated, you can also have them over threshold and they get elected. Now, threshold for election. Okay, and then usually there are different systems for this, but usually I'll call that capital T, that threshold is like something like one over M or one over M plus one. Basically, you, you try to pick a threshold that has the property that you can't have more than M people exceed it because you don't want to elect more than M people. You're trying to fill M seats, right? And so like example, M equals nine for Cambridge City Council. Okay, so, um, all right, so then what do I do? Well, how does a ranking system work? A ranking system is you have a preference schedule as usual. That's the input. And then you apply the system to get an output. And usually all semester, we've been focusing mostly on systems that elect either one or a small number of winners. And now instead we want a full ranking. So I'm, I, I sometimes call this the output ranking. In other words, it's the ranking that's supposed to reflect the social preferences. This is why we call it social choice. The society decides. So this is society's preferences. And then the idea is that the system converts all those preferences into an outcome. In this case, we want to elect the city council. Okay. And so, well, there's going to be some line here. And this is the top M. And that's who gets elected in the case of STV. So 
it may not be so important what order people are in above the line or below the line, but I really need to know who's in and who's out. That's the, the main goal of the system. Okay. All right. So how does it work? So this works in rounds. Right. So then what, what do you do? Step one, is anyone over threshold? And here I'm just counting their first place support. Just count their first place support and see who's over threshold. Um, if yes, elect, right? So then you'd start filling this in from the top if anyone's over threshold. You guys got that? Make sense? Okay. Then you redistribute their excess votes. And again, there are several ways to do this, but I can tell you what a few of the ways are to redistribute the excess votes. Right, and you see what I mean by excess is like how much over the threshold were they? If they were way over threshold, you don't want to waste all those votes. So you want to redistribute them to their other preferences. Okay. Now, suppose that I've, you know, I've kind of repeated this a few times until nobody's over threshold. Um, if I haven't, you know, maybe this will succeed. I won't have to eliminate everyone. I'll just have like clear preferences and I'll have a certain of M people over threshold and I can be done. But if the fewer than M have been chosen, then you move to step four, which is to eliminate. So you eliminate those, you redistribute their votes, and then you repeat. Now, if every voter ranked every candidate, this would be guaranteed to succeed, and eventually you'd have your M chosen by this process. But sometimes in the real world, voters don't rank every candidate. And when they don't, then as you're transferring their vote support down their ballot, you can run out of ranked people. You can run out of places to redistribute to. That's called an exhausted ballot, a ballot where part of it's been left blank, so you, you have nowhere to transfer. Does that make sense? You see what I mean by that? Okay, so in the real world, that can be a problem. In principle, you could have so many elect, uh, exhausted ballots that you wouldn't be able to elect a full group. Um, but in practice, this tends to work, and we're able to elect this way. Um, Ariel, question? Yeah, I was just gonna like, wouldn't that be a good thing because you would want the voters to be informed enough to like know the candidates and not just yeah. pick random ones? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. I mean, I live in Cambridge. I vote in Cambridge. I'm a high information voter who really cares about <laughs> um, the candidates and who cares about what the city council policies are. But the last time, I think there were 23 candidates and I spent hours and hours and hours getting informed enough about the candidates. And ultimately it's pretty hard to like, who do you like better, your 19th choice or your 20th? Like it gets pretty hard as you get deep into the ballot to have a real preference, um, especially because in Cambridge, what the politics are, the sort of issues of the day, it's really different from on the national stage. The biggest issue in Cambridge is affordable housing policy. So what what do the what does the city council want to do about you know granting developers access to plots of land and what should be the policies for how they set rents and so on? And so loosely, like all those candidates for city council, you can look them up, but most of the information that you'll find about them relates to their affordable housing policy. And if you only have kind of one issue, it becomes pretty hard to distinguish all those candidates. So I'm certainly sympathetic with people who vote a short ballot. But I don't know if I mentioned this in the last lecture, but the, in Cambridge, the typical number of people ranked by a voter is three. That's the, that's the median, and I think also the mode. Like that's the, very short ballots are very typical. Right, and you're right. It might be a sign that, that kind of there's too much, it's overwhelming. Um, and incidentally, I should say, 
Um, for the people who, you know, I've become someone who thinks that STV can be really, really helpful, and I'm going to try to tell you why. But for people like me, um, we think M equals nine is way too high. That puts just too much voter burden on uh, the people who need to make these decisions. And so usually uh, three to five, M equals three to five, is like often considered to be ideal. I'll put that in quotes because, <laughs> right, your, your mileage may vary. Um, but usually when you're trying to elect three to five, you get a much more manageable ballot experience. John? Um, I was just, I mean, just thinking about an exhausted ballot, like, I don't know if this question makes sense, but like if I had an exhausted ballot and everyone else here didn't, could you say that mine ballot counts less in a way over the long run? And I don't know if you could, but if you could, then like, is that fair? Does that line up with the principle? Good question. Um, Maine recently moved to IRV elections for all their statewide elections. And um, the people who argued against it wrote some really interesting op-eds. I'll see if I can dig one up and show it to you. But they said, this whole system is a violation of one person, one vote, because some people's votes count more than others. I found that to be a little bit unconvincing. <laughs> but certainly this is a thing people worry about is like, are we letting some some voices be louder than other voices? Um, I should also mention though, which is something that I thought you might be about to ask. If suppose I have a bunch of excess votes for a certain candidate, if some of their voters kept on ranking and others didn't, we could choose the ballots that are longer to transfer votes to. But that that's even more kind of distribution of control towards the informed voter. Ciao. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to ask was, so in these states where you say like there's 23 like potential candidates, can you just rank, say you only are familiar with three of them, um, just rank those three? Yeah, that's or what say, or Yeah, or say you are familiar with three, you like two and you like really dislike one? Could you do like one, two, 23? Yeah, I kind of put a question like that into the discussion questions that you guys had in section this week. Like, suppose that there's 23 candidates, but there's a handful I really like, and there's one I really hate. I think this guy's gonna just trash the city council. How do I express not supporting this one? Well, kind of the best way to express that is to put everyone else, is to, to put that person on the bottom and put everybody else in the middle. Right? But I might not have strong opinions about the people in the middle. And so you start to see some of the problems with big candidate pools. They definitely pose problems. I should mention in on the West Coast, there's a lot of places that have moved to IRV for their local elections, like a lot of different California cities and towns use IRV. And actually there, they only let you rank three. You can't go any deeper than that. But of course, they're only trying to elect one which is a very different challenge from Cambridge trying to elect nine. Am I making sense? Okay, cool. All right, so I want to go through an example of, of this, kind of show you an example of how this might work. But uh, just, to be, just to be clear, there were at least two decision junctures in here. One is how do you set the threshold and there are different ways to do it. And the other is how do you redistribute the excess votes and there are different ways to do it. But all of these go under the umbrella of STV or single transferable vote. Okay, so let me switch my screen share and show you an example of this, if I can. Okay, so here's an example. And this is from a book that I'm editing. Um, this is a chapter on here, I'll scroll up and show you. This is a chapter on how an explainer on ranked choice voting. Right, and so here's a little example. So suppose you're in a town with some cat lovers and some dog lovers. If we had a plurality election, people would vote for their favorite animal candidates and the one with the first votes, in this case, the tabby cat would win, right? So this is our usual voting system. Everybody just gets one vote. And then what this picture is trying to show you is what if we let the voters rank instead of just telling us their favorite? So if you compared this to the thing I showed you before, you'd see that the first choices are all the same as they were before. They just copied that top row, which should be identical to this top row. 
but now the voters have ranked their choices. Everybody happy with that? Okay, so let's go through and talk. I claim that if you conduct a plurality election, the tabby cat wins, but if you conduct an IRV election, the St. Bernard wins. So let's try to see why that is, right? Okay, so since I'm trying to elect one person and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine ballots, right? I should be looking for someone to get five votes in order to be elected because it's impossible to have two different candidates that have five votes each. So five is a good choice of threshold. You guys seeing why that is? Does that make sense? It's about half, it's a little more than half the votes. Okay, all right, so to be elected here, I'm gonna want five votes. So first round, I count, Tabby Cat has four votes, so that's not quite enough to be elected. St. Bernard has three votes, Shih Tzu has two votes. So none of them is elected on the first round. Everybody happy with that? Okay, but then what? So this is where you guys talk me through what happens next. What happens next? Eve, you wanna give it a try? What happens if nobody's over threshold? What's the next step in our algorithm? So if nobody's got enough votes to be elected, I should start eliminating, right? Yeah. Okay, and then this is just an opinion question because there's different ways to do this, but Eve, who would you suggest that we eliminate? The Shih Tzu. Okay, Jeff spoke up, that's cool. The Shih Tzu, yeah. So the Shih Tzus are probably a pretty good choice to eliminate. They have the least first place support as a bonus. They also have, well, no, they don't have the most last place support, but they have the least first place support. So if we're modeling this on the elimination method, we would probably eliminate the Shih Tzu at this point. Does that seem okay? Okay, and then we transfer their votes. So we take these two voters and we say, okay, your Shih Tzu is out of contention, so we're gonna bump your support to whoever you liked next best, right? And that's the St. Bernard. So now the St. Bernard has one, two, three, four, five votes, and that's enough to be elected. Voila, IRV. Any questions about that? See what we did? We picked a threshold, looked to see if anybody was over threshold, and if they weren't, we started eliminating and transferring and we would just repeat that until somebody had enough votes. John, question? There's nothing here that deals with excess votes, right? Right, because um, as soon as someone's, this is IRV, we only need to elect one. So as soon as someone's in, we're done. <laughs> we don't have to redistribute. But now let's move to an example where we're trying to elect three. Okay, so here's what we're doing. This is a new election. I have new animal candidates. I have tabby cat, the white cat, St. Bernard, the bug-eyed cat. I don't know if you guys have a better name for that cat, we can call it <laughs> something else. And the Shih Tzu, and this is some sort of Jack Russell Terrier or something like that. These are, now I have like more variety of candidates and these are everybody's ranked ballots. And here, I'm just trying to convince you or Thomas and I are just trying to convince you that if you used the at-large plurality system, you'd get a cat sweep but if you used STV, you'd get two cats and a dog. Okay, and so I'm gonna convince you that that's true, but first let's look at this for a second and ask ourselves, just using your intuitions of fairness. Well, notice each of these voters sort of behaves like a cat lover or a dog lover. Like this is clearly a cat lover. This one clearly prefers cats, right? And you can see that it's, it's reasonable to classify these voters as, as cat preferring or dog preferring. Right, and what's the ratio? Well, here there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight voters. And it looks like a five to three ratio of cat lovers to dog lovers. Do, does that seem right? So that means that, you know, three out of eight is like 37.5%. It's more than a third of the people in our little town are dog lovers. And so to many people, this seems more fair of an outcome right? Because the dog lovers have more than a third of the population. A lot of people think it's pretty fair that they should get a third of the representation or they shouldn't be totally locked out of representation. Is that making sense? Okay. You know, and you may 
agree or disagree that that's important. Um, all right, so let's just quickly, quickly see how this happened. So at large plurality would just be, forget the rankings, just count who got how many votes. In other words, count each ballot as supporting each of the three. Well, if you do that, simply because there were more cat lovers than dog lovers, the cats, look, one, two, three, four, five for the tabby, one, two, three, four, five for the fluffy cat, one, two, three, four for the bug-eyed cat, right? And the dogs tend to have three votes each. So the cats have more votes than, if we're just counting votes, the cats have more support than the dogs. And so we'd elect all cats. Emmy? Hi, sorry. Um, I just have a quick clarifying question for when you're conducting plurality in ranked choice voting and you want more than one candidate, are you just looking at whether or not the candidate's on the ballot? Yeah, yeah. Okay. This thing called at-large plurality, it just looks at, are you on the ballot? It doesn't okay. actually treat these as ranked. It just treats them as three equal votes for various candidates. And you might think, who would do this? This is a really dumb thing to do, just count up the votes. And I would answer, this is by far the most common way that city councils and county commissions are elected around the country, by far, right? And some of us in the reform biz call this the world's most racist voting system. And this is why, because it tends to fence out minority groups from having any representation at all. We just saw that. You can have even a sizable minority group. And as long as you're just counting heads, if the majority group tends to support majority candidates and the minority group tends to support minority candidates, there are just more votes to go around for the majority. And so if all you're counting is the votes, you're gonna end up with a sweep. So around the state of Massachusetts, for instance, cities are being sued under the Voting Rights Act for using this system, right? Because you have situations like up the road in Lowell, Mass, at large plurality was used to elect the city council. And even though the city was 40% Latino and Asian, there would only ever been one Latino or Asian city councilor in like 100 years, <laughs> something crazy like that. Um, people are talking about this in Everett, in Worcester, like these conversations are happening around the state. And the question is, if you come in with the Voting Rights Act and you say, this system's not fair, you need to propose a new system. And so sometimes people go to districts and later in the semester, we're gonna talk about districts, but sometimes you can just use ranked choice instead. And so that's what I wanna kind of, that's what I wanna use this time to talk about. Okay, so real quick with my eye on the time, cause I wanna to get to review questions. How did these get elected? Can somebody talk me through? By the way, I do not care, do not care, do not care if you're right or wrong. It's not about that. I just wanna get you all talking. <laughs> So um, does one of you want to just get started? How would you run this? As to, how would you conduct this STV election here? Well, we have to determine a threshold first. Yeah, we have to determine a threshold. So I have eight voters. And so I don't want that threshold to be two votes because then I could elect four people. So it, it makes sense to have the threshold be three votes. Does everybody buy that? Do you see how we got that? I sort of picked the lowest threshold that still guarantees I don't get too many people elected. Okay, great. So I have a three vote election threshold here. So now look at the top row and ask yourself, does anyone have three votes support at the outset? And the answer is no, nobody's there. So we have to eliminate, right? So who would you like to eliminate and why? Eliminate the uh, like, the new doggy yeah. one. The terrier, okay. Were yeah. you saying Ariel? Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, so the, the terrier has no first place votes, has a bunch of last place votes. And anyway, if we're doing this on the basis of first place votes, we'd throw out the terrier. But of course, if we consolidate around that, that doesn't change any of the first place vote support. So we have to keep going, right? So who's next to be eliminated? Yeah, it looks like Bug Eye and Shih Tzu are next to be eliminated. Okay, so if you eliminate them, now the Tabby Cat has three and gets elected. Everybody happy with that? 
and then you eliminate the Shih Tzu, now the St. Bernard has three and gets elected. Okay. And now, now what? Um, well, so when you want to read, so you have to ask yourself if they're over a threshold, but these guys weren't over threshold, right? They just, they just hit the threshold of three. Um, and so, is that true? Yeah. And then what's left, the, the only candidate left standing after these two have been elected and those other two have been eliminated, the only one left standing is the white cat, right? And so the white cat is the third one to be elected. Any questions? Does that make sense? John? Um, so we eliminated two candidates at once, right? And we can do that just right off the bat? Yeah, in this case, I mean, in a realistic election, there aren't usually going to be ties, right? <laughs> in a realistic election, and actually, I'll, I'll put the link in Slack so you can see it. The city of Cambridge releases the results, not just by telling you which nine people were elected, but they tell you who was elected in the first round, and then who was eliminated, who was elected in the second round. They give you a round by round, like, color commentary, so you can see it in action. And so, you know, in a real world situation where there are thousands of voters, it's unlikely that you'll have an exact tie like we did here. Um, so I eliminated them both at the same time because it didn't make a difference. Alex? How are um, the thresholds usually determined? Because it seems like what we did was a little bit arbitrary and we did it like looking at the results. So well, what we did was, okay, so let me go switch this back to my keypad here so I can show you. What we did was, was actually systematic. It was to... So remember what I said over here, and hopefully this pops back up in a second. There we go. So usually the threshold is one over M or one over M plus one. And so what we actually did, this is of the uh, N ballots. So in other words, you take the, you take all N ballots and divide it by M or M plus one, let's say M. Um, uh, and this is a natural threshold. And so that's basically what we did here. We just rounded up by one so we wouldn't get a tie. There were eight ballots. We wanted to elect uh, three. Eight over three is between two and three. So we rounded up to three and that's how we got our thresholds. It's actually pretty systematic. Yeah. So they would look at like how many ca candidates are on the ballot when they decide and decide or would they decide the threshold after the election like we did? Yeah, the, the threshold is just a fraction of the cast ballots. So it depends how many people show up to vote. It, rather than depending on the number of candidates, it doesn't depend on the number of candidates, it depends on the number of voters. Um, cool, okay. So if there's no, I, I wanted to talk about this a little bit because I think for us in this class, um, you know, there's the math side of things, which can be kind of interesting, but when you wanna kind of relate it back to the features of a democracy that you value, um, you have to get a little bit beyond you know, unanimity fair and Pareto efficient and start to think about, would I really call a system fair if it structurally fences out minority preferences? It doesn't seem like a great system. And the point of view of this social choice class is that that's not just letting the chips fall where they may, it's a conscious choice to pick a system that has certain properties, right? And so one of the reasons to like STV, you know, it's it doesn't have all the greatest properties that are in the book. It's not monotonic. It's not, you know, it's not unanimity fair, right? It doesn't have all the great properties that are in the book, but it does uh, tend to provide something like proportional representation for the preferences of significantly sized groups. And that might be a like real world fairness criterion that doesn't have a name in the book, <laughs> but should if I wrote the book, <laughs> right? Make sense? Okay, maybe I'll do that one day. Well, maybe I'm already doing that and I just showed you pictures from it. <laughs> um, okay, so with that, I wanna pivot to just review. So I will ask you if you wanna talk about some of the practice problems that were posted, I can bring one up and we can sort of work on it together or you can tell me about different themes from the semester that have been coming up as you review because clearly with only five days to go till the midterm, obviously you're all deep in review mode by now, I can tell. <laughs> Emmy, what's on your mind? Um, 
I have been a little bit confused about, and specifically with STV, how to redistribute yeah. votes yeah. and how that works. So I have chosen not to like write math questions that ask you to do STV elections, just because some of the details of how you do the redistribution are kind of hairy and obnoxious. But I'm going to tell you what they are, but it is not my expectation that like anything that hasn't been on the worksheets yet, you're not expected to do that kind of problem. So the kinds of problems you're expected to be able to solve are the ones you've already seen on worksheets. So this STV, I'm bringing it up now because I think we gave ourselves an extra week for the midterm. And I thought it was really worth showing you how some of the stuff that we've been talking about actually plays out in the real world of, of reform. Um, I will tell you though, how some systems do the redistribution. So some do it fractionally. So if you have a candidate like here in, uh, in Cambridge, Denise Simmons and Sambul Siddiqui are the most popular candidates for city council. They're super popular. Everybody loves those two. Um, and so they get lots of votes. They're way over threshold. And so they have extra votes, right? And then the question is, what do you do with their extra votes? So one thing you could do with their extra votes is suppose, suppose you needed 100 votes to be elected, but you got 150, right? And so you'd like to somehow redistribute a third because you exceeded the threshold by a third. If you got 150, but you only needed 100, you exceeded by a third. So there's two, well, actually, why don't you make something up? Tell me what you'd do if you have, say, Denise Simmons, and you want to redistribute a third of her voting support. Make something up, and I bet you'll be right that this is one of the things people do. <laughs> Anyone have a suggestion? How would you take those ballots that put Denise Simmons on top, and how would you redistribute like a third of that support? Um, what would you do, Jeff? Put like that third third place votes towards another candidate or towards like the top candidate. Oh, interesting. Well, so if Denise Simmons was their first place vote, the next thing I need to do is look at their second place vote, right? I'm not gonna go straight to their third place. I'll, I'll look at who they liked next best, but I can't do that for all of them or that would be too much redistribution. So how do I somehow transfer to the second place just a third of the time? They take a third of the votes. Yeah. A third of the second place votes. And this is what Cambridge does. Cambridge randomly takes a third of those ballots. It literally randomizes and randomly selects a third of them and redistributes to the second choice on a third of the ballots. There's another thing you could do, which is you could take all those ballots and count it as a third of a vote for the second choice. So that would be a fractional redistribution where you'd count it as a third of the vote for the second choice versus a random redistribution where you'd pick a third of the ballots and fully transfer the vote. So these are two of the possibilities. The real system in Cambridge is actually a little more complicated than that <laughs> because they, they try to balance which precincts they redistribute in. So they're not all redistributing votes from one part of the city. <laughs> um, and so you see like carrying out elections in the real world is complicated. Um, but yeah, I've chosen not to sort of put a really big technical focus on how the redistribution is done, but just to give you the idea. Okay, what else is on your mind review wise? John? Um, and I'd, like to, I'd like to hear from each of you. So the rest of you think about a request that you have for something to go over. Um, John, go ahead. Could we do something with Smithification? I yeah. know the first question on the worksheet I think deals with it, but I mean, just like Smithifying a group of candidates. Yeah, you bet. Um, Alex, do you have a request for any topic? Not yet. Okay, do you, you have a request? No, not yet. I'm looking through the quizzes right now. Okay, sounds good. Ariel? Uh, yeah, that's same for me. I think I got like one of the questions. Um, I'll come back to me. Yeah, you bet. And Jeff, do you have a request? Um. If we could do some like a little bit of PWC, that would help. You bet. All right. So, and then we can just crack some of those practice problems together if you haven't had a chance to start. So let's start yeah, with- so, oh, Sorry, if anyone else also is having trouble with problem number five on the practice- What's that about? Do you remember? Sheet, that's the one where you, it says build a preference schedule where each candidate has 40% of the first place votes, but there is some 
consolidation, which produces a majority candidate. Great. All right. I take requests. So these are these are good requests. Thank right. you. So let's um let's remember what smithification is. First, let's recall in general terms what's the Smith set and what does it mean to smithify and why in the world would you do such a thing? So first let me remind you the Smith set is denoted with a script S. And then just so you remember, script W means something else, which is what? What does script W mean? Winner set. This is the winner set. And then somebody else, script C, that's the other script letter we tend to use. Anybody remember what that is? Okay, this is the candidate set. So this is the Smith set, the winner set, and the candidate set. What's their relationship to each other? Well, the winner set has to be inside the candidate set. Winner set is a subset of candidate set. What this means is, of course, only candidates can win. You can't have a winner who wasn't even a candidate, right? So the world of, of winners is inside the world of candidates. Does my picture make sense? And does this notation make sense? I do expect you to be comfortable with the set theory notation. Okay. Um, and then how about the Smith set? So the Smith set is also a subset of candidates, but it's not necessarily a subset of winners or vice versa. It's just a subset of candidates. And it's a subset defined by what property? So what does it mean to be a Smith set? Anybody remember? It's the smallest dominating set. Right, it's the smallest dom set, which means that everybody in the Smith set like it means all arrows point out. Everybody in the Smith set beats everybody else. It's the smallest set with that property. And it's called dom set means dominating. And so you can see the language we're using strong and weak and dominating, right? The language is designed to make you think like these are the better candidates somehow. I, I'm not sure that's fully true, but anyway, that's that's what the language is designed to suggest. Okay. And so um we actually have a name for systems. So, and then I, I say a strong, so this is definition, a strong candidate are those in the Smith set. That's what strong means. We're just gonna define it that way. We're in charge of the language. We get to, we get to say what it means. And so weak candidates are just those, not in S. That's all it means to be strong and weak in this class. That's all we mean by that. Okay. And so what is smithification? It's easy to say what smithification is. So given any voting system, let's call it V, maybe plurality, pairwise comparison, board out, whatever, any voting system, um, smithified V is as follows. One, find the smith set. Two, consolidate to the smith set three, run system V. That's it, that's methification. And so let me give you kind of the loose idea of it. And then let's try to remember together, like why you'd ever do this. So the loose idea is if you believe the hype that these are the strong candidates, then smithification says, ignore the weak candidates. I instruct you to ignore the weak candidates, throw them out, Consolidate so you just see the relative preferences among the strong candidates and pick one of those. That's smithification. Only the strong shall survive. Kill the weak, <laughs> right? That's smithification. Okay, so that's what it is. And we can practice doing it in a second, but like smithified plurality would be toss the weak candidates, consolidate and count the first place votes. That's smithified plurality. Okay, questions about that? Cool. So why would we do this, but why? Well, one reason to do this is that um, because we hate spoilers. <laughs> so smithification is a thing that you can do if you're really bothered by the idea of a Ralph Nader, if you're really bothered by the idea that a candidate who never really had a chance to win tipped the election. So the logic of smithification would be take your spoiler candidate like Nader, 
toss them. Ask all those voters who their next choice was. Most of them would say Gore, not Bush. Give those votes to Gore and now see who wins and we get a different president in the year 2000. So smithification, smithified plurality would have given us a different winner in, <laughs> in elections like that. Okay, so in particular, smithified, now you, you can never make an election system that has no spoilers. It just can't be done. I proved that like a long time ago, but smithified systems have no weak spoilers. So for people who really think spoilers are the worst thing ever, this is as good as you can get in terms of a spoiler proof guarantee. Okay, questions? Sound good. Okay, so that's what it is. Um, I'll go back to questions that are in the chat. Ah, oh, I'm sorry, I just haven't seen your questions as they're coming up in the chat. So I'm gonna just rewind and answer some chat questions. So a little while ago, um, one question was, do some candidates gain votes when others get eliminated? And the answer to that is yes, absolutely. When you eliminate a candidate, then that the support transfers down. And by the way, that relates back to spoilers. So it's actually a good time to circle back to that question. So people who are worried about Spoilers would also like STB. Why would they like it? Because someone like Nader, if Nader was ranked by voters, would be eliminated and the votes would transfer. So either Smithification or STV, either one of those would have kind of saved us from the spoiler effect in that election. Is that okay? Does that answer the question? Okay, great. And then um, there's also a question, will STV be on the midterm? I can certainly ask you about it but I'm not going to ask you to conduct an STV election. I'm not going to give you a preference schedule and say, do it. Um, but it is a topic I expect you to be able to talk about, answer questions. Okay, um, cool. So was that good? Was that you, John, who asked for smithification? Is that a good reminder of how that works? Okay, and we can, we can do it, but generally, let's actually, let's, let's sort of, let's look at review question number one. So if I recall, you guys probably have this in front of you, but review question number one asks, um, what can you say about a three candidate election where the Smith set has two candidates in it? So um, suppose the number of candidates is three. When I put bars around a set, I'm asking how many things are in it. So this says there are three candidates and there are two strong candidates, two candidates in the Smith set, right? And then the question asks, must there be a tie? Um, so let's, let's do this question together now, kind of as a warm up to Smithification. All right, so I have three candidates. And maybe I'll call them A, B, and C. It doesn't matter what I call them. And let's suppose the Smith set is these two candidates, okay? So you guys help me fill in the rest of this. What does that tell me about the arrows? Um, Jeff, you wanna give it a try? What does it tell me about the arrows? A and B are it. A and B or what? Well, what does it mean to be a Smith oh, set? Oh, A and B are the Smith set? Yeah, that's what we decided A and B are in the Smith set. What does that tell us about the arrows? Here's your here's your little. Um, yeah, they're both they're both going to C. Yeah, right. Everyone in the Smith set beats everyone else. So the arrows must go from A and B to C. That's what it means to be Smith. That's what it means to be a Dom set, is that all the arrows point out. Cool. Okay, and then the question's asking you, well, what can you say about A versus B? So either A beats B, B beats A, or it's a tie. Um, what do you think, Alex? Uh, I think it's gotta be a tie. How come? Um, because the Smith set is the smallest group of candidates that beats everyone else. So if one of them won, they would just be in the Smith set on their own. Yeah, there we go. 
if A B B head to head, then um, just A by themselves would be a smaller dominating set because the arrows would go out to B and C. But the Smith set is the smallest dominating set, so this can't be the case. Likewise, if B beat A, oops, Right, and since those things can't happen, there's my contradiction sign. Those things can't happen because the smallest dominating set is A and B together. And so if A can't be B and B can't be A, that tells me there has to be a tie between the two. Okay, questions? Cool. So then, um, this kind of suggests how you, this is, this is like a little reminder of how you do smithification. You'd start usually by drawing the pairwise comparison graph. So you'd have to figure out the head to heads and draw the, the pairwise comparison graph. And then using that pairwise comparison graph, you'd find the smallest dominating set. And then you'd grab just those candidates. In this case, it would be A and B, consolidate to those and run your system of election. Okay. Questions about this? All right. Let's go to the other two topics that were requested. Pairwise comparison, so we did smithification. And then let's look at number five on the practice. Okay, so this is also a good reminder. So what is pairwise comparison? Um, so this uses, this is the, the first of many systems that use this graph, the pairwise comparison graph. So all it is, um, this is a point system that awards candidates points for each head-to-head -head win. And then we can usually say 0.5 for a tie. So let's do that for the above election. So how many pairwise comparison points do these candidates have? So A, B, and C. Well, A's got a win and a tie, B's got a win and a tie, and C's got nothing. And I can check that this is reasonable by checking how these add up. They add up to three, and that's the number of edges in the graph. That's the number of pairwise comparisons in the graph. So this is good. It adds up correctly to A versus B, A versus C, and B versus C. Make sense? Okay, so just quickly, later on in the practice problems, we suppose, we imagine a election that has 10 candidates and 100 voters, I think. Well, you guys have the review sheet in front of you. Tell me if that's right. So yeah, just, that's right. Okay, awesome. So just quickly for this one, I just want to, remind ourselves how big the pairwise comparison graph would be. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So here's 10 uh, candidates and you can see there's like a whole lot of edges between them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine edges coming out of this first candidate and then eight edges coming out of the second candidate that I haven't already got. And then seven coming out of this candidate that are new and so on. So the total number of pairwise comparisons, and by pairwise comparison, I mean a head to head. That's the same thing, pairwise. It's just saying you compare a pair, pairwise comparison. Total number of pairwise comparisons here is nine plus eight plus seven plus six. You guys agree? Does this make sense? Right, and I keep going for uh, five, four, three, two, one. And if you add those up, you get 45. And that's why I told you on the review sheet, there are 45 edges in this graph. Okay, so far so good. Any questions about this? Great, so let's just make sure all these ideas are coming together. In any pairwise comparison election with 10 candidates, 
how many pairwise comparison points should there be if I add up, if I add up the pairwise comparison points, uh, it should total how many? If you have 40, if you had 10 candidates, shouldn't it be 45? Yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because every edge here, if it has an arrowhead on it, it contributes towards the total for one of the candidates. And if it has a tie on it, it contributes half to each of the two. Either way, it each edge is worth a point. And so that's why you'd have a total of 45 points here. Make sense? Okay, that's how pairwise- Wait, why did you, so why would, mm -hmm. um, why would you start at nine and not 10, did you say? So, like, why would you count up from? Yeah, so if I have 10 candidates, suppose the first one is A, how many candidates do they have to face? Jeff. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> no. They don't have to Makes sense, yeah. Yeah, they don't have to be compared to themselves. OK. Cool. OK, so that was, that was a little reminder on pairwise comparison. So we have just a couple minutes left. Is that, is that good enough? Did I hit what you needed for pairwise comparison? Okay. And then number five on the practice. So remind me what that question was. It's, um, it says build a preference schedule e where each candidate has under 40% of the first place votes, but there is some consolidation which produces a majority candidate. All right, so this is actually not so hard to make, but let's talk about it first before we try to do it. So this is sort of the same idea that we were using for IRV, by the way. The idea for IRV um, was maybe nobody has a majority of support at the outset, but if I start eliminating people and consolidating, that adds to the support incrementally as those, you know, those votes kind of transfer essentially when you consolidate. And so eventually we'll build someone um, a majority because by the time we're down to two, by the time it's down to only two left, one of them has to have a majority. Um, I guess it could be, it could be a tie, but we'll just make it so that it isn't because we get to design the schedule. Okay, so Eve, I'm gonna pick on you for a second. Just tell me how many candidates you want. You can make up anything you want. Just tell me how many candidates you wanna start with and then we're gonna rig it so that nobody has 40% and then we're just gonna consolidate. Um, is 20 a good value? 20 is good. Like it'll certainly work. It might take us a while, but we can totally do 20. Oh, so let's do less then. <laughs> I would, I like to go like economical. So we can't have only two candidates because then someone's going to have a majority, but I could go for three, but we could also do what you said. Like I, I respect that. We could go for a little n is the number of candidates. So we could go for n equals 20. We could go for n equals three or anywhere in between. All right. So if I don't want anyone to have 40%, well, let's do the n equals three example first, and then we'll go back to n equals 20. So for n equals three, if I don't want anyone to have 40%, well, three candidates, maybe they're called A, B, and C. And so tell me, I'm going to build these ballots here. I haven't built the full ballots yet, but I put A, B, and C on top. How many um, voters do you want to support each one? Just be sure that nobody gets too many votes and then we'll, we'll, we'll check that we're under this 40% line. So I don't know, let's say there's a hundred votes. So I don't want you to give anybody 40 of them. So go ahead and tell me how many voters you want on each column, just make sure it's less than 40 and adds up to hundred. Okay, um, we can do, we can do, oh wait, okay. Um, you can't go wrong here. Just any number under 40 is going to work. Yeah, we can do like 30. Yeah. 35. Yep. And um, don't do that. That adds up to 65. So if I put the other 35 here, now I've got 100 voters. Okay, great. So I'm, I've, I've met the first condition. And now I claim it doesn't actually matter how you fill out the rest of the ballot. You can do anything. 
So uh, let's have John go ahead and fill out the rest of these ballots for me. These A voters, who do they like? Who do they like next? C. And these B voters. Um, A. Sure. And these C voters. Um, B. Great. <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> Solid choice. Okay. Um, we have tons of flexibility. So this is a schedule where each candidate has under 40% of the first place votes. But I claim that no matter who you eliminate, someone's gonna have a majority. So we're gonna consolidate. So someone, it doesn't matter who you eliminate. It doesn't have to be the one with the least support or the most support or the most anything or the first in the alphabet. It doesn't matter. Um, Ariel, who do you wanna eliminate? Who should we consolidate to? Um, to B and C. Sure. Let's do it. All right. B is over C on 35 ballots. Do you guys agree? Did I do that right? But C is over B on the other 65. Voila. I have built a schedule where each candidate has under 40% of the first place votes, but consolidation makes a majority candidate. So the question wasn't actually terribly demanding. Just to observe, even if you start out with something that's kind of equally distributed, as you start eliminating candidates, you're gonna eventually, once you get down to just two, either you have a perfect tie or someone's got a majority, <laughs> right? Okay, and so now let's go back to Eve's suggestion. Let's just quickly, quickly, quickly do this for 20 candidates. Well, I'm gonna do something super cheap, but it's gonna work, oops. All right, here we go. My super cheap solution. D, E, F, dot, 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 dot. What's the 20th letter in the alphabet? X, Y, Z, U, V, T. I think maybe T. Okay, so I'm just gonna put D, E, F down to T. D, E, F down to T. And hey, look, this is a preference schedule with 20 candidates. It's still true that nobody's got 40% of the first place votes. And it's still true that if I consolidate to BC, I create a majority candidate. So it would have worked just as well for any number of candidates. But the simplest example was to start with n equals three. Okay, it's eight, so I gotta run. <laughs> but any parting questions? Um, do you have any idea, like ballpark, how many questions the test is going to be? No, the tricky thing about a test is to make sure that it fits in the time comfortably and is kind mm. of interesting. So question counts don't really, because you can have, as you've noticed on the quizzes, you can have one question that just takes you a second, or you can have a question yeah. that's like, check all that apply, and it takes you several minutes. Yeah. To so no, I don't, I don't know, but I'll tell you this, my commitment is to have you not feel rushed. That's my that's yeah. my goal is to give you something interesting that fits easily in the hour. Yeah, all right. Can we use um pen and paper during the exam? Because I, I know a question like this. I beg you, please do pen and paper. Please, please do. <laughs> like if you try to do preference schedules in your head, your that's head what I was thinking on this one. Probably. It might melt. Your family will sue me. Let's let's uh let's avoid that. Yeah, no, um, also on quizzes, if you're not doing that already, please use pen and paper for sure. <laughs> like, um, I love the idea that you use scratch work to kind of work things out. All right, I'm gonna stop the recording now. Okay, hi, welcome to small group review. <laughs> so um, my plan is just to do whatever kind of review for the upcoming midterm. Sounds good to you guys. So um, where would you like to start? Would you like to start with practice problems or just general questions you have had come up as you've been uh, going over the material? I mean, for me, I, I still struggle with BPATH after all this time. I know <laughs> it's the one thing that sort of gets me. I guess the rest of them I, I understand so I'm sure you don't have to go back to my notes to look at, but when I'm working on the worksheets, like always reviewing the entirety of BPATH. 
Do you have any yeah. advice for how to tackle it? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think like, we'll go over that. Uh, let me first take some requests from each of you and then um, I'll like remind you how to do it, but also I like to talk about how to think about this and that might help you so that you don't feel like it's a memory game, right? Um, how about you, Roger? Um, I realized my notes are missing a definition of, well, it's two quick things. They're missing a definition of neutral, because that was one question I missed on a quiz, was my notes on favorable didn't include that it can't change um, orderings of others. Um, so they're missing a good definition of neutral. And then also um, just the definition, like what you mean by consolidation on the review sheet. Yeah. Well. And how about you, Ria? Oh, sorry, can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, I'd also like to go over. Oh, something might be wrong with your audio, but you can always type in the chat. One of you has a little bit. Ah, Roger, you have a little bit of background white noise. The joys of Zoom. Can you hear me now? Oh, that's much better. Yeah, say it again. Okay, perfect. Um, I said I don't like to go to Okay, perfect. All right, so we'll do that. And then if we get through these and have more things we want, we'll just go to the uh, review problems as a starting point. Oh, okay. Um, could we also go over Smith imitation? Yeah, you bet. Um, still a little unclear. All right, so um, for each of these, I wanna tell you what it is and why we talk about it, <laughs> okay? Um, so let's actually start with consolidation because it's somehow the most basic concept on this list. You use consolidation for every method, um, essentially, not all, but most of the methods require some consolidation. So that's a concept that makes a lot of sense to start with. So the idea of a consolidation is um, you have a preference schedule which records everybody's preferences Consolidation is when you pass to a subset of candidates and you use the original lookup table to figure out the preferences in that subset. So this is, so you have maybe a large, you know, or uh, not necessarily large, but let me say the original set of candidates. which you have what we'll call script C. And then, but you, you, you might want to, you might need to consider a subset of them. All right, so what are some instances, what are some occasions when we might wanna consider just a subset of candidates? So one example is if you wanna look at a head-to-head, -head. if you wanna ask which of these two candidates win head-to-head, -head, I call that a consolidation. That's a consolidation from all the candidates down to just two, right? For example, a head to head comparison is the same thing as, these are just two different ways of referring to it. You can call it a head to head comparison or you can call it a consolidation to two candidates. That means the same thing. Hi, Karina, welcome. Okay, so a head-to-head -head comparison is the same thing as a consolidation to two candidates. Can you guys give me another example of any, for any of our different systems of election, what's a time when you might need to consolidate? Well, how do you run, for instance, an elimination election? Somebody remind me, what are the steps in an elimination election? have a designated order and then you, oh no, I'm getting that wrong. That's sequential elimination. That's sequential. Mm -hmm. okay. um, you just, you put two people head to head su successively, correct? That's At sequential. sequential. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> Let me just say, I don't care that you memorize the names of these. So if you're like struggling to match the name on, to the, the, the sort of idea, while you're taking the test, just send a Slack message and I'll, I'll help you remember, right? It's that this isn't a memory test. Um, yeah, so elimination, like it sounds, is where you eliminate the candidates uh, one at a time. 
So anybody remember, Ria, Roger, Karina, do you guys remember? How do you pick the person to just sort of throw out one at a time in I elimination? Least first place votes that you take. Right, and anybody remember what you would call it if you instead tossed the one with the most last place votes? Um, I was gonna say it's the one that where you toss the most, the one with the most <laughs> last place votes, so I don't remember what It's got a slightly different name. We call that the Coombs method, just right. named after someone, presumably some dude. <laughs> right. Okay. So another example is that elimination and Coombs both remove candidates one at a time. And the way you're supposed to proceed, you remove that candidate and you consolidate to everybody who's left. So you see how consolidation, it's kind of at the heart of a lot of things we do. Actually, another example is when we consider spoilers. So what's a spoiler? It's a, it's a candidate who, when you remove them, something weird happens. So how do you test that? You remove them and consolidate, <laughs> right? So consolidation is actually something, it's like, that's why I wanted to do it first. It's at the heart of a whole bunch of different techniques that we do. The idea of consolidation is the original preference schedule shows you all the information about everybody's preferences and rankings, but that at some later date, you might want to consider how those rankings kind of restrict down to just a few candidates that are left standing. And anytime you do that, we call it a consolidation. Okay, does that make sense? Um, one more thing, and by the way, smithification is a consolidation, right? So smithification is, we find something called the Smith set, which are candidates we want to call strong. So let me, let me write this as another example. You find the Smith set, and we can go over how to do this. So that's S is a subset of C, called strong candidates. Then under the, under smoothification, you'd consolidate just to these. So another example, find the Smith set of strong candidates and consolidate to S. This is called smithification. Right, so in other words, if I tell you to run a smithified Borda election, what do you do? Find the Smith set, consolidate to the Smith set, then run Borda. That's what smithified Borda means. Likewise, smithified plurality, likewise, smithified secondality, anything you want. You can even do a smithified dictatorship. Actually, let's talk about that because that one's kind of interesting, right? So your dictator, if you have one, if you're in a dictatorship, there's some voter and ordinary dictatorship is their first choice wins, right? Smithified dictatorship would be, okay, well, still only the dictator matters, but we're gonna pass, we're gonna find the Smith set of strong candidates. That takes everybody's preferences into account, right? And then we consolidate to them. So in other words, you'd have the dictator's ballot and you'd just pick the strong candidates and throw out the weak ones. And then the top the dictator's top choice would win after that. So that really would change a dictatorship. It would be a modified dictatorship that at least took everyone else's preferences into account in designating who the strong candidates are. You buy that? Okay, cool. So um, that's how consolidation works. And while we're on it, let's talk about um, the practice problem on the midterm sheet. I have to pull it up so I remember what it was. Practice problems, here we go. So I think this might've been number three or so. Yeah, number three asked, how many consolidations do you need to perform various methods of election? So let's do that. Okay, so let's just, I mean, you've already seen the solutions. We already posted the solutions, but still let's talk it through. 
So if you're running a regular old plurality election, how many consolidations do you need? Well, none. All you have to do is look at the preference schedule and count the first place votes. You never have to squeeze the schedule down to a smaller schedule. You guys happy with that? You see why it's zero? Okay, so now let's do sort of, what, what if I asked you to like make the pairwise comparison graph? I asked you to make it, right? So maybe if there's five candidates, you know, it looks like this. And then I ask you to put all the arrows on it. How many consolidations do you need to do that? Well, each head to head. So in other words, each arrow here, like this one, that's a head to head election between some two candidates. And so in order to see which way the arrow points, I have to like see who would have won that head to head. So in other words, I have to consolidate down to those two candidates. You guys get that? Okay, so for each, to make the pairwise comparison graph, I need one consolidation for each arrow. So for each edge in the graph. All right, could you show us like when a preference schedule, I'm not sure I like, get it. If I show you the preference schedule, go ahead. So I think, uh, do you think that you could show us with like with a preference schedule of how, like why you consolidate? Sorry, I just am still. Yeah, sure. So supposedly it, this is some five candidates, A, B, C, D, E. And maybe the preferences look like this. Uh, a, B, C, E, D, that's, you know, 100 voters have this preference. And on the other hand, you know, B, D, A, E, C, uh, 72 voters have this preference. And let's just have one more kind. Maybe the others, A is really popular. Uh, and so, you know, another, uh, you know, 61 voters like this. And voila, here's an election. Here's a preference schedule. Now, if I told you, fill in the pairwise comparison graph from this preference schedule. Here's the graph. Now I want you to fill in the arrows. What would you do? Well, first, let's do the one that I highlighted in yellow. So how would you decide which way the arrow goes and what the margin is for that one? Oh, sorry. So you would just consolidate it down to... Uh, exactly, right. I would have to do a little consolidation okay, to just... Sorry. I, I would just I, I, well, I'm glad you asked. That's what we're here for. That's why I've started doing these mini lectures live instead of just pre-recording because it's like so helpful when, you, when you're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so don't be shy. Um, but yeah, that's exactly what I have to do to figure out the yellow arrow. I have to consolidate down to B versus C. And so if I do that here, I see actually... Um, B is over C on 172 because it's in the first two columns, but C is over B in the last column. That's a consolidation of the original schedule. And that tells me that the arrow goes this way. Okay, so to make the graph, I have to do a consolidation for every edge. So in this case, how many consolidations is that? That's a real question, sorry. <laughs> Roger, how many consolidations for this particular one? Um, just for doing overall pairwise comparison? Yeah. Um, In this graph, how many edges does this graph have? One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> yeah. 10, I think? It's got 10, because there's an inner star yeah. with five, and then there's an outer pentagon with five, right? Yeah. So in this case, that's 10 consolidations. All right, any questions about that? Does that make sense? Okay, so that means to, to, to find the Smith set would also take 10 consolidations here because I, I need the graph to find the Smith set. Karina, is that making sense? I wanna get you guys talking a little bit. Great, <laughs> okay. So Karina, finish this off for me then. Smithified plurality, how many consolidations? And just talk through your thinking. It doesn't matter if you have the right answer or not. Would it also be 10? Because. Yeah, and you're saying it would also be 10. Yeah. Why? Well, because you also need all the paths for uh, when you're doing Smith by system. 
Yeah, you need the whole pairwise comparison button to spend. the margins. You need to add the margins. Ten to actually, you don't need the margins to get a Smith set. The no. Smith set is just the smallest set with all the arrows pointing out. Doesn't matter how big the margins are. Okay. Yeah. So ten to find the Smith set, and then Smithified plurality means first you find the Smith set, then you do plurality, right? Do you need any extra consolidations for that? I don't think so. Right. Well, we already decided that plurality doesn't take any consolidations. Okay, makes sense. Great. Um, any other questions about that? So I feel like now we've talked about, um, we've talked about consolidation and we've talked about smithification. Have we done that to your satisfaction? <laughs> Any more questions about those things? Okay, cool. All um, right, so now let's, let's sorry, review what we Yeah. Um, when it has the, the 10 person with the 45 edges, um, when it asks just for Smith, like how many you'd need to, how many consolidations you need to make for Smith, um, I assume you'd have to do the 45 um, just to choose who's in the Smith set. And then after that, um, how do you choose? Do you need the more Smith, to choose? The Smith method is just all the strong candidates. Oh, OK. So it's not a winner selection method. It's just. It is. It's just a really kind of unrealistic one that says all the strong candidates are winners. OK. So it would just find the Smith set and call it a day. Declare them winners. Yeah. <laughs> Thank we you. don't. I don't actually emphasize that method very much because it's not a realistic winner selection method. Okay, so far so good, making sense? Okay, cool. So next up, let's review the ideas of favorable and neutral and then kind of talk about what they're for. Oh yeah, I, I promised a little bit of what they're for. And so before I go on, I think I did an okay job of, of reviewing what consolidations are for. Consolidations are for considering how the full set of preferences might respect to a smaller set of candidates. And so that's useful all over the place. But what is smithification for? So smithification is for something very specific, for a very specific task, which is if you don't like spoilers, initially you might hope to find a method that has no spoilers, and there aren't any. There aren't any reasonable methods that have no spoilers. And so the point of smithification is, um, uh, right, so let's get this. The point is, um, no reasonable system is spoiler proof. But smithified systems have no weak spoilers. I mean, of course they do. Because the way smithified systems work is that you disqualify all the weak <laughs> and you consolidate and rerun. So by design, they have no weak spoilers. And so this is kind of attractive. If you think spoilers are a problem, you can't come up with a system that's totally without spoilers. But at least if you believe this concept of strong and weak is tracking something that's valuable, at least this is a way of being sure you have no weak spoilers. OK, that's what it's for, right? Because I, I like to always do things that kind of have a reason. And so that's the reason for that. So let's review favorable and neutral and what they're for. Okay, so can someone get us started? So a move favorable to candidate A is what? A move that would make them win in the next. Say it again? Is that, the, is that a, a move, move that would make them win? Yeah, no, okay, good. I'm glad you brought that up. It sounds like that's what it should mean. A, a favorable move made you win. But actually, the concept of whether this kind of move helps you win is called monotonicity. Oh, just right. favorable, yeah, favorable itself just means that some voters moved you up on their ballots. And you're absolutely right to connect those in your mind because the, the kind of fairness intuition here is that if voters move you up, it should help you win, right? But in fact, that doesn't always happen. And that's the concept we call monotonicity. So a move favorable to candidate A 
uh, occurs when some voters move them up while leaving all the others in the same relative order. And a neutral move is when things happen above or below the thing that the thing itself does it not count. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you can see why they're called this, like favorable. We moved up A and left everybody else alone. And then a move neutral to A, like you said. And moves that are favorable and neutral, they don't necessarily make you win, but they exactly. lose. Exactly. Some systems, favorable moves can make you lose. And some systems, neutral moves can make you lose. That's sort of why we define these is to kind of isolate which systems have the expected outcome. We expect favorable moves to help you. So and so we want to get that a name so we can study it. So monotonicity means that favorable and neutral moves may, might not make you win, but they can't make you lose. That's favorable. Sorry, monotonicity is favorable moves can't make you lose. Strong monotonicity is neither favorable nor neutral can make you lose. Yeah. So a move neutral to A occurs when all voters leave A in place and then just rearranging the candidates above and below. But never, uh, never letting anybody jump over. Hey, okay. okay. So this is what neutral and favorable mean. And then exactly like Rhea just said, a monotonic system. Has the property that favorable moves can't make you lose. Same for any combination of favorable and neutral moves. They can't make you lose. Right. And then, you know, of course, because the subject of social choice theory comes through the idea of impossibility theorems. Basically, strongly monotonic, it has the flavor, sounds nice, but it's impossible, <laughs> right? That's basically one of our major impossibility theorems. So we have an impossibility theorem, which basically says strong monotonicity leads to dictatorship. Let me try to write a little more neatly. So we have an impossibility. That says Pareto efficient, single winner, strong monotonicity, strongly monotonic are in fact dictatorship. Okay, so this is like I said, sounds nice, but you can't have it. That's kind of the moral of the story when it comes to strong monotonicity, just unreasonable, no system. Because, you know, Pareto efficient and single winner are in some sense kind of non-negotiable when you're trying to elect a single person. Pareto efficient, again, means if a consensus exists, if everybody has the same first place choice, they should win. That's just so basic. And single winner, well, when you're trying to elect one person, you really want a single winner system. That's why I put those in parentheses. Those are sort of like the throat clearing part of the theorem, right? And then basically what this is saying is strongly monotonic systems are dictatorships. Okay, so strong monotonicity sounds nice, but you can't have it. Monotonicity though, that's a little bit more in range. So actually a whole bunch of the systems that we study are monotonic. But in fact, here's something that I think is a little challenging 
Um, and uh, yes, and, and Rhea, we can definitely just sort of review the fairness criteria overall. It's a good idea. But here's something that's kind of interesting about this. So, you know, when you start working on this theory and you're like, okay, strongly monotonic means it's dictatorship. We don't want that. So forget it. Monotonic, that sounds good and it's possible. Like a bunch of the systems that we've been studying are monotonic. And so you have to ask yourself, how much do I value this, right? <laughs> um, and I think what kind of surprised me when I started working on this and then ultimately getting really involved in democracy reform, um, what's, is that um, there's, there's a little surprise, which is that uh, it's actually some of the systems that aren't monotonic that I end up thinking are the best and the most fair. Right, and so starting to work in this subject really challenges your intuitions of what fairness kind of demands. Right, so you have to, as you work in this stuff, you have to kind of refine your ideas of what's desirable, what's possible, what has which unintended consequences. So in the last couple of lectures, I've been talking about this idea of single transferable vote, which is this kind of ranked choice system that is used in some parts of the country, um, including here where I sit. Um, and it's not monotonic, but it nonetheless has other fairness properties that I consider really attractive, such as a tendency to provide proportional representation to minority groups. It turns out I value that a whole lot more than this idea, you know, than the dread of the idea that favorable moves could hurt someone. I'm, I'm willing to have that kind of edge case. By the way, that sometimes in math, we call that an edge case, like a really rare event um, where it's, it's, it's possible, but not that likely that favorable moves could end up hurting someone. Um, I'm, I'm not willing to let that edge case compromise my commitment to like minority representation. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Uh, when it comes down to real world systems, sometimes you have to take these very abstract ideas and like interrogate why they were really important to you in the first place. Cool. Okay. Questions about that? All right, so we're gonna review the fairness criteria. But first, let's go back up. We've now covered favorable and neutral. Feel good about that? Okay, so we need to do beat path and we need to do an overview of the fairness criteria. Let's do beat path first. Okay, so first of all, what's the idea of beat path? Um, and then like, why would it be valuable? So the motivating idea here is that one of the reasons there are so many paradoxes with elections is these Condorcet cycles. Condorcet cycles tend to create weird and kind of pathological behavior. So Condorcet cycles make it really hard to define a good system. Let me try to remind you why that is. Suppose you had three candidates, a Condorcet cycle, recall, is just um, some path, a loop in the graph where all the arrows head all in one direction and get you back to where you started. So something like this. This is a Condorcet cycle with three candidates. Um, and so let me just remind you why it's weird. So in a situation like this, just at the very highest level, who should win? Um, so, well, um, if A wins, you can justify that because A beat B head to head, but C beat A head to head, so why should they have won, <laughs> right? If B wins, well, you can justify that because B beat C head to head, but A beat them head to head. So the social preference is really unclear here because socially as a group, we like A better than B, B better than C, and C better than A, right? And so what you could say is that even though individual preferences are coherent, this, the group preferences here are incoherent. There's no way of saying who the group's favorite is in a situation like this. And that's why Condorcet cycles are at the heart of all the pathology and weirdness that we've been exploring. And so how does that get us to beat path? Well, if you're a mathematician, you think, okay, the problem here is a failure of transitivity. So what's transitivity? Transitivity is where when A has some relation to B and B has some relation to C, then A has that relation to C. Transitivity is like saying, if you have a chain, then a property passes all the way from the beginning to the end of the chain. 
And so you see why this is a failure of transitivity because A beats B head to head, B beats C head to head. Um, and so transitivity would dictate that A also beats C, but they don't. And so the motivating idea is let's come up with some other um, way of comparing candidates that is transitive, right? And we're going to call that beat path elimination. Instead of A just beating B head to head, we're going to define this kind of elimination relation. And it's going to be transitive, that is cycle free. And because it's cycle free, we're just going to be able to say, okay, drop all the candidates that were eliminated by anyone and whoever's left is a winner. And we're not going to get any paradoxes when we do that. So that's the whole idea here is to come up with some cycle free relationship between candidates. And here it is. We, um, so this is the definition. We say that A eliminates B means that um, there's a path from A to B in the graph that is stronger than any path from B back to A. I'll remind you what the strength of a path is in a second, but first I just wanted to get this definition out. So sometimes we call this an unmatched B path. You see why it's called a B path because since it's a path that follows the arrowheads, it's a path of sequence, you know, sort of a sequence of this one beats this, this one beats this, this one beats this, this one beats this. So it's called a beat path. It's a path of beating each other. <laughs> okay. And so the only other thing I have to remind you is what's the strength. And so recall the strength of a path is the magnitude of its weakest link. Okay, the strength of a B path is its weakest magnitude. So let's do a quick example. So let's find all the B paths from D to B. So that means all the ways that I can go in this graph following arrowheads to get from uh, B to D. Um, and then I'm gonna also do D to B. Okay, well, check it out. B has no arrowheads going out of it at all, right? All, B is beaten head to head by each of the other three. So the answer here is there are none, okay? So B path follows the arrowhead. So there's no way to get from B back to D because I can't even get out of candidate B. Is that cool? All right, so Sloan, you wanna get me started going the other way, D to B, name a B path, and then we'll decide how strong it is. D to A to B. Yep, that's one. So this one has, what's its strength? Two? Yes. So I'm going to write it like this. The strength of this path is two because it has a link of, of strength two and a link of strength four and it's overall only as strong as its weakest link. Okay, what's next? Roger, you want to do one? Sure, so let's see. Strength from, sorry, can you repeat? Uh, I was writing something else down. Give me another path from D to B. Another path from D to B, sure. Um, let's see, we have DCB, uh, the strength of which is six. Yep. That's pretty strong. I see another one of strength six. Um, Karina Aria, do you see one of strength six, a different one of strength six? 
to B. Just from D to B. Yep, direct. And I see one more B path in there. Uh, is it from is it from D to A to C to B? Yep. So D to B direct was six, and the strength of D to A to C to B. Well, that's only strength two because of its initial step. Okay, so overall, there's two different ones of strength six. That's the strongest B path. And they're unmatched because there is no B path back the other way. So this was overkill. We didn't need to do all of this. Any one of these would have been good enough, <laughs> but I was just trying to like get you guys some practice finding B paths. So all in all, we say that D eliminates B. And let me draw that a little more neatly so you can see what the symbols are. That's this little triangle symbol. D eliminates B. And so B doesn't win. And just Quickly, by the way, we can look at this path. We can actually find the B path winner very, very, very quickly in this election because notice D is actually a Condorcet candidate. They beat everybody had to had nobody beats them. But that means nobody's got a B path to D, right? And so D is actually going to be clearly the winner. So you can see actually just the winner by B path in this election is going to be D alone because they're Condorcet. So they necessarily have an unmatched B path to everyone. So basically you go through and if the B path is either stronger or unmatched, then you do, then you eliminate and then so on. Yep. And so you find B path. Absolutely. And in terms of fairness, we just, we just kind of proved, we just saw generally that B path is Condorcet fair because we observed that anytime there's a Condorcet candidate, they win because they have unmatched beat paths to everybody. That's what Condorcet fair means. It means um, a Condorcet candidate must win. That's what, if there is one, they must, they must win. Okay. Now, <laughs> why do we love beat path? For the reason that I said, which is it got rid of paradoxes by getting rid of this intransitivity. And so um, it has a lot of nice mathematical properties. It's, you know, it's, it's monotonic, it's unanimity fair. It's got, all, it checks a lot of boxes. And that's why like th it's theoretically appealing. Is beat path kind of worth adopting in the real world? No, it's a terrible, terrible system in reality, but it checks a lot of the boxes abstractly, which is why it's kind of interesting to think about. Also, I wanted to teach it to you because this concept of transitivity, I think you're going to find useful, like going beyond this class. Just the idea that transitive relations have the property that, you know, a, a relation between successive pairs communicates all the way from the beginning to the end. That's a very useful idea that you might find applicable elsewhere. Okay, was that a good enough review of the path? Yeah. Um, all right, excellent. So now let's see, in the chat, you guys have been requesting just an overview of all the fairness criteria. We can definitely do that. And then some subset notation or just general set notation. So we can definitely do that. All right. So review of fairness criteria. Now, many, many, many of these fairness criteria are of the form if then. They say, if this thing happens in an election, then this outcome should happen or not happen. But so it's important to remember that because they have if then structure, sometimes they just aren't making any demands at all of a system. So for instance, um, majority fair and Condorcet fair. So this one says, if there's a majority candidate, they should win. And of course, a majority candidate is just one that has more than half of the first place votes. That's what it means to be a majority candidate. You have a majority the first place votes. And this similarly says, if there's a Condorcet candidate, this is someone who beats everyone else head to head, they win. Neither one of these properties is binding at all on a system, is demanding at all of a system that doesn't have the kind of candidate being discussed. There's no majority candidate 
majority fairness doesn't care what happens. <laughs> and if there's no Condorcet candidate, Condorcet fairness doesn't care what happens. Okay, cool, does that make sense? And you know, when we had our guest speaker, uh, Pedro Hernandez, he said something really interesting, which I totally want to follow up on because I believe him because he's, you know, he's a super reliable guy, but it surprised me a little. He said that in every election that he's ever seen where people ranked their preferences, there's a Condorcet candidate. I was like, uh -huh. that surprises me. Um, you know, I'm sure he's, I'm sure the way he said that is strictly accurate because he's a very, very trustworthy guy. But I'd like to go back and take a look at, you know, he was mostly talking about West Coast elections. Well, here in Cambridge, we've been doing ranked choice since 1941. Did I tell you guys that? We've been doing it for a while. <laughs> and so is that true in Cambridge that there's usually a Condorcet candidate? I don't know, um, but that's something one could, I have actually, I have all that data. We do some research on it in my lab. So we can actually go back and take a look. But if that's true, then what it suggests is that in the real world, all you need to care about, if you think Condorcet candidates should win, <laughs> then in the real world, all you need to care about is Condorcet fairness and all the rest is window dressing because the rest of the time, well, may not occur very much in reality. So you see what I mean? Like this might turn out to be where a lot of the action is if you believe Pedro, as you probably should, that real elections usually have a Condorcet candidate. <laughs> okay, so what other, is that, is that cool? Making sense? Okay, what are some other fairness criteria that you remember and then we can go over what they say? Unanimity for? Yeah. By the way, when you hear these talked about, sometimes you'll you'll hear this majority fair or the majority property, unanimity fair or the unanimity property, unanimity criterion. These are all kind of synonymous. Okay, so what is unanimity fair? Well, that just says um, if all voters. Right, that's why it's called unanimity because there's a consensus. If all voters prefer X over Y, then, and I find you might be tempted at this point to say X should win. If everyone likes X better than Y, then X should win. But that's not the right conclusion, just intuitively, because maybe there were 10 candidates and everybody liked, everybody ranked X ninth and everybody ranked Y 10th, right? Then just the fact that X is over Y doesn't mean they should win. What does it mean? Okay, so imagine the, the scenario I just described was a preference schedule. Or suppose X and Y are both really unpopular. That's my cartoon of a preference schedule where Y is at the bottom and X is near the bottom for a lot of voters. So here, this is a unanimous preference of X over Y. But I don't think that even in your mind, you should think this would make X a winner. It just what would be a reasonable conclusion? Y can't be a winner over X. Yeah, just right. Y can't. Mm -hmm. um, and then unanimity fair requires strong monotonicity and Pareto efficiency, correct? No, other way around. Um, so we proved that's like a lemma, a little result, which is that strong monotonicity and Pareto efficiency implies unanimity fair, not the other way around. And, and that makes sense because remember, strong monotonicity leads to dictatorship, right? That was one of our theorems. Strong monotonicity leads to dictatorship. But unanimity fair is a property that several of our non-trivial systems have. So this implies this, but not the other way around. And we can go over the proof of that if you want, if that would be helpful. Okay, so um, sounds good. We've we've kind of remembered what unanimity fair means. So let's just do a little kind of baby theorem, um, like a, a kind of warm up result. Let's show that plurality is unanimity fair. Proof. All right, so stop and think about that for a second. It's 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 like one line or less. <laughs> how how do you know that plurality is unanimity fair? And 
and use, I actually recommend this to you when you're trying to figure something out. These little cartoon ballots, like the one that I drew here that just give you an idea of where the preferences are, they're a really good way to reason. So take a look at that cartoon and tell me why you could be sure in a plurality election that Y doesn't win just because X is above them on all the ballots. Well, because in plurality, the person with the most um, first place votes wins and so exactly. everyone has, if like one, if X has all, if, X, if everyone puts X as their first place voter. Well, no, no, I didn't say it was their first place. All I said was that X is above Y, right? Oh, yeah. It doesn't have to be the first place. But if X is preferred over Y, then in plurality, mm -hmm. it's you, the, the candidate with who's like preferred with the most number of preferred votes will win. Well, the most number of first place votes. So how many first place votes does Y have? Zero. Right. That's and that's that's what nails this down. Since X over Y on all ballots, Y has no first place votes. So they certainly can't win a plurality election. Everybody got that? Y'all are being pretty quiet. <laughs> um, right? X might have first place votes or they might not. Right? But Y can't have any. And so they certainly can't win a plurality election. Okay. Tell me what the quietness means. Does it mean that that was easy, hard, that you're keeping a lot of different stuff in your mind? Tell me how to interpret the quietness. Sorry, this is kind of a stupid question, but. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm confused. Um, y cannot win because um, since X is preferred over Y at all ballots, Y has no first place votes and therefore it cannot win. But how does that prove that, because uh, you said that X could have first place votes, but according to mm -hmm. them, like how could X have first place votes if like it's right above Y in all of these and that there's other things. How could X have first place votes? Okay, sure, so here's an example. Right, so this was one example. Here's another example. I could have three voters like X and then A and then B and then Y, uh, maybe two voters like B and then X and then Y and then A, and maybe, you know, four voters like, uh, you know, A first and then B and then X and then Y. This is an example where every voter ranks X over Y. Do you agree? Right, sorry, I just went with this preference schedule where there's lots of- where Yeah, lots of see, when you're trying to prove a theorem, it's, this is important. When you're trying to prove a theorem like this, plurality is unanimity fair. That means for all possible preference schedules, all possible preference schedules. So that means, so let's look at unanimity fair again. What does it say? It says, if all voters prefer X over Y, then Y can't win. So this means, in other words, to prove unanimity fairness, I have to consider every possible preference schedule where X is above Y in every column, right? So this was an example of a preference schedule where X is above Y in every column. This is also a different preference schedule where X is above Y in every column. So the fact that X is above Y does not tell me whether X has first place votes. They could have some or they could have none, okay. but it does tell me for sure that Y can't have any first place votes simply because X is above them. The best they can do is second place for any voter's ballot. Right. So under all possible preference schedules, as long as they have the property that X is over Y in every column, then Y can't have any first place votes. And so they certainly can't run a plurality election. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, folks, what do you think? Seems good. Okay, doing good. Yeah, all right. So Sorry? Everything makes sense. It's great. Thank okay, you. great, great, great. Great. So we have reviewed a few fairness criteria. We've reviewed majority fair, Condorcet fair, unanimity fair. There's a few more. So let me just list some of the others. Uh, other fairness criteria. What else did we talk about? Well, we talked about Pareto efficient. I don't think of single winner as a fairness criterion. It's just a criterion, right? I don't know if you really think about that as fairness, so I'm gonna leave it out. Um, but Pareto efficient certainly is. Like it says, if, if somebody's got all the first place votes, they should win. There's a few others, there's anonymity. 
which says all voters are treated equally, that one is violated by dictatorship. And then there's, you know, independence of candidate names. Which says all candidates are treated equally. And that's violated by sequential. Yeah, it's violated by sequential, exactly. Because in sequential, there's an order. And in fact, that's actually violated anytime you name a sequential tiebreaker. You're no longer treating all candidates equally. So then you have to stop and ask yourself, how important was that fairness criterion to you? Well, if you want to have a single winner, you probably have to break independence of candidate names. You see what I'm saying? Is you know, there, and you get these trade-offs. Is there any way to tie a break without, like, without violating? There is, but we don't talk about it much in this class, and that is randomness. <laughs> you could flip a coin. That treats all candidates the same, at least in terms of their opportunities, right? It's independent of candidate names. Um, but in this class, we've mostly focused on deterministic systems, systems that don't have any randomness. Uh, let's see if I can think of any others that we've talked about. Well, we've talked about monotonicity and strong monotonicity. We've talked about strategy proof. We've talked about spoiler proof. That's a fairness criterion. It's just one that's impossible to obtain. You know, and then there are lots of variants on these, like no weak spoilers. That's a that's a fairness criterion, right? And all the different varieties that we've talked about. But hopefully, this is like a reminder that we've actually discussed a lot of different possible fairness criteria over the course of the semester, and we've kind of tried them on. And you know, the book doesn't talk about um, minority representation as a fairness criterion, uh, but that's another one that I think is really important. So you know, opportunity for minorities. And again, I want to emphasize, as a matter of mathematics, that applies just as much to Republicans in Massachusetts as it does to kind of racial um, and ethnic minorities. In the US, we think this is actually so important that we have a whole law with an enormous legal apparatus to enforce it, um, which is called the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which guarantees electoral opportunities for minority groups. And if your system doesn't provide them, your system gets wiped out by the voting rights. So this is actually a huge real world fairness criterion that's somehow like completely without mention in the book, <laughs> right? Um, and my prediction to you guys, based on like being involved in actual democracy reform, is that this cent centering this fairness criterion and kind of declaring it to be really important is going to lead to systemic change in winter selection. So there was a really important legal theorist who in the 80s and 90s advocated for ranked choice as a kind of framework that would lead to more electoral opportunity for minority groups. And that is Lonnie Guineer of Harvard Law, um, who you know actually sort of got pretty far convincing people about that, and then the subject kind of lagged for a while, and now it's on the way back. Cool. Okay, questions about that? So next, let me just quickly, so I'm looking at the time, and I know we wanna wrap up, but there's a request for just a quick set notation refresher. So the basic symbols I want you to understand for sets or this element of symbol, this subset, this proper subset, and um, empty set. Those are the basics. Okay, so the empty set is just the set with no elements. And so when we say, for instance, that there has to be at least one winner, Every election system has to provide at least one winner. A uh, efficient way to write that would be that the winner set can't be empty. That's how you would use the notation. What's the oh, I guess one more thing is like putting a set in bars for the, the number of elements. So another way of saying that is that the size of the winner set has to be greater than or equal to one. 
bars means the size of the set, the number of elements. What's a proper subset again? Well, what's a subset? Um, a set of things within a larger set. Yeah. So a subset, A is a subset of B, uh, means everything in A is also in B. And so just like the relationship when you do inequalities, the relationship between less than versus less than or equal, a proper subset just means a subset that's not equal. Right, so example would be the set um, Karina Sloan is a proper subset of Karina Sloan. Yeah, Roger. It's a subset and not equal. Um, so that's, we've talked about the number of elements. We've talked about the empty set. We've talked about subset and proper subset. So let me remind you about element of. That's just to pick out membership. So Karina is a member of the set. Karina. So. Right. So how would you use this notation? So you'd say, uh, you know, for instance, oh, another fairness property that I didn't put on the list that we were just reviewing is Smith Fair. Okay, so in English, what does Smith Fair say? And then we'll write it in set theory notation and then we'll call it a day. So in English, Smith Fair says, the winner must come from the Smith set. The winners must come from the Smith set. Only the strong can win. So how would we write that? We would say the winners belong to the Smith set. That's a very succinct way to write that only strong candidates can win. Winners belong to the Smith set. Okay, and then let's do, let's rewrite unanimity fair because we just talked about it. Let's rewrite it in succinct set theory notation. Now it says if X is greater than Y on every ballot, well, how do I write Y can't win? Y is not in the winner set. Very succinct way to say why I can't. And that's the reason to do set theory notation is just that usually it takes something that might take you a while to say and it makes it really clear and condensed. Was that, uh, was that good? Okay. Um, well, I hope this was helpful. We didn't talk that much about the practice problems, but you know, you have solutions. So maybe it's just the solutions were self-explanatory. So we'll just call this our review session. Um, let me emphasize, like you guys as a class just really are shy on Slack. <laughs> I would love to see you all using Slack more. So one really good thing to do is, I don't mind ever if you direct message me a question, that's always gonna be fine or your TAs. But another really, really, really useful thing as you study would be to take any question that you have, don't be shy and just throw it in our general Slack channel. And then you'll get some discussion about it and answers about it and other people will benefit from seeing your question answered. So that's a really good effective way to use Slack. Okay, and so with that, I will stop the recording. Okay, everyone, so this is our little last minute small group review session for the midterm tomorrow for Math of Social Choice. And so thank you for joining me. And what I would like to do is just take a cue from you guys about what you want to hear about. So that could be practice problems from the ones that we put out that you want a little more clarification on or just to talk about and get the idea of, or just any topic that came up while you were reviewing anything that you want to hear. So let's just get a request from each of you and then I'll kind of go through 
and address them. So Allie, do you have a request? Yeah, I have a few just like more nitpicky things. Um, one of them is how majority fair would work if it if we're using secondality. I know like you kind of made that one up, but uh, mm -hmm. that and then um, how Smithification would work when the Smith set is just one candidate. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing is about beat path. I have a few like kind of smaller questions within that. Okay, so just generally beat path. Great, you came yeah. on the whole list. <laughs> How about you, Matty? Do you have a, a topic you want to talk about? Yeah, I was a little confused what um, the difference are differences are between a Smith set, a Dom set, and a primitive Dom set. You got it. Yep. Smith set, Dom set, primitive Dom set. And how about you, Salami? Um, okay like how to get to like monotonicity and like strong monotonicity and the how that works um sorry i had written it down um the fairness <laughs> criterion so like unanimity unanimity fair and majority fair and how that works mm -hmm. with like condorcet um and then like this yeah. is like the last like thing wait, is wait, hang on let me catch up so <laughs> unanimity um and what was the other one that majority fair. majority okay. fair. Unanimity fair, majority fair uh, versus Condorcet candidates. Great. And then go ahead. And then the last thing. Yeah, it's just, it's more of like, how do you make um, a preference schedule based on some kind of concept? So I think one of them was, uh, how do you give an example of a preference schedule with five candidates so that they're all involved in a Condorcet cycle? Like, okay. more Really than that, how do you make a preference schedule for a concept? Sure. Sure. Yep. Building examples, I'll call that. Hi, Maher. Welcome. Hi. So we're just going around and collecting like requests of topics. So what's your request? Oh, we're growing. <laughs> what's your request? What would you like to hear about? Um, I have, I think, just to, like some specific questions about building examples. Um, I think specifically on the uh, making examples about condor, um, about Condorcet cycles. Okay, great. So let me just walk the room so anyone who's not here yet. Okay, <laughs> just in time. <laughs> um, okay, so you're also interested in talking about building examples. Um, and then Aisha, do you have a request? What would you like to hear about? Um, I'm sorry if this is repeated. I, I couldn't find the right link, so I just joined. But okay. um, I was wondering if we could go quickly over picking a threshold for the STV. TV? Okay, sure. And then, um, why um, is doing a head to head counts as a consolidation? That's just a quick mm -hmm. question. And then for question number four on the review sheet, I was confused on how. Uh, unanimous preference um, can be seen through a pairwise comparison graph because um, I thought unanimous meant like every single one has um, like X as its first choice, but I wasn't completely sure. No, that's Pareto efficient. It's just that it's preferred like X over Y. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, this is awesome. This is a really ambitious list, but I think we can do it. So buckle up, here we go. <laughs> All right, let's start at the top. Majority fair versus secondality. So along the way, as we talk about these, um, we'll kind of just recall what they are. And I'm just going to call on you guys. So I'd ask you to leave yourself off mute if it's okay, so that it's easier to just sort of get quick responses to things so we can move through it. All right, so what does majority fair mean? Uh, Salome, what's majority fair mean? Do you remember? <laughs> The majority candidate, uh, like wins the election, like who's ever in the first place, like the most. No, it's not whoever has the most first place votes. Like whoever it's is. If someone, if someone has more than half of the first place votes, they win. That's what okay. that's what it says. So actually, this is important, right? Plurality is just having the most votes, but majority is not just having the first votes. It's having more than fifty percent of all the available votes. So it's a, it's a stronger condition. So. If some candidate 
has more than 50% of first place votes. They win. So it's connected to plurality in the following way. If you have more than 50% of the first place votes, you have to have more than anyone else. No two people can have more than 50%. So it's true that a majority candidate has the most first place votes, absolutely true. Um, but there is always someone with the most first place votes, but there's not always a majority candidate. Is that clear? Would that right, be? I'm gonna... I'm oh, sorry, would that be first past the post kind of thing? Yeah, first past the post is plurality. It's just whoever has the most first place votes, that's our winner. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of elections with no majority candidate. It's typical. I was actually just looking up election results because <laughs> I live and breathe elections these days. Um, you know, in a typical close election, like all those states in the last presidential race, um, the Trump-Biden race, all those close states, no one had a majority. And that's because Trump and Biden both had close to 50% and then like various other candidates had a little, right? So it can absolutely happen that there's no majority candidate. So majority fair is a property of a winner selection method that says if someone has more than half of the votes, they should win. That's what majority fair means. Okay, so then what's secondality? Secondality is this made up system that uh, the candidate with the most second place votes wins. Candidate with the most second place votes wins. So these are different. This one is like a criterion and this one is a system, right? And so we can ask, does this system have this property? Criterion is just like a property, right? And so um, here's the claim. Secondality is not majority fair. Okay, does someone wanna take a stab at proving it? Aisha? If majority fair is having more than 50% of the first place votes, someone who wins by secondality, um, has the majority of the second place votes, so they wouldn't be able to have the majority. Well, they just have the most second place votes. It might not be a majority, but still you could, I think you're, you're, you're basically building an example. So you're building an example where some candidate, let's call them A, has a whole lot of second place votes. So maybe here's A with a hundred second place votes, right? And now, you know, I can, in fact, this could be my whole election. So here's my example. I have a hundred voters and they all like B over A. Okay, so is there a majority candidate in this really simple election? Yes, who's the majority candidate? B. Yes, but the winner by secondality is A, so I'm done. Secondality is not majority fair because I've given you an example where there's a majority candidate, but they don't win. And the majority fair property is when there's a majority candidate, they must win. So clearly that property fails. Ali. So I guess my question was with this, because there was um, one of the quiz questions that I kind of got confused on about the wording. Do, mm -hmm. Does majority fair have to do specifically with first place or is it whatever first place means to that system? Because in secondality, like the first no, place- It's, it's vote literally 50% of the first place vote, just like it says there. Okay, so it doesn't change for the system. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I see what you mean, right? Secondality, kind of the valuable position is second place, but majority fair is just about the first place vote. Okay. All right, cool, so that's that. Smithifying to one candidate. Okay, so let's remember what's the Smith set? And this gets to, I think this was Marie's question. So Smith set versus Dom set versus primitive Dom set. Okay, so the Smith set we use a script S4. The Dom set we use a D sub X4. Uh, sorry, Dom set we use a D4. And the primitive Dom set we use a D sub X4. 
Okay, so just let's say what these are. So this is first, what's a DOM set? This is any set of candidates with all arrows pointing out. In other words, it's like a set of candidates within the full candidate set that beats everybody else not in the set. That's, that's what it is to be a dominating set is that everybody in the set beats everybody outside the set, head to head. <clears throat> is my cartoon okay, definition okay? All right. So what's the primitive DOM set? X, this is for some X in the candidate set. So this is our set theory notation. X is a member of the candidate set, an element of or member of the candidate set. So for X and C, DX is the smallest DOM set containing X. So just as a reminder, we have a recipe for how to build those. You start with X, you add everybody they don't beat, you add everybody they don't beat, you add everybody they don't beat, and you keep going until you can't go anymore. That's your primitive DOM set. So that's how we build it. And then the Smith set is the smallest DOM set of all. And so these are gonna be the ones that we're gonna call strong candidates. So that's how these ideas fit together. And Here's, I just reminded you how to build a primitive DOM set. So now let me remind you. So these are some facts from class. One is every DOM set is someone's primitive. Right, so like a DOM set has a bunch of candidates in it. And actually there's a nice picture that, that I like to imagine, which is like these Russian nested dolls, you know? The, that's fact too, by the way, <laughs> is that DOM sets are nested. So they all fit inside each other, right? And you might have some candidates out here and some candidates in here and some in here and some in here. And so the idea is if you grab, if, if someone asks you for a particular DOM set, whose primitive is it? Well, suppose I take this one and I want you to tell me whose primitive it is. All you need to do is find a candidate who's in there, but not the next one down. Let me call this candidate Q. You guys see what I did? I just grabbed someone who's in there, but not the next one. And then this is their, it is the smallest DOM set containing Q. You can see that from the picture that it's the smallest DOM set containing Q. Okay, so if you believe that DOM sets are nested, then just by the picture, it, you can conclude that every DOM set is someone's primitive. Okay, so how do you find the Smith set? Well, for the examples that we have on worksheets where you can do it by hand, sometimes you can just eyeball it. You actually see some candidates where all the arrows point out. And sometimes you might have to like follow a procedure and think about what some of the primitives are and actually like build the smallest one that you can. Okay, so that was a little refresher just on kind of what are Smith set, DOM set, and primitive. And now let's address this question, which is um, Smithifying to one candidate. Okay, so we use Smith sets to kind of build modified election systems. with no weak spoilers. This is what they're for. This is the whole motivation for introducing the Smith idea, right? And that's because a lot of people think spoilers sound unfair. And unfortunately you can prove that there is no system that is spoiler proof. There's no reasonable system that is spoiler proof. And so you say, okay, well, if I can't totally get rid of spoilers, at least I wanna get rid of like weak candidates who spoil the election. And so we build up this concept of Smith set so that we know what strong and weak means. And then Smithification is the following procedure. So like I said, this is building a modified election system. So this is step one, you know, find Smith set. Step two, consolidate to the Smith set. 
Step three, run the original system. This is what smithification means. So for instance, if I tell you to do smithified plurality, you find the Smith set, consolidate to the Smith set, and then count who has the most first place votes. If I tell you to do smithified Borda, find the Smith set, consolidate to the Smith set, see who has the most Borda points, right? So you can sort of put any system in here. It's like you can plug in any system you want. And this gives you a way to modify it so that it has no weak spoilers. Okay, questions about that general strategy? So to make this concrete, we should take a second to remember what is a consolidation? That was another one of the questions on our list. What is this consolidate idea? By the way, am I going too fast or is this okay? Okay, this is for you guys. So just slow me down if I'm going too fast. Um, all right, so what is this idea of consolidate? This is totally fundamental to every, almost every <laughs> system we have. Consolidation is the idea that if I have the full preference schedule for a society or a group, I know everybody's preferences among all the candidates. And then if I want to know everybody's preferences for a smaller set of candidates, I don't have to ask them again. I have a record of all their original preferences. So now if I wanna know, for example, who do you prefer head to head between these two? I don't have to conduct a new election. I can just look at everybody's preferences and see whether A is over B or B is over A on every column, on every ballot. And that tells me the preferences for the smaller set. So consolidation is the idea that if you wanna know preferences for a smaller set of candidates, You know, so given an initial preference schedule, if you want to know preferences for a smaller set of candidates, just restrict attention to those. All right, so basic idea, like suppose I have A, B, Q, R, R, Q, A, B, uh, Q, A, R, B, and B, A, Q, R. And maybe I have 11 people who like this and seven and eight and two. So in this case, my original candidate set is A, R, B, Q. Now I'll pick some subset of candidates. I don't care which ones. Mati? ARB. ARB. So we can do that by just ignoring Q. So what I will do is I'll just strike through Q and then I'll squeeze down the schedule. Right? And so now I have A, B, R, 11. Why? Because I just ignored Q, threw them out. But I, I still know that, that my first column's worth of voters like A over B over R. Second column likes R over A over B. There's seven of those. Uh, next, likes A over R over B. There's eight of those. And the next, like B over A over R. There's two of those. And that's it. That's a consolidation. Right? And so to answer, I think it was Ali's question. Actually, I can't remember which one of you. <laughs> um, how is a head-to-head -head a consolidation? That's Aisha's question. Um, because it's picking out two candidates and just looking at the preferences between those two. It's consolid It's just like we did here. Here we consolidated down to three. A head to head is just consolidation down to two. Does that make sense? Okay, great. So now we've got, we talked about consolidation and we, okay, now smithifying to one candidate. All right, so what is smithifying to one candidate? Well, suppose, so this is a separate point. Suppose the size of the Smith set is one. The bars around a set ask you how many things are in it. So when I put S in the bars, I'm saying, what's the size of the Smith set? Okay, so suppose there's only one strong candidate. Well, what does this mean? Let's, let's say that candidate's name is, you know, F, candidate F. So they're the, they're the only ones in the Smith set. So that means maybe there's some other candidates a, uh, L, 
as P. And just the fact that this is a Smith set means that all the arrows, let me draw it like this, all the arrows have to point out. Okay, so I don't know yet about the arrows among the other candidates, but I know all the arrows from F have to point out because that's the Smith set. Okay, so my first question to you is, there is another name for F. There's another name for what kind of candidate F is. So any solo strong candidate is, Condorcet? Yes, Condorcet. is a Condorcet candidate. So Condorcet candidate just means you beat everyone else head to head. And if you're all, all alone in the Smith set, that also means you beat everyone else head to head. Okay, so, um, so Smithifying to just one implies the Condorcet candidate wins. Right, because the reason for this is looking back to our instructions. What do you do when you smithify? You find S, you consolidate to S, and then you run your original system. Well, when you consolidate down to one person, they have to win. You don't, it doesn't matter what the system is. When there's only one left, they're the only possible winner. Okay, so that's, that's that. When you smithify to just one candidate, that candidate must be Condorcet and they must win. Cool. All right. So B path, what should we, what about B path would be good to review? I have a few like kind of specific questions. Um, can I ask those? Um, yes, absolutely. That's what we're here for. Um, but yeah, give me an example. Um, Okay, so I guess I'm trying to pick like one that makes more sense to ask first. Um, if there, so if there isn't a beat path, then I guess I'm asking like if if there isn't one clear winner, like if there's a tie, would there have to be a tiebreaker in order for mm, there to yeah. be a beat path winner, or how would that work? Okay, so beat path elimination. Beat path is like fueled by this elimination process. So B path elimination, just to remind you, is A eliminates B. So this symbol means eliminates. Um, if, remind me somebody, what does this mean? What does it mean for one candidate to eliminate another in a B path kind of tournament? If Aisha? It has a, like A has a stronger, um, mm -hmm. path. Yeah, yeah, it's called a yeah. B path. <laughs> so yeah, A has a, this, we sometimes call this an unmatched B path to B. And then in other words, just like you said, that means there's a path from A to B stronger than any one back. Is that okay? Phrase that way. I'll remind you in a second what strength means. But first, if you had a tie, if there's one path from A to B and there's one path from B to A and they have the same strength, then neither one eliminates the other because neither one has a stronger path. Okay, this has to be actually stronger. It has to be unmatched. So if there are matching paths in both directions, neither one eliminates the other. So there has to be a Condorcet candidate? No, um, you can have, you can have B, but I mean, you can have more than one winner, right? So it could be the case, you know, example, let's try to do an example of this. So let's suppose that there's a path from A to C of strength six, and then I have this of strength eight, six, this is strength two, and this is strength four, and this is strength uh, 10. Okay, suppose I have this situation. Okay, uh, I should probably name these candidates. How about, you know, R and T. Mm -hmm. Let's run a beat path election on these and see what happens. So first, I think it's pretty clear that A eliminates T. 
because there's a path of strength 10 going down and there's certainly no path of strength at 10 going back up. Cool? Okay, so now how about, um, well, next I can see, oopsie, let me undo that. Okay, I can next see that A also eliminates R because I have a path from A to R of strength eight and no path of strength eight going back. It's unmatched. Are you guys seeing how I'm doing this? It's making sense? Okay, remember the strength. So recall strength of a beat path is the lowest margin along the way. It's like the strength of the weakest link. Okay, so these two are out. Now, how about A and C? All that's left is to kind of look at whether they eliminate each other. Well, let's see what I have. I have a path from A to C of strength six. Oops. Oh yeah, what I meant to do here, let me fix this so that it's a little bit of a better example. What I meant to do was have this path go this way. There, a little bit of a better example. So I have a path here from C to A of strength six. And then how about from A back to C? Well, from A back to C, I have this path here. What's its strength? Six. six. Also six, right. And if you look around the graph, you'll see those are the only, the yellow is the only one from C to A, and the red is the only one from A to C, right? And so since they have the same strength, neither one of the two eliminates the other. That doesn't mean it's a failed election, it just means that the winner by beat path is both A and C. It's whoever's left standing at the end, that's who wins. Um, would it be possible to have like multiple beat, beat paths um, within like uh, the, the graph and so you would choose whichever one would like be, beat the other? Yeah, absolutely. You could have a graph that has multiple paths, for instance, Let's do this. If this one here, if this arrow went the other way, if that arrow went that way, then you could see besides the yellow, there's a second beat path going from C to A that looks like this. So it's possible to have two different beat paths that go from one to the other, and you'd always just use the strongest one. Thank you. Okay, so that's your little beat path refresher. Um, and we can come back and do some more like specific beat path questions, but I wanna kind of address all the things on the list at least a little bit. So we'll, we can come back to that. Okay, I'm gonna jump around a little. How about this one? Seeing unanimity in a pairwise comparison graph. So what is unanimity? That's where every voter ranks someone above someone else. It doesn't mean they put them first. That's a Pareto candidate if everybody puts them first. Unanimity just means everybody likes X better than Y. And so it could be that X is first and Y is second, or it could be that, you know, it could be anything. There are a lot of ways to put X above Y, but all I require is that on every single column, X comes first, X is above Y. So we call this, this schedule has a unanimous preference. And in this case, it's a preference for X over Y. You all happy with that? Okay. And so what does that look like in a graph? Well, I don't know. First of all, notice this could be like 200 voters and this could be two voters and this could be three voters and this could be 37 voters, doesn't matter, right? There could be any number of voters here. Um, but we usually write little n for the number of candidates just to keep track. We try to keep some consistent notation and big N for the number of voters. And so big N could be anything. In this case, it looks like it's 242, whatever, it could be anything. 
So my question is, in the pairwise comparison graph, here's X and here's Y. If there's a unanimous preference for X over Y, what can you say about the arrow between X and Y in the graph? What can you say about the head-to-head -head comparison? So to do this, consolidate down to X and Y. And what do you see? Points outward from X. Yes, definitely. And what's the margin? Um, it'd be like all the candidates. Out of it'd be everybody. Yeah. Voila. Okay, so how do you see a unanimous preference in the pairwise comparison graph? You see an arrow where the margin is the same as the number of voters overall, because everybody prefers X to Y. Can I add a mini second question to this? And then yeah, of course. the other one was Pareto efficient. Mm -hmm. And then how would you then see, just by simply looking at the BWC graph, that everyone ranked X as their first place? Okay, great. How would you see Pareto efficiency in the graph? So Pareto efficient is every, okay, well, so first let's say what it is to be a Pareto candidate. A Pareto candidate is someone who's ranked first by every voter. Pareto efficient is a property. Um, if there's a Pareto candidate, they must win. So this is a criterion. It's like a fairness property. This is just a kind of candidate. Sort of like a majority candidate or Condorcet, it's a kind of candidate. Okay. So how would you see Pareto efficiency? Well, I'm gonna kind of draw a similar cartoon to that one. So let's say, let's say X is my Pareto candidate. Okay, so they're first place on everybody's ballot. And then there's kind of everybody else below them in some order. Okay, so what can you say? So maybe here's X and here's a few other candidates. What can you say about the comparisons from X to all the others? Okay, I think Aisha just got an idea. How about you, Salami? You wanna take this one? What can you say about the comparisons from X to all the other voters? Uh, X, if it's a Pareto candidate, that is in this only in a dictatorship that this would happen because it's like the first place candidate? No, so a dictatorship is a kind of system, but a Pareto candidate is just a kind of preference schedule, Okay. right? So a, a Pareto candidate occurs when there's a, an election, but it doesn't depend on the system. You can have any system you want. Uh, the presence of a Pareto candidate is just about what the social preferences are. Mm -hmm. They're like, everybody has the same first choice. So like, suppose there's some other candidate A, and you know, A is in some various places on all the ballots. What can you say about X versus A? Oh, X is like uni the unanimous. Like yes. A. So X is in fact unanimously preferred to everybody. And so they have the full margin of N compared to everybody. So you can, you can find a Pareto candidate in a graph just by seeing that there's first of all a Condorcet candidate and second of all, they beat everybody by the maximum margin possible. That's how you know you have a Pareto candidate. All right. Okay, so we did this. Um, for STV thresholds, I'm just gonna address that really quickly because I just, all I want you to have about STV is the idea of the system in your head. I already said like, we didn't have it on a worksheet. So I'm not gonna have you like performing an STV election on the midterm, but I want the idea in your head because I think it might be one of the most useful things you take out of this class. So um, the idea of the threshold is you just, you come up with a number of votes. If you're trying to elect M candidates, you come up with a number of votes so that M plus one people can't all be over the threshold at the same time. And that's all it is. You're just solving for like the smallest number so that at that threshold, you couldn't elect too big of a group of people. I think what confused so, me is just the one over M calculation. Yeah. I'm thinking. yeah. So basically, here's the way to think about it. You have N total voters, right? And so if you do N over M, then it would be just narrowly possible for M people to all have that many votes. Mm -hmm. 
But you couldn't have a M plus first person with that many votes. And so um, this works as a threshold. In the sense that you, it can't cause you to elect too many people. So it works as a threshold. But you can get away with even a slightly smaller threshold, which is roughly n over m plus one, which is a slightly smaller number. But that's, you know, details for another day. This works as a basic idea of a threshold because it has the property that it can't cause you to accidentally elect too many people. That's the important thing. It would be pretty awkward if you're trying to elect a nine person city council and you tell 10 people they won and then you have to call someone back and say, sorry, just kidding. We don't want that. Okay. So, well, we've kind of already talked about some of this unanimity fair, majority fair versus Condorcet candidates. So I'll just point out that majority fair, we, that was this property that we talked about right up at the top. Majority fair just says, if a candidate has at least half, has more than half of the first place votes, they should win. A Condorcet candidate doesn't need a majority. You could be a, remember Condorcet just means you beat everybody head to head. You could like barely beat everybody head to head. There's no reason you need a majority of votes to do it, right? And so being majority fair doesn't tell you how to treat a Condorcet candidate. It only tells you how to treat a majority candidate. That's, that's the kind of relationship between those ideas. So it's possible to have a majority fair system where a Condorcet candidate could lose. That could happen because this does not require me to do anything special to Condorcet candidates. Okay. Now let's examine Condorcet candidates versus unanimity fair. So suppose you know a system is unanimity fair. We just talked about that. That means if someone was above everybody was was above someone else on everybody's ballot, then the lower one can't win. The dispreferred, unanimously dispreferred candidate shouldn't win. That's unanimity fair. But again, that's got no relationship to being a Condorcet candidate. Being a Condorcet candidate just means you beat someone, you beat everyone head to head, but it doesn't mean you're above them on every ballot. It's easy to beat someone head to head, but there are a couple of voters who like them better, right? So you can have a Condorcet candidate who isn't unanimously preferred to anyone. And what that means is that for a unanimity fair system, all bets are off for how it handles a Condorcet candidate. So both unanimity fair and majority fair deliver no promises or guarantees at all for Condorcet candidates. Did that logic make sense? I can also write stuff down and do an example, but the point was being Condorcet has nothing to do with being unanimously preferred. It's not a guarantee of that or a guarantee of not that. It's just independent. And it's also got nothing to do with being a majority candidate. You can be Condorcet without being a majority candidate. And that means that these two criteria say nothing at all about how you should handle a Condorcet candidate. Okay, so I think that handles that. And so we have two more topics. What are monotonicity and strong monotonicity? And like, here's a really kind of big hard one. Like how do you build examples of stuff, <laughs> right? Um, so let's, let's do monotonicity and strong monotonicity first. And then I'll give you some tips for examples. Um, and then we'll call it a night. Okay, so monotonicity, strong monotonicity. All right, so here's the idea. So we have the notion of a favorable move. So we'll recall favorable move to let's say X versus a neutral move to X. So both of these refer to a way that a preference schedule might change. They're both about changes to a preference schedule. Favorable move means um, some voters move X up in their preferences while leaving everyone else in the same order. So you could think about this as like strictly favorable to X. X moves up and everybody else stays kind of in their same relative position. Questions about that favorable move? Okay, neutral move. Um, Ali, do you remember what that is? Uh, yeah, so if, if let's say another candidate moves um, 
like up or down or something and x stays in the exact same position then that move is neutral there yep all voters leave x in the same position like you said um other candidates may move up or down but they can't jump over x Sound okay? All right, so let's do an example. So we're gonna do favorable move, neutral move. So let's do uh, A, L, O, E. Okay, so somebody give me a favorable move to candidate O. Mati? Um. L would move below O. Yeah, so what's the new order? A-O-L-E. Yep, absolutely. Or there's only one other option. What's the other option? A would also move under O. Yeah. yeah, and I think about it as you can move O up one place or two. Right, and that's it. Those are the only favorable moves. Okay, and then something that's kind of nice to notice is that these moves are favorable to O, but notice they're also neutral to E. Why? Because E stayed in place and nobody jumped over E. Make sense? Okay, so before I go on to the definition of monotonicity and strong monotonicity, the idea here, again, fairness criteria are all about your intuitions of what's fair. And so favorable sounds like all you did was move X up, nothing else changed. And so that might be enough, a little boost to A, that might be enough to make them win, but it shouldn't make them lose, right? <laughs> this is just base appeal to intuition. I'm just trying to like tap into what you think is reasonable. And then similarly, a neutral move to X, well, it should probably not change their fate from winner to loser or loser to winner, right? It was neutral after all. Look, we called it neutral. <laughs> it shouldn't change their outcome. And so that's monotonicity and strong monotonicity. Yeah, that's it. Um, I just had a question. So say we wanted to do a move neutral to L in the first um, preference. Yeah. Um, if we switched O and A, would that still be counted as neutral? Yep. Okay, so Wait, just- it, no, 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 sorry. This would be neutral, right? Because where was L? L was in second and now they're still in second. And what did I do? I switched E and O. Nobody jumped over. But if we but switched- Oh, sorry. If we switch them around, like if we did E L A O, this is not neutral because now E and A switch places and they have to jump over L to do so. So this is not neutral to L. It's neutral to O. Um, actually, not from the original. Actually, let's look at the original. Is this neutral to anybody? This is not neutral to anybody because nobody stayed in place. So that's how you can tell it's not neutral. Then. Oh, sorry. Well, L stayed in place, but people jumped L. So it's not neutral to anyone. It's not neutral to L because people jumped over L. It's not neutral to A because they moved. It's not neutral to O because they moved. It's not neutral to E because they moved. So it's not neutral to anyone. So um, essentially for things to be neutral, like it stays in pay place and any of the like letters or anything like above or below it move around, but it can't be like go past or whatever. Exactly. What's neutral? You stay in place. The ones above can scramble. The ones below can scramble, and that's it. Notice what happens when you do a neutral move. So what's the effect of a neutral move on a pairwise comparison graph? Well, suppose it's, say, neutral to x. Here's x. And now I have all these other candidates. 
Well, so think about whatever these candidates are named. I'm not going to name them. Think about the arrow. So before the change, maybe X beat this candidate by five. What happens after a neutral move? Well, every ballot that they beat the other candidate on before, they still do because the belows stay below. And every ballot that they were beaten by the other candidate by is still true because the above stay above. So not only does the arrow point the same way, but even the margin is unchanged. Okay, so the answer is all arrows involving X maintain their direction and their margin. So this is pretty strong. Neutral moves, they, they might change, all, everything else might change. All these other connections between everybody else, those might all change. But all the arrows coming out of X, there's like a rigidity and those all kind of stay in place. Make sense? Okay, great. So let's finish this off. And then looking at the time, we have to start winding down. So a monotonic system is one where favorable moves can't hurt you. And so I think that sounds like pretty reasonable. And then a strongly monotonic system Any combination of favorable and neutral moves can't hurt you. In other words, they can't change you from a winner to a loser. That's what it means by make you lose. And this second one here sounds nice, but, but it's impossible in the sense that if you have a single winner, Pareto efficient, strongly monotonic system, it must be dictatorship. So it's just impossible. There is no reasonable system that is strongly monotonic. It sounds nice, but it's not doable. Monotonic though, this one's doable. A bunch of our systems are monotonic, such as speed path. That's one example. Pairwise comparison, that's another. Okay, make sense? This was the concept. All right, so that leaves us with just one topic in our last few minutes because we just sailed through this long list, of, impressively long list of topics. So we did this. So the last one is building examples. So I want to close out tonight with just a couple tips for building examples. Okay, so. I'm going to give you tips for building examples that are kind of tailored to this class, but that maybe extend beyond this context. Okay, so one general tip is like, start simple. Try to build the smallest non-trivial example. So this, this word non-trivial, mathematicians love this word. Trivial means so little that there's nothing there. So simple that there's nothing at all to say about it. For instance, an election with one candidate is trivial. That's just, there's no content there. There's nothing interesting that can be done. So build the smallest non-trivial example. That is, try to find the smallest instance that has enough complexity for the thing you're looking for. Don't start big, start small. Um, that's one tip. A second tip is try to like think about um, what causes weird behavior? Because usually you're looking for an example of something kind of strange. So think about what causes weird behavior. In this class, that's often Condorcet cycles. So a lot of weird behavior comes from a situation where you have social preferences that are incoherent. So here as a society, we like A better than B, B better than C, but C better than A. I think you'd call that incoherent. <laughs> like we don't have any good way of choosing between them. 
Um, so this is collectively incoherent preferences. Okay, so it's very useful for you if you're trying to build preference schedules to have in mind that if you do A, B, C, B, C, A, C, A, B, in other words, if you cycle the candidates around and then you put whatever numbers up here you want that have the property that each two of them add up to more than the third. So three plus four is more than five. Three plus five is more than four. Four plus five is more than three. That's a recipe for a Condorcet cycle. All right, and then following that same pattern, what would you do if you wanted to build a Condorcet cycle with four candidates? You'd do something very similar. You'd start with A, B, C, D, and you'd cycle to B, C, D, A, C, D, A, B. And if you want to complete the cycle, you'd go to D, A, B, C. And then just put roughly equal numbers up here. Just make sure they're sort of not too imbalanced and you have a cycle. And that should generalize to any number of candidates. I have a question about this. Um, I yeah. think this is also problem number eight on the review packet. Um, like when you're drawing any Condorcet cycle with like any number of candidates, um, do like the arrows inside the graph matter? Like, because I noticed in the answer key when the Condorcet cycle was drawn for the, between the five candidates, there were no lines between like, for example, A and C. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, excuse me. Yeah, you know, once you've specified the schedule, it tells you what all the other arrows are as well. So if I put some numbers on here, um, you know, like three and eight and two and 12, then I could work out what all the interior arrows are. But pretty much no matter what the numbers are up here, I have a cycle of A to B to C to D. All right, so what I'm trying to say is if I have A, B, C, D, just the pattern, just the pattern alone is enough to tell you that these arrows point around in the cycle. But you actually have to know what these numbers are in order to figure out the interior arrows. Just okay. a little observation you can make from playing around. So in that particular example on the answer sheet, you can go ahead and fill in those interior arrows. Mm -hmm. But just mm -hmm. the pattern alone is enough to know the outside. And so when it's asking for, when a problem is asking for a Condorcet cycle, it's asking for like, that loop between all of the candidates, not oh, like yeah, a sub loop. Yeah, yeah, good question. So does it count as a Condorcet cycle if it only involves some of the candidates? I'm not totally sure if there's a standard definition for that, but in my language, I would say that is still a Condorcet cycle. Anytime there is any number of candidates so that you have this like incoherent preference problem, mm -hmm. anytime you can follow a whole loop, following the arrows all the way around and get back where you started, I'm going to call that a conversation cycle, whether or not it involves every candidate. OK, that makes sense. Thank you. Cool. Um, so I guess I'll just end this. I think this is probably a good place to end with my third and final for now tip for building examples, which is like, don't be afraid to mess around. <laughs> Like try something. If these numbers didn't work out, bump one of the numbers up. Try to you know kind of play around with it. If you take a playful approach to example building rather than a like rigid approach of what do I do next, I think you'll find that to be pretty useful. I hope, and also a little more fun. Question mark? Maybe. <laughs> um, I can dream. <laughs> so I think that's a really good place to end. Um, you guys came super prepared with questions and I hope we got to them all in a way that was satisfying. Um, so I will stop the recording.